Section 1 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. Chapter 1. More or less than the Queen's Life. The Queen is pretty well, Swift wrote to Lord Peterborough on May 18th, 1714. At present, but the least disorder she has puts all in alarm. Swift goes on to tell his correspondent that, quote, when it is over, we act as if she were immortal. Neither is it possible to persuade people to make any preparations against an evil day, end quote. Yet, on the condition of Queen Anne's health, depended to all appearance the continuance of peace in England. While Anne was sinking down to death, rival claimants were planning to seize the throne. Rival statesmen and rival parties were plotting, intriguing, sending emissaries, moving troops, organizing armies, for a great struggle. Queen Anne had reigned for little more than twelve years. She succeeded William III on March 8, 1702, and at the time when Swift wrote the words we have quoted, her reign was drawing rapidly to a close. Anne was not a woman of great capacity or of elevated moral tone. She was moral, indeed, in the narrow and more limited sense which the word has lately come to have amongst us. She always observed decorum and propriety herself. She always discouraged vice in others, but she had no idea of political morality or of high political purpose, and she had allowed herself to be made the instrument of one faction or another according as one old woman or the other prevailed over her passing mood. While she was governed by the Duchess of Marlborough, the Duke of Marlborough and his party had the ascendant. When Mrs. Masham succeeded in establishing herself as chief favorite, the Duke of Marlborough and his followers went down. Burnet, in his History of My Own Times, says of Queen Anne that she is, quote, easy of access and hears everything very gently, but opens herself to so few and is so cold and general in her answers that people soon find that the chief application is to be made to her ministers and favorites, who, in their turns, have an entire credit and full power with her. She has laid down the splendor of a court too much and eats privately so that except on Sundays, any few hours twice or thrice a week, at night in the drawing-room, she appears so little that her court is, as it were, abandoned. End quote. Although Anne lived during the Augustan age of English literature, she had no literary capacity or taste. Kneller's portrait of the Queen gives her a face rather agreeable and intelligent than otherwise, a round, full face, with ruddy complexion and dark brown hair. A courtly biographer commenting on this portrait takes occasion to observe that Anne, quote, was so universally beloved that her death was more sincerely lamented than that of perhaps any other monarch who ever sat on the throne of these realms, end quote. A curious comment on that affection and devotion of the English people to Queen Anne is supplied by the fact which Lord Stanhope mentions, that, quote, the funds rose considerably on the first tidings of her danger, and fell again on a report of her recovery, end quote. England watched with the greatest anxiety the latest days of Queen Anne's life, not only out of any deep concern for the Queen herself, but simply because of the knowledge that with her death must come a crisis, and might come a revolution. Who was to snatch the crown as it fell from Queen Anne's dying head? Over at Herrenhausen in Hanover was one claimant to the throne. Flitting between Lorraine and Saint-Germain was another, 
here at home, in the Queen's very council chamber, round the Queen's dying bed, were the English heads of the rival parties cabling against each other, some of them deceiving Hanover, some of them deceiving James Stuart, and more than one, it must be confessed, deceiving at the same moment Hanoverians and Stuarts alike. Anne had no children living. She had borne to her husband, the feeble and colorless George of Denmark, a great many children, eighteen or nineteen it is said, but most of them died in their very infancy, and none lived to maturity. No succession could therefore take place, but only an accession, and at such a crisis in the history of England any deviation from the direct line must bring peril with it. At the time when Queen Anne lay dying, it might have meant a new revolution and another civil war. While Anne lies on that which is soon to be her deathbed, let us take a glance at the rival claimants of her crown and the leading English statesmen who were partisans on this side or that, or who were still hesitating about the side it would be, on the whole, most prudent and profitable to choose. The English Parliament had taken steps immediately after the Revolution of 1688 to prevent a restoration of the Stuart dynasty. The Bill of Rights, passed in the first year of the reign of William and Mary, declared that the crown of England should pass, in the first instance, to the heirs of Mary, then to the Princess Anne, her sister, and to the heirs of Princess Anne, and after that to the heirs, if any, of William by any subsequent marriage. Mary, however, died childless. William was sinking into years and in miserable health, apparently only waiting and anxious for death, and it was clear that he would not marry again. The only one of Anne's many children who approached maturity, the Duke of Gloucester, died just after his eleventh birthday. The little duke was a pupil of Bishop Burnet and was a child of great promise. Readers of fiction will remember that Henry Osmond in Thackeray's novel is described as having obtained some distinction in his academical course, quote, his Latin poem on the death of the Duke of Gloucester, Princess Anne of Denmark's son, having gained him a medal and introduced him to the Society of the University Wits, end quote. After the death of this poor child, it was thought necessary that some new step should be taken to cut off the chances of the Stuarts. The Act of Settlement, passed in 1701, excluded the sons or successors of James II and all other Catholic claimants from the throne of England, and entailed the crown on the electress Sophia of Hanover as the nearest Protestant heir, in case neither the reigning king nor the Princess Anne should have issue. The Electress Sophia was the mother of George, afterwards the first of England. She seems to have had good sense as well as talent. Her close friend Leibniz once said of her that she was not only given to asking why, but also wanted to know the why of the whys. She was not very anxious to see her son George made sovereign of England, and appeared to be under the impression that his training and temper would not allow him to govern with a due regard for the notions of constitutional liberty which prevailed even then among Englishmen. It even seems that Sophia made the suggestion that James Stuart, the old pretender, as he has since been called, could do well to become a Protestant, go in for constitutional government, and thus have a chance of the English throne. It is certain that she strongly objected to his being compared with Perkin Warbeck, or called a bastard. She accepted, however, that the position offered to her and her son by the act of settlement, and appears to have become gradually reconciled to it. And even, as she sank into years, is said to have expressed a hope many times that the name of Queen of England might be inscribed upon her coffin. She came very near to the gratification of her wish. She died in June 1714, being then in her 84th year, only a very few days before Queen Anne received her first warning of the near approach of death. 
her son George succeeded to her claim upon the crown of England. The reigning house of Hanover was one of those lucky families which appear to have what may be called a gift of inheritance. There are some such houses among European sovereignties. Whenever there is a breach in the continuity of succession anywhere, one or other of them is sure to come in for the inheritance. George the Elector, who was now waiting to become King of England, as soon as the breath should be out of Anne's body, belonged to the House of Guelph, or Welf, said to have been founded by Irmintrude, sister of Charlemagne, early in the ninth century. It had two branches, which were united in the eleventh century by the marriage of one of the Guelph ladies to Albert Azzo II, Lord of Este and Marquis of Italy. His son Guelph obtained the Bavarian possessions of his wife's stepfather, a Guelph of Bavaria. One of his descendants, called Henry the Lion, married Maud, daughter of Henry II of England, and became the founder of the family of Brunswick. War and imperial favor and imperial displeasure interfered during many generations with the integrity of the Duchy of Brunswick, and the electorate of Hanover was made up, for the most part, out of territories which Brunswick had once owned. The Emperor Leopold constructed it formally into an electorate in 1692, with Ernest Augustus of Brunswick Lüneberg as its first elector. The George Louis, who now, in 1714, is waiting to become King of England, was the son of Ernest Augustus and of Sophia, youngest daughter of Elizabeth Stuart, Queen of Bohemia, sister to Charles I of England. Elizabeth had married Frederick, the Elector Palatine of the Rhine, and her life was crossed and thwarted by the opening of the Thirty Years' War, and then by the misfortunes of her brother Charles and his dynasty. Elizabeth survived the English troubles and saw the restoration and came to live in England and to see her nephew, Charles II, reign as king. She barely saw this. Two years after the restoration, she died in London. Sophia was her twelfth child. She had thirteen in all. One of Sophia's elder brothers was Prince Rupert, that Rupert of the Rhine, of whom Macaulay's ballad says that, quote, Rupert never comes but to conquer or to die, end quote. The Rupert, whose daring and irresistible charges generally won his half of the battle, only that the other half might be lost and that his success might be swallowed up in the ruin of his companions. His headlong bravery, a misfortune, rather than an advantage to his cause. And there seems to have been one instance, that of the surrender of Bristol, in which that bravery deserted him for a moment. We see him afterwards in the pages of Pepys, an uninteresting, prosaic, pedantic figure, usefully employed in scientific experiments, and with all the guilt washed off him by time and years, and the commonplace wear and tear of routine life. George inherited none of the accomplishments of his mother. His father was a man of some talent and force of character, but he cared nothing for books or education of any kind, and George was allowed to revel in ignorance. He had no particular merit except a certain easy good nature, which rendered him unwilling to do harm or to give pain to anyone, unless some interest of his own might make it convenient. His neglected and unrestrained youth was abandoned to license and to profligacy. He was married in the twenty-second year of his age, against his own inclination, to the Princess Sophia Dorothea of Tzell, who was some six years younger. The marriage was merely a political one, formed with the object of uniting the whole of the Duchy of Lüneberg. George was attached to another girl. The princess is supposed to have fixed her affections upon another man. They were married, however, on November 21st, 1682, and during all her life, Sophia Dorothea had to put up with the neglect, the contempt, and afterwards the cruelty of her husband, 
George's strongest taste was for ugly women. One of his favorites, Mademoiselle Schulenberg, maid of honor to his mother, and who was afterwards made Duchess of Kendal, was conspicuous, even in the unlovely Hanoverian court, for the awkwardness of her long, gaunt, fleshless figure. Another favorite of George's, Madame Kielmansega, afterwards made Countess of Darlington, represented a different style of beauty. She is described by Horace Walpole as having, quote, large, fierce, black eyes, rolling beneath lofty, arched eyebrows, two acres of cheeks spread with crimson, an ocean of neck that overflowed and was not distinguishable from the lower part of her body, and no portion of which was restrained by stays, end quote. It would not be surprising if the neglected Sophia Dorotea should have looked for love elsewhere, or, at least, should not have been strict enough in repelling it when it offered itself. Philippe Christophe Königsmark, a Swedish soldier of fortune, was supposed to be her favorite lover. He suffered for his amour, and it was said that his death came by the special order. One version has it by the very hand of George the Elector, the owner of the ladies Schulenberg and Kielmansega. Sophia Dorothea was banished for the rest of her life to the castle of Alden on the river Aller in the old Schloss of Hanover. The spot is still shown outside the door of the Hall of Knights, which tradition has fixed upon as the spot where the assassination of Königsmark took place. The Königsmarks were in their way a famous family. The elder brother was the Charles John Königsmark, celebrated in an English state trial as the man who planned and helped to carry out the murder of Thomas Thynne. Thomas Thynne of Longleat, the accused of Titus Oates, the, quote, wise Issachar, the wealthy western friend, unquote, of Dryden, the comrade of Monmouth, the Tom of the Ten Thousand of Everyone, was betrothed to Elizabeth, the child widow, she was only fifteen years old, of Lord Ogle. Königsmark, fresh from the love-making in all the courts of Europe, and from fighting anything and everything, from the Turk at Tangiers to the wild bulls of Madrid, seems to have fallen in love with Thin's betrothed wife, and to have thought that the best way of obtaining her was to murder his rival. The murder was done, and its story is recorded in clumsy bas-relief over Thin's tomb in Westminster Abbey. Königsmark's accomplices were executed, but Königsmark got off and died years later fighting for the Venetians at the siege of classic Argos. The soldier in Virgil falls on a foreign field and dying remembers sweet Argos. The elder Königsmark, dying before sweet Argos, ought of right to remember that spot where St. Albans Street joins Pall Mall and where Thin was done to death. The Königsmarks had a sister, the beautiful Aurora, who was mistress of Frederick Augustus, Elector of Saxony, and so mother of the famous Maurice de Saxe, an ancestress of George Sand. Later, like the fair sinner of some tale of chivalry, she ended her days in pious retirement as prioress of the Protestant Abbey of Quedlinburg. George was born in Osnabrück in May 1660, and was therefore now in his fifty-fifth year. As his first qualification for the government of England, it may be mentioned that he did not understand one sentence of the English language, was ignorant of English ways, history, and traditions, and had as little sympathy with the growing sentiments of the majority of educated English people as if he had been an Amoroth succeeding to an Amoroth. When George became elector on the death of his father in 1698, he showed, however, some capacity for improvement under the influence of the new responsibility imposed upon him by his station. His private life did not amend, but his public conduct acquired a certain solidity and consistency which was not to have been expected from his previous mode of living. One of his merits was not likely to be by any means a merit in the eyes of the English people. He was, to do him justice, 
deeply attached to his native country. He had all the love for Hanover that the cat has for the hearth to which it is accustomed. The ways of the place suited him, the climate, the soil, the whole conditions of life were exactly what he would have them to be. He lived up to the age of fifty-four, a contented, stolid, happy, dissolute elector of Hanover, and it was a complete disturbance to all his habits and his predilections when the expected death of Anne compelled him to turn his thoughts to England. The other claimant of the English crown was James Frederick Edward Stuart, the old pretender, as he came to be afterwards called by his enemies, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, as his friends called him, when they did not think it prudent to give him the title of king. James was the half-brother of Queen Anne. He was the son of James the Second by James' second wife, Maria d'Este, sister of Francis, Duke of Modena. Maria was only the age of Juliet when she married. She had just passed her fourteenth year. Unlike Juliet, she was not beautiful. Unlike Juliet, she was poor. She was, however, a devout Roman Catholic, and therefore was especially acceptable to her husband. She had four children in quick succession, all of whom died in infancy, and then, for ten years, she had no child. The London Gazette surprised the world one day by the announcement that the Queen had become pregnant, and upon June 10, 1688, she gave birth to a son. It need hardly be told now that the wildest commotion was raised by the birth of the Prince. The great majority of the Protestants insinuated or stoutly declared that the alleged heir apparent was not a child of the queen. The story was that a newly born child, the son of a poor miller, had been brought into the queen's room in a warming pan and passed off as the son of the queen. It was said that Father Petre, a Catholic clergyman, had been instrumental in carrying out this contrivance, and therefore the enemies of the royal family talked of the young prince as Perkin or Petrelin. The warming pan was one of the most familiar objects in satirical literature and art for many generations after. A whole school of caricature was heated into life, if we may use such an expression, by this fabulous warming pan. Warming pans were associated with brass money and wooden shoes in the mouths and minds of Whig partisans down to a day not very far remote from our own. Mr. Johnson, the vulgar lawyer in Scott's Rob Roy, talks rudely to Diana Vernon, a Catholic, about, quote, King William of glorious and immortal memory, our immortal deliverer from papists and pretenders and wooden shoes and warming pans. Sad things, those wooden shoes and warming pans, retorted the young lady, who seemed to take pleasure in augmenting his wrath, and it is a comfort. You don't seem to want a warming pan at present, Mr. Jobson, end quote. There was not, of course, the slightest foundation for the absurd story about the spurious heir to the throne. Some little excuse was given for the spread of such a tale by the mere fact that there had been a delay in summoning the proper officials to be present at the birth. But despite all the pains Bishop Burnet takes to make the report seem trustworthy, it may be doubted whether anyone whose opinion was worth having seriously believed in the story even at the time, and it soon ceased to have any believers at all. At the time, however, it was accepted as an article of faith by a large proportion of the outer public, and the supposed Jesuit plot and the supposed warming pan served as missiles with which to pelt the supporters of the Stuarts until long after there had ceased to be the slightest chance whatever of a Stuart restoration. This story of a spurious heir to a throne repeats itself at various intervals of history. The child of Napoleon I and Maria Louisa was believed by many legitimist partisans to be supposititious. In our own days, there were many intelligent persons in France firmly convinced that the unfortunate Prince Louis Napoleon, who was killed in Zululand, was not the son of the Empress of the French, but that he was the son of her sister, the Duchess of Alva, and that he was merely palmed off on the French people in order to secure the stability of the Bonapartist throne. 
James Stuart was born, as we have said, on June 10, 1688, and was therefore still in his 26th year at the time when this history begins. Soon after his birth, his mother hurried with him to France to escape the coming troubles, and his father presently followed discrowned. He had led an unhappy life, unhappy all the more because of the incessant dissipation with which he had tried to enliven it. He is described as tall, meager, and melancholy. Although not strikingly like Charles I or Charles II, he had unmistakably the Stuart aspect. Horace Walpole said of him, many years after that, quote, Without the particular features of any Stuart, the Chevalier has the strong lines and fatality of air peculiar to them all. End quote. The words fatality of air describe very expressively that look of melancholy which all the Stuart features wore when in repose. The melancholy look represented an underlying habitual mood of melancholy, or even despondency, which a close observer may read in the character of the merry monarch himself, for all his mirth and his dissipation, just as well as in that of Charles I or of James II. The profligacy of Charles II had little that was joyous in it. James Stuart, the Chevalier, had not the abilities and the culture of Charles II, and he had much the same taste for intrigue and dissipation. His amours were already beginning to be a scandal, and he drank now and then like a man determined at all costs to drown thought. He was always the slave of women. Women knew all his secrets, and were made acquainted with his projected political enterprises. Sometimes the fair favorite to whom he had unbosomed himself blabbed and tattled all over Versailles or Paris of what she had heard, and in some instances, perhaps, she even took her newly acquired knowledge to the English ambassador and disposed of it for a consideration. At this time, James Stuart is not yet married, but marriage made as little difference in his way of living as it had done in that of his elderly political rival, George the Elector. It is strange that James Stuart should have made so faint an impression upon history and upon literature. Romance and poetry, which have done so much for his son, Bonnie Prince Charlie, have taken hardly any account of him. He figures in Thackeray's Esmond, but the picture is not made very distinct, even by that master of portraiture, and the merely frivolous side of his character is presented with disproportionate prominence. James Stuart had stronger qualities for good or evil than Thackeray seems to have found in him. Some of his contemporaries denied him the credit of man's ordinary courage. He has even been accused of positive cowardice. But there does not seem to be the slightest ground for such an accusation. Studied with the severest eye, his various enterprises and the manner in which he bore himself throughout them would seem to prove that he had courage enough for any undertaking. Princes seldom show any want of physical courage. They are trained from their very birth to regard themselves as always on parade, and even if they should feel their hearts give way in presence of danger, they are not likely to allow it to be seen. It was not lack of personal bravery that marred the chances of James Stuart. It is only doing bare justice to one whose character and career have met with little favor from history, contemporary or recent, to say that James might have made his way to the throne with comparative ease if he would only consent to change his religion and become a Protestant. It was, again and again, pressed upon him by English adherents and even by statesmen in power, by Oxford and by Bolingbroke, that if he could not actually become a Protestant, he should at least pretend to become one and give up all outward show of his devotion to the Catholic Church. James steadily and decisively refused to be guilty of any meanness so ignoble and detestable. His conduct in thus adhering to his convictions even at the cost of a throne, has been contrasted with that of Henry IV, who declared Paris to be well worth a mass. 
but some injustice has been done to Henry the Fourth in regard to his conversion. Henry's great Protestant minister, Sully, urged him to become an open and professing Catholic on the ground that he had always been a Catholic more or less consciously and in his heart. Sully gave Henry several evidences drawn from his observation of Henry's own demeanor to prove to him that his natural inclinations and the turn of his intellect always led him toward the Catholic faith, commenting shrewdly on the fact that he had seen Henry cross himself more than once on the field of battle in the presence of danger. Thus, according to Sully, Henry the Fourth, in professing himself a Catholic, would be only following the bent of his own natural inclinations. However that may be, it is still the fact that Henry the Fourth, by changing his profession of religion, succeeded in obtaining a crown, and that James the Pretender, by refusing to hear of such a change, lost his best chance of a throne. What were Anne's own inclinations with regard to the succession? There cannot be much doubt as to the way her personal feelings went. There is a history of the reign of Queen Anne, written by Dr. Thomas Somerville, quote, one of His Majesty's chaplains in ordinary, end quote, and published in 1798, with a dedication by permission to the king. It is called, on its title page, The History of Great Britain During the Reign of Queen Anne, with a dissertation concerning the danger of the Protestant succession. Such an author, writing comparatively soon after the events, and in a book dedicated to the reigning king, was not likely to do any conscious injustice to the memory of Queen Anne, and was especially likely to take a fair view of the influence which her personal inclinations were calculated to have on the succession. Dr. Somerville declares with great justice that, quote, mildness, timidity, and anxiety were constitutional ingredients in the temper of Queen Anne, end quote. This very timidity, this very anxiety, appears, according to Dr. Somerville's judgment, to have worked favorably for the Hanoverian succession. The Queen herself, by sentiment, and by what may be called a sort of superstition, leaned much toward the Stuarts, quote, The loss, says Dr. Somerville, of all her children bore the aspect of an angry providence, adjusting punishment to the nature and quality of her offense, end quote. Her offense, of course, was the part she had taken in helping to dethrone her father. Quote, Wounded in spirit and prone to superstition, she naturally thought of the restitution of the crown to her brother as the only atonement she could make to the memory of her injured father, end quote. This feeling might have ripened into action with her, but for that constitutional timidity and anxiety of which Somerville speaks. There would undoubtedly have been dangers, obvious to even the bravest or the most reckless, in an attempt just then to alter the succession, but Anne saw those dangers, quote, in the most terrific form, and recoiled with horror from the sight, end quote. Moreover, she had a constitutional objection as strong as that of Queen Elizabeth herself to the presence of an intended successor near her throne. Quote, she trembled, says Somerville, at the idea of the presence of a successor, whoever he might be, and the residence of her own brother in England was not less dreadful to her than that of the electoral prince. End quote. But it is probable that had she lived longer, she would have found herself constrained to put up with the presence either of one claimant or the other. Her ministers, whoever they might be, would surely have seen the imperative necessity of bringing over to England the man whom the Queen and they had determined to present to the English people as the destined heir of the throne. In such an event as that, and most assuredly, if men like Bolingbroke had been in power, it may be taken for granted that the Queen would have preferred her own brother, a Stuart, to the electoral Prince of Hanover. Quote, what the consequences might have been if the Queen had survived, says Somerville, is merely a matter of conjecture, but we may pronounce with some degree of assurance 
that the Protestant interest would have been exposed to more certain and to more imminent dangers than ever had threatened it before at any period since the Revolution. End quote. This seems a reasonable and just assertion. If Anne had lived much longer, it is possible that England might have seen a James the Third. End of chapter one. Section two of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume One by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two parties and leaders. All the closing months of Queen Anne's reign were occupied by Whigs and Tories, indeed by Anne herself as well, in the invention and conduct of intrigues about the succession. The Queen herself, with the grave opening before her, kept her fading eyes turned not to the world she was about to enter, but to the world she was about to leave. She was thinking much more about the future of her throne than about her own soul and future state. The Whigs were quite ready to maintain the Hanoverian succession by force. They did not expect to be able to carry matters easily, and they were ready to encounter a civil war. Their belief seems to have been that they, and not their opponents, would have to strike the blow, and they had already summoned the Duke of Marlborough from his retirement in Flanders to take the lead in their movement. Having Marlborough they knew that they would have the army. On the other hand, if Bolingbroke and the Tories really had any actual hope of a restoration of the Stuarts, it is certain that up to the last moment they had made no substantial preparations to accomplish their object. The Whigs and Tories divided between them whatever political force there was in English society at this time. Outside both parties, lay a considerable section of people who did not distinctly belong to the one faction or the other, but were ready to incline now to this and now to that, according as the conditions of the hour might inspire them. Outside these again, and far outnumbering these, and all others combined, was the great mass of the English people, hard-working, much-suffering, poor, patient, and almost absolutely indifferent to changes in government, and the humors and struggles of parties. Quote, These wrangling jars of Whig and Tory, says Dean Swift, are stale and old as Troy Town's story. End quote. But if the principles were old, the titles of the parties were new. Steele, in 1710, published in the Tatler a letter from Pasquin of Rome to Isaac Bickerstaff, asking for quote, an account of those two religious orders which have lately sprung up amongst you, the Whigs and the Tories, end quote. Steele declared that you could not come even among women, quote, but you find them divided into Whig and Tory, end quote. It was like the famous lawsuit in Abdera, alluded to by Lucian and amplified by Wieland, concerning the ownership of the ass's shadow, on which all the Abderites took sides, and every one was either a shadow or an ass. Various explanations have been given of these titles Whig and Tory. Titus Oates applied the term Tory, which then signified an Irish robber, to those who would not believe in his popish plot, and the name gradually became extended to all who were supposed to have sympathy with the Catholic Duke of York. The word Whig first arose during the Cameronian Rising, when it was applied to the Scotch Presbyterians, and is derived by some from the way which they habitually drank, and by others from a word Whiggum, used by the Western Scottish drovers. The Whigs and the Tories represent in the main not only two political doctrines, but two different feelings in the human mind. The natural tendency of some men is to regard political liberty as of more importance than political authority, and of other men to think that the maintenance of authority is the first object to be secured, and that only 
so much of individual liberty is to be conceded as will not interfere with authority's strictest exercise. Roughly speaking, therefore, the Tories were for authority and the Whigs for liberty. The Tories naturally held to the principle of the monarchy and of the state church. The Whigs were inclined for the supremacy of Parliament and for something like an approach to religious equality. Up to this time, at least, the Tory party still accepted the theory of the divine origin of the king's supremacy. The Whigs were even then the advocates of a constitutional system and held that the people at large are the source of monarchical power. To the one set of men, the sovereign was a divinely appointed ruler. To the other, he was the hereditary chief of the realm, having the source of his authority in popular election. The Tories, as the church party, disliked the dissenters even more than they disliked the Roman Catholics. The Whigs were then even inclined to regard the church as a branch of the civil service, to adopt a much more modern phrase, and they were in favor of extending freedom of worship to dissenters and, in a certain sense, to Roman Catholics. According to Bishop Burnet, it was in the reign of Queen Anne that the distinction between high church and low church first marked itself out, and we find, almost as a natural necessity, that the high church men were Tories, and the low church men were Whigs. Then, as now, the chief strength of the Tories was found in the country, and not in the large towns. So far as town populations were concerned, the Tories were proportionately strongest where the borough was smallest. The great bulk of the agricultural population, so far as it had definite political feelings, was distinctly Tory. The strength of the Whigs lay in the manufacturing towns and the great ports. London was, at that time, much stronger in its liberal political sentiments than it has been more recently. The moneyed interest, the bankers, the merchants, were attached to the Whig party. Many peers and bishops were Whigs, but they were chiefly the peers and bishops who owed their appointments to William the Third. The French envoy, D'Iberville, at this time, describes the Whigs as having at their command, the best purses, the best swords, the ablest heads, and the handsomest women. The Tory party was strong at the University of Oxford. The Whig party was in greater force at Cambridge. Both Whigs and Tories, however, were in a somewhat subdued condition of mind about the time that Anne's reign was closing. Neither party as a whole was inclined to push its political principles to anything like a logical extreme. Whigs and Tories alike were practically satisfied with the form which the English governing system had put on after the Revolution of 1688. Neither party was inclined for another revolution. The Civil War had carried the Whig principle a little too far for the Whigs, the Restoration had brought a certain amount of scandal on sovereign authority and the principle of divine right. The minds of men were settling down into willingness for a compromise. There were, of course, amongst the Tories, the extreme party, so pledged to the restoration of the Stuarts that they might have moved heaven and earth, at all events they would have, convulsed England for the sake of bringing them back. These men constituted what would now be called, in the language of French politics, the extreme right of the Tory party. They would become of importance at any hour when some actual movement was made from the outside to restore the Stuarts. Such a movement would, of course, have carried with it and with them the great bulk of the now quiescent Tory party, but in the meantime, and until some such movement was made, 
the Jacobite section of the Tories was not in a condition to be active or influential, and was not a serious difficulty in the way of the Hanoverian succession. The Whigs had great advantages on their side. They had a clear principle to start with. The constitutional errors and excesses of the Stuarts had forced on the mind of England a recognition of the two or three main principles of civil and religious liberty. The Whigs knew what they wanted better than the Tories did, and the ends which the Whigs proposed to gain were attainable, while those which the Tories set out for themselves were to a great extent lost in dreamland. The uncertainty and vagueness of many of the Tory aims made some of the Tories themselves only half earnest in their purposes. Many a Tory who talked as loudly as his brothers about the king having his own again, and who toasted the king over the water as freely as they, had in the bottom of his heart very little real anxiety to see a rebellion end in a Stuart restoration. But, on the other hand, the Whigs could strive with all their might and main to carry out their principles in church and in state without the responsibility of plunging the country into rebellion, and without any dread of seeing their projects melt away into visions and chimeras. A great band of landed proprietors formed the leaders of the Whigs. Times have changed since then, and the representatives of some of these great houses, which then led the Whig party, have passed or glided insensibly into the ranks of the Tories. But the main reason for this is because a Tory of our day represents fairly enough, in certain political aspects, the Whig of the days of Queen Anne. What is called in American politics a new departure has taken place in England since that time. The Radical Party has come into existence with political principles and watchwords quite different even from those of the early Whigs. Some of the Whig houses, not many, have gone with the forward movement, and some have remained behind, and so lapsed almost insensibly into the Tory quarter. But at the close of Queen Anne's reign, all the great leading Whigs stood well together. They understood better than the Tories did the necessity of obtaining superior influence in the House of Commons. They even contrived at that time to secure the majority of the county constituencies, while they had naturally the majority of the commercial class on their side. Then, as in later days, the vast wealth of the Whig families was spent unstintingly, and it may be said unblushingly, in securing the possession of the small constituencies, the constituencies which were only to be had by liberal bribery. Then, as afterwards, there was perceptible in the Whig party a strange combination of dignity and of meanness, of great principles and of somewhat degraded practices. They had high purposes, they recognized noble principles, and they held to them. They were for political liberty, as they then understood it, and they were for religious equality, for such approach at least to religious equality as had then come to be sanctioned by responsible politicians in England. They were ready to make great sacrifices in the defense of their political creed. But the principles and purposes with which they started and to which they kept did not succeed in purifying and ennobling all their parliamentary strategy and political conduct. They intrigued, they bribed, they bought, they cajoled, they paltered, they threatened, they made unsparing use of money and of power, they employed every art to carry out high and national purposes which the most unscrupulous cabal could have used to secure the attainment of selfish and ignoble ends. Their enemies had put one great advantage into their hands. The conduct of Bolingbroke and of Oxford during recent years had left the Whigs the sole representatives of constitutional liberty. The two great political parties hated and denounced each other 
with a ferocity hardly known before and hardly possible in our later times. The Whigs vituperated the Tories as rebels and traitors. The Tories cried out against the Whigs as the enemies of religion and the opponents of the true Church of England. Many a ballad of that time described the Whigs as men whose object it was to destroy both mitre and crown, to introduce anarchy once again, as they had done in the days of Oliver Cromwell. The Whig balladists retorted by describing the Tories as men who engaged in trying to bring in Perkin from France and prophesied the halter as the reward of their leading statesmen. In truth, the bitterness of that hour was very earnest. Most of the men on both sides meant what they said. Either side, if it had been in complete preponderance, would probably have had very little scruple in disposing of its leading enemies by means of the halter or the prison. It was, for the time, not so much a struggle of political parties as a struggle of hostile armies. The men were serious and savage because the crisis was serious and portentous. The chances of an hour might make a man a prime minister or a prisoner. Bolingbroke soon after was an exile, and Walpole at the head of the administration. The slightest chance, the merest accident, might have sent Walpole into exile and put Bolingbroke at the head of the state. The eyes of the English public were at this moment turned in especial to watch the movements of two men, the Duke of Marlborough and Lord Bolingbroke. Marlborough was beyond question the greatest soldier of his time. He had gone into exile when Queen Anne consented to degrade him and to persecute him, and now he was on his way home at the urgent entreaty of the Whig leaders in order to lend his powerful influence to the Hanoverian cause. The character of the Duke of Marlborough is one which ought to be especially attractive to the authors of romance and the lovers of strong, bold portrait painting. One peculiar difficulty, however, a romancist would have in dealing with Marlborough he could hardly venture to paint Marlborough as nature and fortune made him. The romancist would find himself compelled to soften and to modify many of the distinctive traits of Marlborough's character in order that he might not seem the mere inventor of a human paradox, in order that he might not appear to be indulging in the fantastic and the impossible. Pope has called Bacon, quote, the wisest, brightest, meanest of mankind, end quote, but Bacon was not greater in his own path than Marlborough in his, and Bacon's worst meannesses were nobility itself compared with some of Marlborough's political offenses. Marlborough started in life with almost every advantage that man could have, with genius, with boundless courage, with personal beauty, with favoring friends. From his early youth, he had been attached to James the Second and James II's court. One of Marlborough's biographers even suggests that the Duchess of York, James's first wife, was needlessly fond of young Churchill. The beautiful Duchess of Cleveland, she of whom Pepys said that everything she did became her, was passionately in love with Marlborough, and according to some writers gave him his first start in life when she presented him with five thousand pounds, which Marlborough prudent then as ever, invested in an annuity of five hundred a year. Burnet said of him that, quote, he knew the arts of living in a court beyond any man in it. He caressed all people with a soft and obliging deportment and was always ready to do good offices, end quote. His only personal defect was in his voice, which was shrill and disagreeable. He was through all his life avaricious to the last degree. He grasped at money wherever he could get it. He took money from women as well as from men. A familiar story of the time represents another nobleman as having been mistaken for the Duke of Marlborough by a mob at a time when Marlborough was unpopular, and extricating himself from the difficulty by telling the crowd he could not possibly be the Duke of Marlborough. First, because he had only two guineas in his pocket, and next, 
because he was perfectly willing to give them away. Marlborough had received the highest favors from James the Second, but he quitted James in the hour of his misfortunes. Only, however it should be said, to return secretly to his service at a time when he was professing devotion to William the Third, He betrayed each side to the other. In the same year, and almost in the same month, he writes to the Elector of Hanover and to the Pretender in France, pouring forth to each alike his protestations of devotion. I shall be always ready to hazard my fortune and my life for your service, he tells the Elector. I had rather have my hands cut off than do anything prejudicial to King James's cause, he tells an agent of the Stuarts. James appears to have believed in Marlborough, and William, while he made use of him, to have had no faith in him. Quote, the Duke of Marlborough, William said, has the best talents for a general of any man in England, but he is a vile man and I hate him, for though I can profit by treasons, I cannot bear the traitor, end quote. William's saying was strikingly like that one ascribed to Philip of Macedon. Schomburg spoke of Marlborough as, quote, the first lieutenant general whom I ever remember to have deserted his colors, end quote. Lord Granard, who was in the camp of King James II on Salisbury Plain, told Dr. King, who has recorded the story, that Churchill and some other colonels invited Lord Granard to supper and opened to him their design of deserting to the Prince of Orange. Granard not merely refused to enter into the conspiracy, but went to the king and told him the whole story, advising him to seize Marlborough and the other conspirators. Perhaps if this advice had been followed, King William would never have come to the throne of England. James, however, gave no credit to the story and took no trouble about it. Next morning, he found his mistake, but it was then too late. The truth of this story is corroborated by other authorities, one of them being King James himself, who afterwards stated that he had received information of Lord Churchill's designs and was recommended to seize his person, but that he unfortunately neglected to avail himself of the advice. Speak of that no more, says Egmont in Goethe's play. I was warned. Swift said of Marlborough that, quote, he is as covetous as hell and ambitious as the prince of it, end quote. Marlborough was as ignorant as he was avaricious. Literary taste or instinct he must have had because he read with so much eagerness the historical plays of Shakespeare and indeed frankly owned that his only knowledge of English history was taken from their scenes. Even in that time of loose spelling, his spelling is remarkably loose, he seems to spell without any particular principle in the matter, seldom rendering the same word a second time by the same combination of letters. He was at one period of his life a libertine of the loosest order, so far as morals were concerned, but of the shrewdest kind as regarded personal gain and advancement. He would have loved any Lady Belliston who presented herself and who could have rewarded him for his kindness. He was not of the type of Byron's Don Juan, who declares that the prisoned eagle will not pair, nor I serve a sultana's sensual fantasy. Marlborough would have served any fantasy for gain. It has been said of him that the reason for his being so successful with women as a young man was that he took money of them, Yet, as another striking instance of the paradoxical nature of his character, he was intensely devoted to his wife. He was the true lover of Sarah Jennings, who afterwards became Duchess of Marlborough. A man of the most undaunted courage in the presence of the enemy, he was his wife's obedient, patient, timid slave. He lived more absolutely under her control than Belisarius under the government of his unscrupulous helpmate. Sarah Jennings was, in her way, almost as remarkable as her husband. She was a woman of great beauty. Kali Sibber, in his apology, pays devoted testimony to her charms. He had by chance to attend on her in the capacity of a sort of amateur lackey, 
at an entertainment in Nottingham, and he seems to have been completely dazzled by her loveliness, quote, If so clear an emanation of beauty, such a commanding grace of aspect, struck me into a regard that has something softer than the most profound respect in it, I cannot see why I may not, without offense, remember it, since beauty, like the sun, must sometimes lose its power to choose and shine into equal warmth the peasant and the courtier. He quaintly adds, however presumptuous or impertinent these thoughts may have appeared at my first entertaining them, why may I not hope that my having kept them decently a secret for full fifty years may be now a good round plea for their pardon, end quote. The imperious spirit which could rule Churchill long dominated the feeble nature of Queen Anne. But when once this domination was overthrown, Sarah Jennings had no art to curb her temper into such show of respect and compliance as might have won back her lost honors. She met her humiliation with the most childish bursts of passion. She did everything in her power to annoy and insult the Queen, who had passed from her haughty control. She was always a keen hater. To the last day of her life she never forgot her resentment toward all who had or who she thought had injured her. In long later years she got into unseemly lawsuits with her own near relations. But if one side of her character was harsh and unlovely enough, it may be admitted that there was something not unheroic about her unyielding spirit, something noble in the respect to her husband's memory, which showed itself in the declaration that she would not marry the emperor of the world after having been the wife of John, Duke of Marlborough. Henry St. John Viscount Bolingbroke was, in his way, as great a man as the Duke of Marlborough. At the time we are now describing, he seemed to have passed through a long, a varied, and a brilliant career, and yet he had only arrived at the age when public men in England now begin to be regarded as responsible politicians. He was in his 36th year. The career that had prematurely begun was drawing to its premature close. He had climbed to his highest position. He is Prime Minister of England and has managed to get rid of his old colleague and rival Robert Harley, Earl of Oxford. Bolingbroke had almost every gift and grace that nature and fortune could give. Three years before this, Swift wrote to Stella, quote, I think Mr. St. John, the greatest young man I ever knew, wit, capacity, beauty, quickness of apprehension, good learning, and an excellent taste, the greatest orator in the House of Commons, admirable conversation, good nature, and good manners generous, and a despiser of money, end quote. Yet, as in the fairy story, the benign powers which had combined to endow him so richly had withheld the one gift which might have made all the rest of surpassing value, and which, being denied, left them of little account. If Bolingbroke had had principle, he would have been one of the greatest Englishmen of any time. His utter want of morality in politics, as well as in private life, proved fatal to him. He only climbed high in order to fall the lower. He was remarkable for profligacy even in that heedless and profligate time. Voltaire, in one of his letters, tells a story of a famous London courtesan who exclaimed to some of her companion nymphs on hearing that Bolingbroke had been made Secretary of State, seven thousand guineas a year, girls, and all for us. Even if the story is not true, it is interesting and significant as an evidence of the sort of impression that Bolingbroke had made upon his age. It was his glory to be vicious. He was proud of his orgies. He liked to be known as a man who could spend the whole night in a drunken revel and the afternoon in preparing some dispatch on which the fortunes of his country or the peace of the world might depend. 
the sight of a beautiful woman could turn him away, for the time, from the gravest political purposes. He was ready at such a moment to throw everything over for the sake of the sudden love chase which had come in his way. He bragged of his amours and boasted that he had never failed of success with any woman who seemed to him worth pursuing. Like Faust, he loved to reel from desire to enjoyment and from enjoyment back again into desire. Bolingbroke was the first of a great line of parliamentary debaters who had made for themselves a distinct place in English history and whose rivals are not to be found in the history of any other parliament. It is difficult at this time to form any adequate idea of Bolingbroke's style as a speaker or his capacity for debate when compared with the other great English parliamentary orators. But so far as one may judge, we should be inclined to think that he must have had Fox's readiness without Fox's redundancy and repetition, and that he must have had the stately diction and the commanding style of the younger Pitt, with a certain freshness and force which the younger Pitt did not always exhibit. Bolingbroke's English prose style is hardly surpassed by that of any other author, either before his time or since. It is supple, strong, and luminous, not redundant, but not bare, ornamented where ornament is suitable and even useful, but nowhere decorated with the purple rags of unnecessary and artificial brilliancy. Such a man, so gifted, must in any case have held a high place among his contemporaries, and probably if Bolingbroke had possessed the political and personal virtues of men like Burke and Pitt, or even the political virtues of a man like Charles Fox, he would have been remembered as the greatest of all English parliamentary statesmen. But, as we have already said, the one defect filled him with faults. The lack of principle gave him a lack of purpose, and wanting purpose, he persevered in no consistent political path. Swift has observed that Bolingbroke, quote, had a great respect for the characters of Alcibiades and Petronius, especially the latter, whom he would gladly be thought to resemble, end quote. He came nearer at his worst to Petronius than at his best to Alcibiades. Alcibiades, to do him justice, admired and understood virtue in others, however small the share of it he contrived to keep for himself. It is impossible to read that wonderful compound of dramatic humor and philosophic thought, Plato's Banquet, without being moved by the generous and impassioned eulogy which Alcibiades, in the fullness of his heart and of his wine, pours out upon the austere virtue of Socrates. Such as Alcibiades is there described, we may suppose Alcibiades to have been, and no one who has followed the career of Bolingbroke can believe it possible that he ever could have felt any sincere admiration for virtue in man or woman, or could have thought of it otherwise than as a thing to be sneered at and despised. The literary men, and more especially the poets of the days of Bolingbroke, seem to have had as little scruple in their compliments as a French petit maître might have in sounding the praises of his mistress to his mistress's ears. Pope talks of his villa where, quote, nobly pensive St. John sat and thought, and declared that such only might tread this sacred floor who dared to love their country and be poor, end quote. It is hard to think of Bolingbroke, even in his more advanced years, as nobly pensive, sitting and thinking, and certainly neither Bolingbroke nor any of Bolingbroke's closer political associates were exactly the sort of men who would have dared to love his country and be poor. In Bolingbroke's latest years, we hear of him as amusing himself by boasting to his second wife of his varied successful amours, until at last the lady, weary of the repetition, somewhat contemptuously reminds him that, however happy as a lover he may have been once, 
His days of love were now over, and the less he said about it, the better. Nor was Pope less extravagant in his praise to Harley than to St. John. He says, If aught below the seats divine can touch immortals, tis a soul like thine, a soul supreme in each hard instance tried, above all pain, all passion, and all pride, the rage of power, the blast of public breath, the lust of lucre, and the dread of death. These lines, it is right to remember, were addressed to Harley, not in his power, but after his fall. Even with that excuse for a friend's overcharged eulogy, they read like a satire on Harley, rather than like his panegyric. Caricature itself could not more broadly distort the features of a human being than his poetic admirer has altered the lineaments of Oxford. Harley had been intriguing on both sides of the field. He professed devoted loyalty to the Queen and to her appointed successor, and he was at the same time coquetting, to put it mildly, with the Stuart family in France. Nothing surprises a reader more than the universal duplicity that seems to have prevailed in the days of Anne and of the early Georges. Falsehood appears to have been a recognized diplomatic and political art. Statesmen, even of the highest rank and reputation, made no concealment of the fact that whenever occasion required, they were ready to state the thing which was not, either in private conversation or in public debate. Nothing could exceed or excuse the boundless duplicity of Marlborough, but it must be owned that even William the Third told almost as many falsehoods to Marlborough as Marlborough could have told to him. At a time when William detested Marlborough, he yet occasionally paid him in public and in private the very highest compliments on his integrity and his virtue. Men were not then supposed or expected to speak the truth. A statesman might deceive a foreign minister or the parliament of his own country with as little risk to his reputation as a lady would have undergone in later days who told a lie to the custom-house officer at the frontier to save the piece of smuggled lace in her trunk. If a man like William of Nassau could stoop to deceit and falsehood for any political purpose. It is easy to understand that a man like Harley would make free use of the same arts and for personal objects as well. Harley's political changes were so many and so rapid that they could not possibly be explained by any theory consistent with sincerity. It was well said of him that, quote, his humor is never to deal clearly or openly but always with reserve, if not dissimulation, and to love tricks when not necessary, but from an inward satisfaction in applauding his own cunning. End quote. He entered Parliament in 1689 and in 1700 was chosen Speaker of the House of Commons. At that time and for long after, it was not an uncommon thing that a man who had been Speaker should afterwards become a Secretary of State sitting in the same house. This was Harley's case. In 1704, he was made Principal Secretary of State. In 1708, Harley resigned office and immediately after took the leadership of the Tory party. In about two years, he overthrew the Whig administration and became the head of a new government with the place of Lord High Treasurer and the title of Earl of Oxford. His craft seems only to have been that low kind of artifice which enables an unscrupulous man to cajole his followers and to stir up division among his enemies. His word was not to be relied upon by friend or enemy, and when he most affected a tone of frankness or of candor, he was least to be trusted. As Lord Stanhope well says of him, quote, his slender and pliant intellect was well fitted to crawl up to the heights of power through all the crooked mazes and dirty bypaths of intrigue, but having once attained the pinnacle, 
Its smallness and meanness was exposed to all the world, end quote. Even his private life had not the virtues which one who reads some of the exalted panegyrics paid to him by contemporary poets and others would be apt to imagine. He was fond of drink and fond of pleasure in a small and secret way. His vices were as unlike the daring and brilliant profligacy of his colleague and rival Bolingbroke as his intellect was inferior to Bolingbroke's surpassing genius. For all Pope's poetic eulogy, the poet could say in prose of Lord Oxford that he was not a very capable minister and had a good deal of negligence into the bargain. Quote, he used to send trifling verses from court to the Scriblerus Club every day and would come and talk idly with them almost every night, even when his all was at stake. End quote. Pope adds that Oxford, quote, talked of business in so confused a manner that you did not know what he was about, and everything he went to tell you was in the epic way, for he always began in the middle, end quote. Swift calls him the greatest procrastinator in the world. It is of Lord Oxford that the story is originally told, which has been told of so many statesmen here and in America since his time. Lord Oxford, according to Pope, invited Rowe, the dramatic poet, to learn Spanish. Rowe went to work and studied Spanish under the impression that some appointment at the Spanish court would follow. When he returned to Harley and told him he had accomplished the task, Harley said, Then, Mr. Rowe, I envy you the pleasure of reading Don Quixote in the original. Pope asks, Is not that cruel? But others have held that it was unintentional on Lord Oxford's part and merely one of his unthinking oddities. Another man, fifteen years younger than Harley, a schoolfellow at Eton of Bolingbroke, was rising slowly, surely into prominence and power. All the great part of his career is yet to come, but even already, while men were talking of Marlborough and Bolingbroke, they found themselves compelled to give a place in their thoughts to Robert Walpole. If Bolingbroke was the first and perhaps the most brilliant of the great line of parliamentary debaters who have made debate a moving power in English history, Walpole was the first of that line of statesmen who sprung from the line of the commoner, have become leaders of the English Parliament. In position and in influence, although not in personal character or accomplishments, Walpole may be described as the direct predecessor of Peel and Gladstone. Just two years before the death of William III, Walpole entered Parliament for the first time. He married, entered Parliament, and succeeded to his father's estates in the same year, 1700. Walpole was only 24 years of age, when he took his seat in the House of Commons as member for Castle Rising in Norfolk. He was a young country squire of considerable fortune and a thorough supporter of the Whig Party. Walpole came into Parliament at that happy time for men of his position when the change was already taking place which marked the representative assembly as the controlling power in the state. The government, as a direct ruling power, was beginning to grow less and less effective, and the House of Commons beginning to grow more and more strong. This change had begun to set in during the Restoration, and by the time Walpole came to be known in Parliament, it was becoming more and more evident that the ministers of the state were in the future only to be men entrusted with the duty of carrying out the will of the majority in the House of Commons. Before that majority, every other power in the state was ultimately to bend. The man, therefore, who could by eloquence, genuine statesmanship, and force of character, or even by mere tact, secure the adhesion of that majority, had become virtually the ruler of the state. But, as will easily be seen, his rule even then was something very different indeed from the rule of an arbitrary minister. He would have to satisfy, to convince, to conciliate the majority. A single false step 
an hour's weakness of purpose, nay, even a failure for which he was not himself accountable in home or foreign policy, might deprive him of his influence over the majority and might reduce him to comparative insignificance. Therefore, the controlling power which a great minister acquired was held by virtue of the most constant watchfulness, the most unsparing labor, energy, and devotion, and also, in a great measure, by the favor of fortune and of opportunity. Walpole was a man eminently qualified to obtain influence over the House of Commons and to keep it up when he had once obtained it. No man could have promised less in the beginning. That was an acute observer who divined the genius of Cromwell under Cromwell's homely exterior when he first came up to Parliament. Almost as much acuteness would have been needed to enable anyone to see the future Prime Minister of England and Master of the House of Commons in the plain, unpromising form, the homely, almost stolid countenance, the ungainly movements and gestures of Walpole. Walpole was as much of a rustic as Lord Althorpe, in times nearer to our own, acknowledged himself to be. Althorpe said he ought to have been a grazier, and that it was an odd chance which made him Prime Minister. But the difference was great. Walpole had the gifts which make a man Prime Minister, despite his country gentleman or grazier-like qualities. It was not chance, but Walpole himself, which raised him to the position he came to hold. Walpole knew nothing and cared nothing about literature and art. His great passion was for hunting, his next love was for wine, and his third for his dinner. Without any natural gift of eloquence, he became a great debater. Nature, which seemed to have lavished all her most luxurious gifts on Bolingbroke, appeared to have pinched and starved Walpole. Where Bolingbroke was richest, Walpole was poorest. Bolingbroke's genius required a frequent rain. Walpole's intellect needed the perpetual spur. Yet Walpole, with his lack of imagination, of eloquence, of wit, of humor, and of culture, went farther and did more than the brilliant Bolingbroke. It was the old fable of the hare and the tortoise over again. Perhaps it should rather be called a new version of the old fable. The farther the hare goes in the wrong way, the more she goes astray, and thus many of Bolingbroke's most rapid movements only helped the tortoise to get to the goal before him. In 1708, Walpole, now recognized as an able debater, a clever tactician, and above all things, an excellent man of business, was appointed secretary at war. He became, at the same time, leader of the House of Commons. He was one of the managers in the unfortunate impeachment of the empty-headed high church preacher Dr. Sacheverell. He resigned office with the other Whig ministers in 1710. Harley, coming into power, offered him a place in the new administration, which Walpole declined to accept. The Tories, reckless and ruthless in their majority, expelled Walpole from the House in 1712 and imprisoned him in the Tower. The charge against him was one of corruption, a charge easily made in those days against any minister, in which, if high moral principles were to prevail, might probably have been as easily sustained as it was made. Walpole, however, was not worse than his contemporaries, nor even if he had been, would the contemporaries have been inclined to treat his offenses very seriously so long as they were not inspired to act against him by partisan motives. At the end of the session he was released, and now, in the closing days of Anne's reign, all eyes turned to him as a rising man and a certain bulwark of the new dynasty. It would be impossible not to regard Jonathan Swift as one of the politicians, one of the statesmen of this age. Swift was a politician in the highest sense, although he had seen little of the one great political arena in which the battles of English politics were fought out. He has left it on record that he never heard either Bolingbroke or Harley speak in Parliament or anywhere in public. 
He was at this time about 47 years of age and had not yet reached his highest point in politics or in literature. The Tale of the Tub had been written, but not Gulliver's Travels, the tract on the conduct of the Allies, but not the Draper's Letters. Even at this time he was a power in political life. His was an influence with which statesmen and even sovereigns had to reckon. No pen ever served a cause better than his had served, and was yet to serve, the interests of the Tory party. He was probably the greatest English pamphleteer at a time when the pamphlet had to do all the work of the leading article and most of the work of the platform. His churchman's gown sat uneasily on him. He was like one of the fighting bishops of the Middle Ages, with whom armor was the more congenial wear. He had a fierce and domineering temper, and indeed, out of his strangely bright blue eyes, there was already beginning to shine only too ominously the wild light of that Saiwa Indignatio, which the inscription, drawn up by his own hand for his tomb, described as lacerating his heart. The ominous light at last broke out into the fire of insanity. We shall meet Swift again. Just now we only stop to note him as a political influence. At this time he is Dean of St. Patrick's in Ireland. He has been lately in London, trying and without success, to bring about a reconciliation between Bolingbroke and Harley, and finding his efforts ineffectual, and seeing that troubled times were near at hand, he has quietly withdrawn to Berkshire. Before leaving London, he wrote the letter to Lord Peterborough, containing the remarkable words with which we have opened this volume. It is curious that Swift himself afterwards ascribed to Harley the saying about the Queen's health and the heedless behavior of statesmen. In his inquiry into the behavior of the Queen's last ministry, dated June 1715, he tells us that, quote, about Christmas 1713, the treasurer said to him, whenever anything ails the queen, these people are out of their wits, and yet they are so thoughtless that as soon as she is well, they act as if she were immortal, end quote. To which Swift adds the following significant comment, I had sufficient reason, both before and since, to allow his observation to be true, and that some share of it might with justice be applied to himself. It was at the house of a clergyman at Upper Letcombe, near Wantage, in Berkshire, that Swift stayed for some time before returning to his Irish home. From Letcombe, the reader will perhaps note, with some painful interest, that Swift wrote to Miss Esther van Humrich, whom all generations will know as Vanessa, a letter in which he describes his somewhat melancholy mode of life just then, tells her, quote, this is the first syllable I have wrote to anybody since you saw me, quote, and adds that, quote, if this place were ten times worse, nothing shall make me return to town while things are in the situation I left them, end quote. Swift, in his heart, trusted neither Bolingbroke nor Harley. It seems clear that Lady Masham was under the impression that she had Swift as her accomplice in the intrigue which finally turned Harley out of office. She writes to him while he is at Letcombe, a letter which could not have been written if she were not in that full conviction, and he does not reply until the whole week's crisis is past and a new condition of things arisen. And in the reply, he commits himself to nothing. If he distrusted Bolingbroke, he could not help admiring him. Bolingbroke was the only man then near the court, whose genius must not have been rebuked by Swift. But Swift must, for all his lavish praises of Harley, have sometimes secretly despised the hesitating, time-serving statesman with whom indecision was a substitute for prudence, and to be puzzled was to seem to deliberate. That Harley should have had the playing of a great political game while Swift could only look on, is one of the anomalies of history, which Swift's sardonic humor must have appreciated to the full. 
Swift took his revenge when he could by bullying his great official friends now and then in the roughest fashion. He knew that they feared him and flattered him because they feared him, and he was glad of it and hugged himself in the knowledge. He knew even that at one time they were uncertain of his fidelity and took much pains by their praises and their promises to keep him close to their side, and this too amused him. He was amused, as a tyrant might be, at the obvious efforts of those around him to keep him in good humor, or, as a man conscious of incipient madness, might find malign delight in the anxiety of his friends to fall in with all his moods, and not to cross him in anything he was pleased to say. Joseph Addison had a political position and influence on the other side of the controversy which entitle him to be ranked among the statesmen of the day. Only in the year before, his tragedy of Cato had been brought out, and it had created an altogether peculiar sensation. Each of the two great political parties seized upon the opportunity given by Cato's pompous political virtue, and claimed him as the spokesman of their cause. The Whigs, of course, had the author's authority to appropriate the applause of Cato, and the Whigs, had endeavored to pack the house in order to secure their claim. But the Tories were equal to the occasion. They appeared in great numbers, Bolingbroke, then Secretary of State, at their head. When Cato lamented the extinguished freedom of his country, the Whigs were vociferous in their cheers and glared fiercely at the Tories. But when the austere Roman was made to denounce Caesar and a perpetual dictatorship, the Tories professed to regard this as a denunciation to Marlborough and his demand to be made commander-in-chief for life, and they gave back the cheering with redoubled vehemence. At last, Bolingbroke's own genius suggested a masterstroke. He sent for the actor who played Cato's part, thanked him in the face of the public, and presented him with a purse of gold because of the service he had done in sustaining the cause of liberty against the tyranny of a perpetual dictator. Addison held many high political offices. He was secretary to a Lord Lieutenant of Ireland more than once. He was made secretary to the regents, as they were called. The commissioners entrusted by George I with the task of administration previous to his arrival in England. He sat in Parliament. He was appointed under Secretary of State, and as soon to be, for a while, one of the principal secretaries of state. The last number of his Spectator was published at the close of 1714. This was indeed still a time when literary men might hold high political office. The deadening influence of the Georges had not yet quite prevailed against letters and art. Matthew Pryor, about whose poetry the present age troubles itself but little, sat in Parliament was employed in many of the most important diplomatic negotiations of the day, and had not long before this time held the office of plenipotentiary in Paris. Richard Steele not merely sat in the House of Commons, but was considered of sufficient importance to deserve the distinction of a formal expulsion from the House because of certain political diatribes for which he was held responsible in which the Commons chose to vote libelous. At the time we are now describing, he had re-entered Parliament and was still a brilliant penman on the side of the Whigs. His career as politician, literary man, and practical dramatist combined seems in some sort a foreshadowing of that of Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Gay was appointed secretary to Lord Clarendon on a diplomatic mission to Hanover. Nicholas Rowe, the author of The Fair Penitent and the translator of Lucan's Pharsalia, was at one time an under-secretary of state. Rowe's dramatic work is not yet absolutely forgotten by the world. We still hear of the gallant gay Lothario, although many of those who are glib with the words do not know that they come from the fair penitent, and would not care even if they did know. End of Section 2 Recording by Pamela Nagami
Section 3 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. Chapter 3. Lost for Want of Spirit. When Bolingbroke found himself in full power, he began at once to open the way for some attempt at the restoration of the Stuart dynasty. He put influential Jacobites into important offices in England and Scotland. He made the Duke of Ormond warden of the Cinque Ports, that authority covering exactly the stretch of coast at some point of which it might be expected that James Stuart would land if he were to make an attempt for the crown at all. Ormond was a weak and vain man, but he was a man of personal integrity. He had been sent out to Flanders to succeed the greatest commander of the age as captain general of the allied armies there, and he had naturally played a poor and even a ridiculous part. The Jacobites in England still, however, held him in much honor, identified his name, no one exactly knew why, with the cause of high church, and elected him the hero and the leader of the movement for the restoration of the exiled family. Bolingbroke committed Scotland to the care of the Earl of Mar, a Jacobite, a personal friend of James Stuart and a votary of high church. It can hardly be supposed that in making such an appointment, Bolingbroke had not in his mind the possibility of a rising of the Highland clans against the Hanoverian succession. But it is nonetheless evident that Bolingbroke was, as usual, thinking far more of himself than of his party, and that his preparations were made not so much with a view to restoring the Stuarts as with the object of securing himself against any chance that might befall. Had Bolingbroke been resolved in his heart to bring back the Stuarts, had he been ready, as many other men were, to risk all in that cause, to stand or to fall by it, he might, so far as one can see, have been successful. It is not too much to say that, on the whole, the majority of the English people were in favor of the Stuarts. Certainly, the majority would have preferred a Stuart to the dreaded and disliked German prince from Herrenhausen. For many years, the birthday of the Stuart prince had been celebrated as openly and as enthusiastically in English cities as if it were the birthday of the reigning sovereign James's adherents were everywhere, in the court, in the camp, on the bench, in Parliament, in the drawing-rooms, the coffee-houses, and the streets. Bolingbroke had only to present him at a critical moment and say, Here is your king, and James Stuart would have been king. Such a crisis came in France in our own days. There was a moment after the fall of the Second Empire, when the Count de Chambord had only to present himself in Versailles in order to be accepted as King of France, not King of the French. But the Count de Chambord put away his chance deliberately. He would not consent to give up the white flag of legitimacy and accept the tricolor. He acted on principle, knowing the forfeit of his decision. The chances of James Stuart were frittered away in half-heartedness, insincerity, and folly. While Bolingbroke and his confederates were caballing and counselling and paltering and drinking, the Whig statesmen were maturing their plans, and when the moment came for action, it found them ready to act. The success was accomplished by a coup d'etat on Friday, July 30th, 1714. The Queen was suddenly stricken with apoplexy. A Privy Council was to meet that morning at Kensington Palace. The Privy Council meeting was composed then, according to the principle which prevails still, only of such councillors as had received a special summons. In truth, the meeting of the Privy Council in Anne's time was like a cabinet meeting of our days, and was intended by those who convened it to be just as strictly composed of official members. But, on the other hand, there was no law or rule forbidding any member of the Privy Council, whether summoned or not, 
to present himself at the meeting. Bolingbroke was in his place, and so was the Duke of Ormond, and so were other Jacobite peers. The Duke of Shrewsbury had taken his seat, as he was entitled to do, being one of the highest officers of state. Shrewsbury was known to be a loyal adherent of the Act of Settlement and the Hanoverian succession. He was a remarkable man with a remarkable history. His father was the unfortunate Shrewsbury, who was killed in a duel by the Duke of Buckingham. The duel arose out of the Duke's open intrigue with the Countess of Shrewsbury, and the story went at the time that the lady herself, dressed as a page, held her lover's horse while he fought with and killed her husband. Charles Talbot, the son, was brought up a Catholic, but in his twentieth year accepted the arguments of Tillotson and became a Protestant. He was Lord Chamberlain to James the Second, but lost all faith in James and went over to Holland to assist William of Nassau with counsel and with money. When William became King of England, he made Lord Shrewsbury a Privy Councillor and Secretary of State, created him first Marquis and afterwards Duke, and called him, in tribute to his great popularity, the King of Hearts. He was, for a short time, British Ambassador at the Court of France, and then Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. He had flickered a little between the Whigs and the Tories at different periods of his career, and in 1710 he actually joined the Tory party. But it was well known to everyone that if any question should arise between the House of Hanover and the Stuarts, he would stand firmly by the appointed succession. He was a man of undoubted integrity and great political sagacity. He had a handsome face, although he had lost one of his eyes by an accident when riding, and he had a stately presence. His gifts and graces were said to have so much attracted the admiration of Queen Mary that if she had outlived the king, she would probably have married Shrewsbury. The condition of the political world around him had impressed him with so little reverence for courts and cabinets that he used to say that if he had a son, he would rather bring him up a cobbler than a courtier, and a hangman than a statesman. Bolingbroke once kindly said of him, I never knew a man so formed to please and to gain upon the affections while challenging the esteem. Before there was time to get to any of the business of the council, the doors were opened and the Duke of Argyle and the Duke of Somerset entered the room. The Duke of Argyle, soldier, statesman, orator, shrewd self-seeker, represented the Whigs of Scotland. The honest, proud, pompous Duke of Somerset, those of England. The two intruders, as they were assuredly regarded by the majority of those present, announced that they had heard the news of the Queen's danger and that they felt themselves bound to hasten to the meeting of the council, although not summoned thither, in order that they might be able to afford advice and assistance. The Duke of Somerset was, in many respects, the most powerful nobleman in England. But all his rank, his dignity, and his influence could not protect him against the ridicule and contempt which his feeble character, his extravagant pride, and his grotesquely haughty demeanor invariably brought upon him. He was probably the most ridiculous man of his time. He had the pomp of an Eastern pasha without the grave dignity which Eastern manners confer. He was like the pasha of a burlesque or an opera boeuf. His servants had to obey him by signs. He disdained to give orders by voice. His first wife was Elizabeth Percy, the virgin widow of Lord Ogle and Tom Thin of Longleat, the beloved of Charles John Königsmark, the carrots of Dean Swift. While she was Duchess of Somerset and Queen Anne's close friend, Swift, who hated her, hinted pretty broadly that she was privy to Königsmark's plot to murder Tom Thin 
and the Duchess revenged herself by keeping the dean out of the bishopric of Hereford. When she died, Somerset married Lady Charlotte Finch, one of the black funereal Finches celebrated by Sir Charles Hanbury Williams. Once, when she tapped him on the shoulder with a fan, he rebuked her angrily. My first wife was a Percy, and she never took such a liberty. When he had occasion to travel, all the roads on or near which he had to pass were scoured by a vanguard of outriders, whose business it was to protect him not merely from obstruction and delay, but from the gaze of the vulgar herd, who might be anxious to feast their eyes upon his gracious person. The statesmen of his own time, while they made use of him, seemed to have vied with each other in protestations of their contempt for his abilities and his character. Swift declared that Somerset had not a grain of sense of any kind. Marlborough several times professed an utter contempt for Somerset's abilities or discretion, and was indignant at the idea that he ever could have made use of such a man in any work requiring confidence or judgment. Yet Somerset, ridiculous as he was, came to be a personage of importance in the crisis now impending over England. He was, at all events, a man whose word could be trusted, and who, when he promised to take a certain course, would be sure to follow it. That very pride which made him habitually ridiculous raised him on great occasions above any suspicion of mercenary or personal views in politics. One of his contemporaries describes him as, quote, so humorsome, proud, and capricious that he was rather a ministry spoiler than a ministry maker, end quote. In the present condition of things, however, he could be made use of for the purpose of making one ministry after spoiling another. When he carried his great personal influence over to the side of the Hanoverian accession and joined with Argyle and with Shrewsbury, it must have been evident to men like Bolingbroke at least that the enterprises of the Jacobites would require rare good fortune, and marvelous energy to bring them to any success. Poetry and romance have shown to the world the most favorable side of the character of John Campbell, Duke of Argyll, who was then at least as powerful in Scotland as the Duke of Somerset in England. Pope describes him as Argyll, the state's whole thunder born to wield, and shake alike the Senate and the field. Scott has drawn a charming picture of him in the heart of Midlothian, as the patriotic Scotsman, whose heart must be cold as death, can make it when it does not warm to the tartan, the kind and generous protector of Jeanie Deans. Argyll was a man of many gifts. He was a soldier, a statesman, and an orator. He had charged at Romilly's and Oudenard, had rallied a shrinking column at Malplaquet and served in the sieges of Ostend and Lille and Ghent. His eloquence in the House of Lords is said to have combined the freshness of youth, the strength of manhood, and the wisdom of old age. Lord Harvey, who is not given to praise, admits that Argyle was, quote, gallant and a good officer, with very good parts, and much more reading and knowledge than generally falls to the share of a man educated a soldier, and born to so great a title and fortune, end quote. But Harvey also says that Argyll was, quote, haughty, passionate, and peremptory, end quote, and it cannot be doubted that he was capable of almost any political tergiversation or even treachery which could have served his purpose, and his purpose was always his own personal interest. He changed his opinions with the most unscrupulous promptitude. He gave an opinion one way and acted another way without hesitation and without a blush. He was always equal to the emergency. He had the full courage of his non-convictions. He was the grandson of that Argyle whose last sleep before his execution is the subject of Mr. Ward's well-known painting. His great-grandfather, too, gave up his life on the scaffold. 
He did not want any of the courage of his ancestors, but he was likely to take care that his advancement should not be to the block or the gallows. At such a moment as this, which we are now describing, his adhesion and his action were of inestimable value to the Hanoverian cause. When these two great peers entered the council chamber, a moment of perplexity and confusion followed. Bolingbroke and Ormond had probably not even yet a full understanding of the meaning of this dramatic performance and what consequences it was likely to ensure. While they sat silent, according to some accounts, the Duke of Shrewsbury arose, and gravely thanking the Whig peers for their courtesy in attending the council, accepted their cooperation in the name of all the others present. They took their places at council table, and St. John and Ormond must have begun to feel that all was over. The intrusion of the Whig peers was a daring and a significant step in itself, but when the Duke of Shrewsbury welcomed their appearance and accepted their cooperation, it was clear to the Jacobites that all was part of a prearranged scheme to which resistance would now be in vain. The new visitors to the council called for the reports of the royal physician, and having received and read them, suggested that the Duke of Shrewsbury should be recommended to the Queen as Lord High Treasurer. St. John did not venture to resist the proposal. He could only sit with as much appearance of composure as he was able to maintain and accept the suggestion of his enemies. A deputation of the peers, with the Duke of Shrewsbury among them, at once sought and obtained an interview with the dying queen. She gave the Lord High Treasurer's staff into Shrewsbury's hand and bade him, it is said, in that voice of singular sweetness and melody, which was almost her only charm, to use it for the good of her people. The office of Lord High Treasurer is now always put into what is called commission. Its functions are managed by several ministers, of whom the First Lord of the Treasury is one and the Chancellor of the Exchequer another. In all recent times, the First Lord of the Treasury has usually been Prime Minister, and his office therefore corresponds fairly enough with that which was called the office of Lord High Treasurer in earlier days. It was clear that when the Duke of Shrewsbury became Lord High Treasurer at such a junction, he would stand firmly by the Protestant succession and would oppose any kind of scheming in the cause of the exiled Stuarts. Some writers near to that time, and Mr. Lecky, among more recent historians, are of opinion that it was not either of the intruding dukes who proposed that Shrewsbury should be appointed treasurer. Mr. Lecky is even of the opinion that it may have been Bolingbroke himself who made the suggestion. That seems to us extremely probable. All accounts agree in confirming the idea that Bolingbroke was taken utterly by surprise when the great Whig dukes entered the council chamber. The moment he saw that Shrewsbury welcomed them, he probably made up his mind to the fact that an entirely new condition of things had arisen and that all his previous calculations were upset. He was not a man to remain long dumbfounded by any change in the state of affairs. It would have been quite consistent with his character and his general course of action if when he saw the meaning of the crisis he had at once resolved to make the best of it and to try to keep himself still at the head of affairs. In that spirit, nothing is more likely than that he should have pushed himself to the front once more and proposed as Lord High Treasurer the man whom, but for the sudden and overwhelming pressure brought to bear upon him, he would have tried to keep out of all influence and power at such a moment. The appointment of the Duke of Shrewsbury settled the question. The crisis was virtually over. The Whig statesmen at once sent out summonses to all the members of the Privy Council living anywhere near London. That same afternoon, another meeting of the Council was held. Summers himself, the great Whig leader, 
whose services had made the party illustrious in former reigns, and whose fame sheds a luster on them even to this hour. Summers, aged, infirm, decaying as he was in body and in mind, hastened to attend the summons and to lend his strength and his authority to the measures on which his colleagues had determined. The council ordered the concentration of several regiments in and near London. They recalled troops from Ostend and sent a fleet to sea. General Stanhope, a soldier and statesman of whom we shall hear more, was prepared, if necessary, to take possession of the tower and clap the leading Jacobites into it, to obtain possession of all the outports, and, in short, to act as military dictator, authorized to anticipate revolution and to keep the succession safe. In a word, the fate of the Stuarts was sealed. Bolingbroke was checkmated. The Chevalier de Saint-Georges would have put to sea in vain. Marlborough was on his way to England, and there was nothing to do but to wait till the breath was out of Queen Anne's body and proclaim George the Elector King of England. The time of waiting was not long. Anne sank into death on August 1, 1714, and the heralds proclaimed that, quote, the high and mighty Prince George, Elector of Brunswick and Lüneburg, is, by the death of Queen Anne of blessed memory, become our lawful and rightful liege lord, king of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, end quote. This king of France was lucky enough not to come to his throne until the conclusion of a long war against the king of France who lived in Versailles. The defender of the faith was just now making convenient arrangements that his mistresses should follow him as speedily as possible when he should have to take his unwilling way to his new dominions. On August 3rd, Bolingbroke wrote a letter to Dean Swift in which he says, The Earl of Oxford was removed on Tuesday. The Queen died on Sunday. What a world this is! And how does fortune banter us? In other words, Bolingbroke tells Swift that full success seemed within his grasp on Tuesday and was suddenly torn away from him on Sunday. But the most characteristic part of the letter is a passage which throws a very blaze of light over the unconquerable levity of the man. Quote, I have lost all by the death of the queen but my spirit, and I protest to you, I feel that increase upon me. The Whigs are a pack of Jacobites, that shall be the cry in a month, if you please. End quote. No sooner is one web of intrigue swept away than Bolingbroke sets to work to weave a new one on a different plan. Nothing can subdue those high animal spirits. Nothing can physic that selfishness. Nothing can fix that levity to a recognition of the realities of things. Bolingbroke has not a word now about the cause of the Stuarts. For the moment, he cannot think of that. His new scheme is to make out that his enemies were, after all, the true Jacobites. He will checkmate them that way in a month, if you please. On the very same day, Mr. John Barber, the printer of some of Swift's pamphlets, afterwards an alderman and Lord Mayor, writes to Swift and tells him, speaking of Bolingbroke, that when my Lord gave me the letter to be enclosed to Swift, he said he hoped you would come up and help to save the Constitution, which, with a little good management, might be kept in Tory hands. The chill, clear, common sense of Swift's answer might have impressed even Bolingbroke, but did not. One among the Tories, indeed, would have had the courage to forestall the Whigs and their proclamation. This one man was a priest and not a soldier. Atterbury, the eloquent Bishop of Rochester, came to Bolingbroke and urged him to proclaim King James at Charing Cross, offering himself to head a procession in his lawn sleeves if Bolingbroke would only act on his advice. But for the moment, Bolingbroke could only complain of fortune's banter and plan out new intrigues for the restoration, not of the Stuarts, but of the Tory party, that is to say, of himself. His refusal wrung from Atterbury the declaration 
that the best cause in England was lost for want of spirit. Parliament assembled, and on August 5th the Commons was summoned to the bar of the House of Lords, and the Lord Chancellor made a speech in the name of the Lords of the Regency. He told the Lords and Commons that the Privy Council, appointed by George, Elector of Hanover, had proclaimed that prince as the lawful and rightful sovereign of these realms. Both houses agreed to send addresses to the king, expressing their duty and affection, and the House of Commons passed a bill granting to his majesty the same civil list as that which Queen Anne had enjoyed, but with additional clauses for the payment of arrears due to the Hanoverian troops who had been in the service of Great Britain. The Lord Chancellor, who had just addressed the House of Lords and the commoners standing at the bar, was himself a remarkable illustration of the politics and the principles of that age. Simon Harcourt had been Lord Chancellor in the later years of Queen Anne's life. His appointment ended with her death, but he was reappointed by the Lords of the Regency in the name of the new sovereign, and he was again sworn in as Lord Chancellor on August 3, 1714, in court at his house aforesaid, Lincoln's Inn Fields, Anno Primo Georgi Regis. He was one of the Lord's Justices by virtue of his office, and as such had already taken the oath of allegiance to the new sovereign and of abjuration to James. Lord Harcourt had been, throughout his whole career, not only a very devoted Tory, but in later years a positive Jacobite. He was a highly accomplished speaker, a man of great culture, and a lawyer of considerable, if not preeminent, attainments. He was still comparatively young for a public man of such position. Born in 1660, he entered Pembroke College, Oxford, in 1675, was admitted to the Inner Temple in 1676, and called to the bar in 1683. He became Member of Parliament for Abingdon in 1690, and soon rose to great distinction in the House of Commons as well as at the bar. He conducted the impeachment of the great Lord Somers, and was knighted and made Solicitor General by Anne in 1702. He became Attorney General shortly after. He conducted in 1703 the prosecution of Defoe for his famous satirical tract, The Shortest Way with the Dissenters. Harcourt threw himself into the prosecution with the fervor and the bitterness of a sectary and a partisan. He made a most vehement and envenomed speech against Defoe. He endeavored to stir up every religious prejudice and passion in favor of the prosecution. Coke had scarcely shown more of the animosity of a partisan in prosecuting Raleigh than Simon Harcourt did in prosecuting Defoe. In 1709 and 1710, Harcourt was the leading counsel for Sacheverell and received the Great Seal in 1710, becoming, as the phrase then was, Lord Keeper of the Great Seal of Great Britain. A whole year, wanting only a few days, passed before he was raised to the peerage as Lord Harcourt. He acted as Speaker of the House of Lords before he became a peer and a member of the House, and even had on one occasion to express on behalf of the peers their thanks to Lord Peterborough for his services in Spain. In 1713, he became Lord Chancellor of England. During all this time, he had been a most devoted adherent of the Stuarts, and during the later period, he was an open and avowed Jacobite. He had opposed strongly the oaths of abjuration which now, as Lord Chief Justice, he had both taken and administered. Almost his first conspicuous act as a member of Parliament was to protest against the bill which required the oath of abjuration of James and his descendants, and he maintained consistently the same principles and the same policy till the death of Queen Anne. There can be no doubt that if just then any movement had been made on behalf of the Stuarts with the slightest chance of success, Lord Chancellor Harcourt would have thrown himself into it heart and soul. Nevertheless, he took the oath of allegiance and the oath of abjuration, 
he professed to be a loyal subject of the king, whose person and principles he despised and detested, and he swore to abjure for ever all adhesion to that dynasty, which with all his heart he would have striven, if he could, to restore to the throne of England. Lord Campbell, in his Lives of the Lord Chancellors, says of Harcourt, quote, I do not consider his efforts to restore the exiled Stuarts morally inconsistent with the engagements into which he had entered to the existing government, and although there were loud complaints against him for at last sending in his adhesion to the House of Hanover, it should be recollected that the cause of the Stuarts had then become desperate, and that instead of betraying, he did everything in his power to screen his old associates. End quote. The cause of the Stuarts had not become, even then, so utterly desperate as to prevent many brave men from laying down their lives for it. Thirty years had to pass away before the last blow was struck for that cause of the Stuarts, which Harcourt, by solemn oath, abjured for ever. Such credit as he is entitled to have, because he protected rather than betrayed his old associates, we are free to give him, and it stands a significant illustration of the political morality of the time that such comparative credit is all that his enthusiastic biographer ventures to claim for him. The House of Lords had then 207 members, many of whom, being Catholics, were not permitted to take any part in public business. That number of peers is about in just proportion to the population of England as it was then when compared with the peers and the population of England at present. In the House of Commons there were, at the same time, 558 members. England sent in 513, and Scotland, which had lately accepted the Union, returned 45. It need hardly be said that at that time Ireland had her own Parliament and sent no members to Westminster. A great number of the county family names in the House of Commons were just the same as those which we see at present. The Stanhopes, the Lowthers, the Lawsons, the Herberts, the Harcourts, the Cowpers, the Fitzwilliams, the Cecils, the Grevilles, all these and many others were represented in Parliament then as they are represented in Parliament now. Then, as more lately, the small boroughs had the credit of returning, mostly, of course, through family influence, men of eminence other than political, who happened to sit in the House of Commons. Steele sat for Stockbridge in Southampton County, as Hampshire was then always called, Addison for Malmesbury, Pryor for East Grinstead. There were no reports of the debates nor printed lists of the divisions. Questions of foreign policy were sometimes discussed with doors strictly closed against all strangers, just as similar questions are occasionally, and not infrequently, discussed in the Senate of the United States at present. The pamphlet supplied, in some measure, the place of the newspaper report and the newspaper leading article. Some twelve years later than this, the brilliant pen of Bolingbroke, who, if he had lived at a period nearer to our own, might have been an unrivaled writer of leading articles, was able to obtain for the series of pamphlets called The Craftsman a circulation greater than that ever enjoyed by the spectator. Pulteney cooperated with him for a time in the work. Steele, as we have said, had been expelled from the House of Commons for his pamphlet The Crisis. The caricature which played so important a part in political controversy all through the reigns of the Georges had just come into recognized existence. Countless caricatures of Bolingbroke, of Walpole, of Shrewsbury, of Marlborough began to fly about London. Scurrilous ballads were, of course, in great demand, nor was the supply inadequate to the demand. One of the most successful of these compositions described the return of the Duke of Marlborough to London. On the very day of the Queen's death, Marlborough landed at Dover. He came quickly on to London, and there, according to the descriptions given by his admirers, he was received like a restored sovereign returning to his throne. 
a procession of two hundred gentlemen on horseback met him on the road to London, and the procession was joined shortly after by a long train of carriages. As he entered London, the enthusiasm deepened with every foot of the way. The streets were lined with crowds of applauding admirers. Marlborough's carriage broke down near Temple Bar, and he had to exchange it for another. The little incident was only a new cause for demonstrations of enthusiasm. It was a fresh delight to see the hero more nearly than he could be seen through his carriage windows. It was something to have delayed him for a moment, and to have compelled him to stand amongst the crowd of those who were pressing round to express their homage. This was the Whig description. According to Tory accounts, Marlborough was more hissed than Hazard, and at Temple Bar the hissing was loudest. The work of the historian would be comparatively easy if eyewitnesses could only agree as to any, even the most important facts. Enthusiastic Whig pamphleteers called upon their countrymen to love and honor their invincible hero and declared that the wretch would be esteemed a disgrace to humanity and should be transmitted to posterity with infamy who would dare to use his tongue or pen against him. Such wretches, however, were found and did not seem in the least to dread the infamy which was promised them. The scurrilous ballad of which we have already spoken was by one Ned Ward, a publican and rhymester, and it pictured the entry of the Duke in verses after the fashion of Hudibras. It depicted the procession as made up of frightful troops of thin-jawed zealots, cursed enemies to kings and prelates, and declared that those champions of religious errors made London seem as if the Prince of Terrors was coming with his dismal train to plague the city once again. The memory of what the plague had done in London was still green enough to give bitter force to this illusion. Marlborough could have afforded to despise what Hotspur calls the meter ballad mongers, but his pride received a check and chill not easily to be got over. When fairly rid of his enthusiastic followers and admirers, he went to the House of Lords almost at once and took the oaths, but he did not remain there. In truth, he soon found himself bitterly disappointed, not with the people, they could not have been more enthusiastic than they were, but with the new ruling power. Immediately after the death of the Queen, and even before the proclamation of the new sovereign had taken place, the Hanoverian resident in London handed to the Privy Council a letter from George, in George's own handwriting, naming the men who were to act in combination with the seven great officers of state as Lord's Justices. The power to make this nomination was provided for George by the Regency Act. This document contained the names of 18 of the principal Whig peers, the Duke of Shrewsbury, the Duke of Somerset, and the Duke of Argyll were amongst them. So, too, were Lords Cowper, Halifax, and Townsend. It was noted with wonder that the illustrious name of Somers did not appear on the list, nor did that of Marlborough, nor that of Marlborough's son-in-law, Lord Sunderland. It is likely that the omission of these names was only made in the first instance because George and his advisers were somewhat afraid of his getting into the hands of a sort of dictatorship, a dictatorship in commission, as it might be called, made up of three or four influential men. The king afterwards hastened to show every attention to Marlborough and Somers and Sunderland, and he soon restored Marlborough to all his public offices. But George seems to have had a profound and a very well-justified distrust of Marlborough. Though he honored him with marks of respect and attention, though he restored him to the great position he had held in the state, yet the king never allowed Marlborough to suppose that he really had regained his former influence in court and political life, 
Marlborough was shelved, and he already knew it and bitterly complained of it. End of Section 3《Section 4 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4. The King Comes. Quote, the old town of Hanover, says Thackeray, must look still pretty much as in the time when George Louis left it. The gardens and pavilions of Herrenhausen are scarce changed since the day when the stout old electress Sophia fell down in her last walk there, preceding but by a few weeks to the tomb James the Second's daughter, whose death made way for the Brunswick Stuarts in England. You may see at Herrenhausen the very rustic theatre in which the Platons danced and performed masks and sang before the elector and his sons. There are the very fawns and dryads of stone still glimmering through the branches, still grinning and piping their ditties of no tone, as in the days when painted nymphs hung garlands round them, appeared under their leafy arcades with gilt crooks, guiding rams with gilt horns, descended from machines in the guise of Diana or Minerva, and delivered immense allegorical compliments to the princes returned home from the campaign. Herrenhausen, indeed, is changed but little since those days of which Thackeray speaks. But although not many years have passed since Thackeray went to visit Hanover before delivering his lectures on the Four Georges, Hanover itself has undergone much alteration. If one of the Georges could now return to his ancestral capital, he would indeed be bewildered at the great new squares, the rows of tall, vast shops and warehouses, the spacious railway station, penetrated to every corner at night by the keen electric light. But in passing from Hanover to Herrenhausen, one goes back in a short drive from the days of the Emperor William of Germany to the days of George the Elector. Herrenhausen, the favorite residence of the electors of Hanover, is but a short distance from the capital. Thackeray speaks of it as an ugly place, and it certainly has not many claims to the picturesque, but it is full of a certain curious, half-melancholy interest, and well fitted to be the cradle and the home of a decaying Hanoverian dynasty. In its galleries, one may spend many an hour, not unprofitably, in studying the faces of all the men and women who are famous, notorious, or infamous in connection with the history of Hanover. The story of that dynasty has more than one episode, not unlike that of the unfortunate Sophia Dorothea and Königsmark, her lover, a good many grim legends haunt the place, and give interest to some of the faces, otherwise insipid enough, which look out of the heavy frames and the formal court dresses of the picture gallery. On the evening of August 5th, 1714, four days after Queen Anne's death, Lord Clarendon, the lately appointed English minister at the court of Hanover, set out for the palace of Herrenhausen to bear to the new king of Great Britain the tidings of Queen Anne's death. About two o'clock in the morning he entered the royal apartments of the ungenial and sleepy George, and kneeling did homage to him as king of Great Britain. George took the announcement of his new rank without even a semblance of gratification. He had made up his mind to endure it, and that was all. He was too stolid or lazy or sincere to affect the slightest personal interest in the news. He lingered in Hanover as long as he decently could, and sauntered for many a day through the prim, dull, and orderly walks of Herrenhausen. He behaved very much in the fashion of the convict in Prior's poem, who, when the cart was ready and the halter adjusted, quote, 
often took leave, but seem loathed to depart. End quote. August thirty first had arrived before George began his journey to England. But he did one or two good natured things before leaving Hanover. He ordered the abolition of certain duties on provisions, and he had the insolvent debtors throughout the electorate discharged from custody. On September 5th, he reached The Hague, and here another stoppage took place. The exertion of traveling from Hanover to The Hague had been so great that George apparently required a respite from September 5th until the 16th. On the 16th, he embarked and reached Greenwich two days after. He was accompanied to England by his two leading favorites, the ladies whose charms we have already described. For many days after his arrival in London, the king did little but lament his exile from his beloved Herrenhausen and tell everyone he met how cordially he disliked England, its people, and its ways. Fortunately, perhaps in this respect for the popularity of his majesty, George's audience was necessarily limited. He spoke no English, and hardly any of those who surrounded him could speak German, while some of his ministers did not even speak French. Sir Robert Walpole tried to get on with him by talking Latin. Even the English oysters George could not abide. He grumbled long at their queer taste, their want of flavor, and it was some time before his devoted attendants discovered that their monarch liked stale oysters with a good strong rankness about them. No time was lost when this important discovery had been made in procuring oysters to the taste of the king, and one of George's objections to the throne of England was easily removed. There was naturally great curiosity to see the king, and a writer of the time gives an amusing account of the efforts made to obtain a sight of him, quote, a certain person has paid several guineas for the benefit of Cheapside Conduit, and another has almost given twenty years' purchase for a shed in Stocks Market. Some lay out great sums in shop windows, others sell lottery tickets to higher cobbler's stalls, and here and there a vintner has received interest for the use of his signpost. King Charles the Second's horse at the aforesaid market is to carry double, and his majesty at Charing Cross is to ride between two draymen. Some have made interest to climb chimneys, and others to be exalted to the airy station of a steeple. End quote. The princely pageant which people were so eager to see lives still in a print issued by Tim Jordan and Thomas Baconwell at the Golden Lion in Fleet Street. We are thus gladdened with the sight of the splendid procession winding its way through St. James's Park to St. James's Palace. There are musketeers and trumpeters on horseback, there are courtly gentlemen on horse and afoot, and great lumbering, gilded, gaudily bedizened carriages with four and six steeds and more trumpeters, on foot this time, and pursuivants and heralds, George was fond of heralds, and created two of his own, Hanover and Gloucester, and then the royal carriage, with its eight prancing horses, and the elector of Hanover and King of England inside, with his hand to his heart, and still more soldiers following, both horse and foot, and, of course, a loyal populace everywhere, waving their three-cornered hats and huzzahing with all their might. The day of the entry was not without its element of tragedy. In the crowd, Colonel Chudley called Mr. Charles Aldworth, M.P. for New Windsor, a Jacobite. There was a quarrel. The gentlemen went to Marylebone Fields, exchanged a few passes, and Mr. Aldworth was almost immediately killed. This was no great wonder, for we learn in a letter from Lord Berkeley of Stratton, preserved in the Wentworth Papers, describing the duel, that Mr. Aldworth had such a weakness in his arms from childhood that he could not stretch them out. A fact, Lord Barclay hints, by no means unknown to his adversary. Horace Walpole 
has left a description of King George which is worth citation. Quote, the person of the king, he says, is perfect in my memory as if I saw him yesterday. It was that of an elderly man, rather pale and exactly like his pictures and coins, not tall, of an aspect rather good than august, with a dark tie wig, a plain coat, waistcoat, and breeches of snuff-colored cloth, with stockings of the same color, and a blue ribbon over all." End quote. George was fond of heavy dining and heavy drinking. He often dined at Sir Robert Walpole's at Richmond Hill, where he used to drink so much punch that even the Duchess of Kendal endeavored to restrain him, and received in return some coarse admonition in German. He was shy and reserved in general, and he detested all the troublesome display of royalty. He hated going to the theater in state, and he did not even care to show himself in the front of the royal box. He preferred to sit in another and less conspicuous box with the Duchess of Kendal and Lady Walsingham. On the whole, it would seem as if the inclination of the English people for the Hanoverian dynasty was about to be tried by the severest test that fate could well ordain. A dull, stolid and profligate king fond of drink and of low conversation without dignity of appearance or manner without sympathy of any kind with the english people in english ways and without the slightest knowledge of the english language was suddenly thrust upon the people and proclaimed their king fortunately for the hanoverian dynasty the english people as a whole had grown into a mood of comparative indifference as to who should rule them so long as they were let alone. It was impossible that a strong feeling of loyalty to any house should burn just then in the breast of the great majority of the English people. Those who were devoted to the Stuarts and those who detested the Stuarts felt strongly on the subject this way or that, and they would therefore admire or detest King George according to their previously acquired political principles. But to the ordinary Englishman, it only seemed that England had lately been trying a variety of political systems and a variety of rulers, that one seemed to succeed hardly better than the other, that so long as no great breakdown in the system took place, it mattered little whether a Stuart or a Brunswick was in temporary possession of the throne. Within a comparatively short space of time, the English Parliament had deposed Charles I, the Protectorate had been tried under Cromwell, the Restoration had been brought about by the adroitness of Monk, James II, a Catholic, had come to the throne and had been driven off the throne by William III, William had established a new dynasty and a new system, which was no sooner established than it had to be succeeded by the introduction to the throne of one of the daughters of the displaced house of Stuart. England had not had time to become attached or even reconciled to any of these succeeding rulers, and the English people in general, the English people outside the circle of courts and parliament and politics, were well satisfied, when George came to the throne, to let anyone wear the crown who did not make himself and his system absolutely intolerable to the nation. The old-fashioned romantic principle of personal loyalty, unconditional loyalty, the loyalty of divine right, was already languishing unto death. It was now seen, for the last time, in effective contrast with what we may call the modern principle of loyalty. The modern principle of loyalty to a sovereign is that which, having decided in favor of monarchical government and of an hereditary succession, resolves to abide by that choice, and for the sake of the principle and of the country to pay all respect and homage to the person of the chosen ruler but the loyalty which still clung to the fading fortunes of the Stuarts 
was very different from this and came into direct contrast with the feeling shown by the majority of the people of England toward the House of Hanover. Though faults and weaknesses beyond number, weaknesses which were even worse than actual faults, tainted the character and corroded the moral fiber of every successive Stuart prince, the devotees of personal loyalty still clung with sentiment and with passion to the surviving representatives of the fallen dynasty. Poets and balladists, singers in the streets and singers on the mountainside, were even in these early days of George I inspired with songs of loyal homage in favor of the son of James II. Men and women in thousands, not only among the wild romantic hills of Scotland, but in prosaic north of England towns, and yet more prosaic London streets and alleys, were ready, if the occasion offered, to die for the Stuart cause. Despite the evidence of their own senses, men and women would still endow any representative of the Stuarts with all the virtues and talents and graces that might become an ideal prince of romance. No one thought in this way of the successors of William the Third. No one had had any particular admiration for Queen Anne, either as a sovereign or as a woman. Nobody pretended to feel any thrill of sentimental emotion towards portly, stolid, sensual George the First. About the king personally, hardly anybody cared anything. The mass of the English people who accepted him and adhered to him did so because they understood that he represented a certain quiet, homely principle in politics which would secure tranquility and stability to the country. They did not ask of him that he should be noble or gifted or dignified or even virtuous. They asked of him two things in especial. First, that he would maintain a steady system of government, and next, that he would in general let the country alone. This is the feeling which must be taken into account if we would understand how it came to pass that the English people so contentedly accepted a sovereign like George I. The explanation is not to be found merely in the fact that the Stuarts as a race had discredited themselves hopelessly with the moral sentiment of the people of England. The very worst of the Stuarts, Charles II, was not any worse as regards moral character than George I or than some of the Georges who followed him. In education and in mental capacity, he was far superior to any of the Georges. There were many qualities in Charles II which, if his fatal love of ease and of amusement could have been kept under control, might have made him a successful sovereign, and which were he in private life would undoubtedly have made him an eminent man. But the truth is, that the old feeling of blind, unconditional homage to the sovereign was dying out. It was dying of inanition and old age and natural decay. Other and stronger forces in political thought were coming up to jostle it aside, even before its death hour, and to occupy its place. A king was to be in England for the future, a respected and honored chief magistrate, appointed for life, and to hereditary office. This new condition of things influenced the feelings and conduct of hundreds of thousands of persons who were not themselves conscious of the change. This was one great reason why George I was so easily accepted by the country. The king was in future to be a business king and not a king of sentiment and romance. End of chapter 4 Recording by Pamela Nagami Section 5 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5. What the King Came to, Part 1. The population of these islands at the close of the reign of Queen Anne was probably not more than one-fifth of its present amount. It is not easy to arrive at a precise knowledge with regard to the number of the inhabitants of England at that time, because there was no census taken until 1801. We have, therefore, to be content with calculations founded on the number of houses that paid certain taxes and on the register of deaths. This is, of course, not a very exact way of getting at the result, but it enables us to form a tolerably fair general estimate. According to these calculations, then, the population of England and Wales together was something like five millions and a half. The population of Ireland at the same time appears to have been about two millions, that of Scotland little more than one. But the distribution of the population of these countries was very different then from that of the present day. Now, the great cities and towns form the numerical strength of England and Scotland at least, but at that time the agricultural districts had a much larger proportion of the population than the towns could boast of. London was then considered a vast and enormous city, but it was only a hamlet when compared with the London which we know. Even then it absorbed more than one-tenth of the whole population of England and Wales. At the beginning of the reign of King George I, London had a population of about 700,000, and it is a fact worthy of notice that rapidly as the population of England has grown between that time and this, the growth of the metropolis has been even greater in proportion. The city and Westminster were at the beginning of George's reign, and for long after, two distinct and separate towns, between them still lay many wide spaces on which men were only beginning to build houses. Fashion was already moving westward in the metropolis, obeying that curious impulse which seems to prevail in all modern cities and which makes the West End as eagerly sought after in Paris, in Edinburgh, and in New York as in London. The life of London centered in St. Paul's and the Exchange that of Westminster, in the court and the Houses of Parliament. All around the old Houses of Parliament were lanes, squares, streets, and gateways covering the wide spaces and broad thoroughfares with which we are familiar. Between Parliament buildings and the two churches of St. Peter and St. Margaret ran a narrow, densely crowded street known as St. Margaret's Lane. The spot where Parliament Street now opens into Bridge Street was part of an uninterrupted row of houses running down to the water gate by the river. The market house of the old woolen market stood just where Westminster Bridge begins. The Parliament houses themselves are as much changed as their surroundings. St. Stephen's Gallery now occupies the site of St. Stephen's Chapel, where the commons used to sit. Westminster Hall had rows of little shops or booths ranged all along each wall inside. They had been there for generations, and they certainly did not add either to the beauty or the safety of the ancient hall. In the early part of the 17th century, some of them took fire and came near to laying in ashes one of the oldest occupied buildings in the world. Luckily, however, the fire was put out with slight damage, but the dangerous little shops were suffered to remain then and for long after. The lesser London of that day lives for us in contemporary engravings, in the pages of the Spectator and the Tatler, in the poems of Swift and Pope, in the pictures of Hogarth. Hogarth's men and women belong indeed to a later generation than the generation which Bolingbroke dazzled and Marlborough deceived, and Arbuthnot satirized, and Steele made merry over. But it is only the men and women who are different. The background remains the same. New actors have taken the parts, the costumes are somewhat altered, but the scenes are scarcely changed. There may be a steeple more or a sign board less in the streets that Hogarth drew, 
than there were when Addison walked them, but practically they are the same and remained the same for a still later generation. Maps of the time show us how curiously small London was. There is open country to the north just beyond Bloomsbury Square. Sadler's Wells is out in the country, so is St. Pancras, so is Tottenham Court, so is Marlebun. At the east, Stepney lies far away a distant hamlet. Beyond Hanover Square, to the west, stretch fields again, where Tyburn Road became the road to Oxford. There is very little of London south of the river. The best part of the political and social life of this small London was practically lived in the still smaller area of St. James's, a term which generally includes rather more than is contained within the strict limits of St. James's parish. If some Jacobite gentleman or loyal Hanoverian courtier of the year 1714 could revisit today the scenes in which he schemed and quarreled, he would find himself among the familiar names of strangely unfamiliar places. St. James's Park, indeed, has not altered out of all recognition since the days when Duke Belair and my Lady Betty and my Lady Rattle walked the mall between the hours of twelve and two, and quoted from Congreve about laughing at the great world and the small. There were avenues of trees then as now. Instead of the ornamental water ran a long canal, populous with ducks, which joined a pond called, no one knows why, Rosamond's Pond. This pond was a favorite trysting place for happy lovers, the sylvan deities and rural powers of the place sacred and inviolable to love, often heard lovers' vows repeated by its streams and echoes, and a convenient water for unhappy lovers to drown themselves in, if we may credit the tattler. St. James's Palace and Marlborough House on its right are scarcely changed, but to the left only Lord Godolphin's house lay between it and the pleasant park where the deer wandered. Farther off, where Buckingham Palace now is, was Buckingham House. It was then a stately country mansion on the road to Chelsea, with semicircular wings and a sweep of iron railings enclosing a spacious court where a fountain played round a triton driving his seahorses. On the roof stood statues of Mercury, Liberty, Secrecy, and Equity, and across the front ran an inscription in great gold letters, Sic city laetantur lares. The household gods might well delight in so fair a spot, and in the music of that little wilderness full of blackbirds and nightingales, which the bowl playing duke who built the house lovingly describes to his friend Shrewsbury. Most of the streets in the St. James's region bear the names they bore when King George first came to London, but it is only in name that they are unchanged. The street of streets, St. James's Street, is metamorphosed indeed since the days when grotesque signs swung overhead and great gilt carriages lumbered up and down from the park and the chairs of modish ladies crowded up the narrow thoroughfares. Splendid warriors, fresh from Flanders or the Rhine, clinked their courtly swords against the posts, red-coated country gentlemen jostled their wandering way through the crowd, and the wig and tory bow, with ruffles and rapiers, powder and perfume, haunted the coffee-houses of their factions. Not a house of the old street remains as it was then, not one of the panelled rooms in which minuets were danced by candlelight to the jingle of harpsichord and tinkle of spinet, where wits planned pamphlets and pointed epigrams, where statesmen schemed the overthrow of ministries and even of dynasties, where flushed youth punted away its fortunes or drank away its senses and staggered out, perhaps, through the little crowd of chairmen and link boys clustered at the door to extinguish its foolish flame in a duel at Leicester Fields. All that world is gone. Only the name of the street remains, as full in its way of memories and associations as the SPQR at the head of a municipal proclamation in modern Rome. The streets off St. James's Street, too, retain their ancient names and nothing more. King Street, 
Ryder Street, York Street, Sherman Street, the spelling of which seems to have puzzled last century writers greatly, for they wrote it J-E-R-M-Y-N, G-E-R-M-I-N, G-E-R-M-A-I-N-E, and even G-E-R-M-I-N. St. James's Church, Wren's handiwork, is all that remains from the age of Anne, with the steeple, says Stripe fondly, lately finished with a fine spire, which adds much splendor to this end of the town and also serves as a landmark. Perhaps it sometimes served as a landmark to Richard Steele, reeling happily to the home in Berry Street where his beloved Prue awaited him. St. James's Square has gone through many metamorphoses since it was first built in 1665 and called the Piazza. In 1714, there was a rectangular enclosure in the center with four passages at the sides through which the public could come and go as they pleased. In a later generation, the inhabitants railed the enclosure round and set in the middle an oval basin of water large enough to have a boat upon it. In old engravings, we see people gravely punting about on the quaint little pond. The fullness of time filled in the pond and set up King William the Third instead in the middle of a grassy circle. It would take too long to enumerate all the changes that our Georgian gentleman would find in the London of his day. Some few, however, are especially worth recording. He would seek in vain for the Piccadilly he knew, with its stately houses and fair gardens. It was almost a country road to the left of St. James's Street, between the Green Park and Hyde Park, with meadows and the distant hills beyond. Going eastward, he would find that a Henrietta Street and a King Street still led into Covent Garden, but the Covent Garden of his time was an open place, with a column and a sundial in the middle. Handsome dwellings for persons of repute and quality stood on the north side over those arcades which were fondly supposed by Inigo Jones, who laid out the spot, to resemble the piazza in Venice. Inigo Jones built the church, too, which is to be seen in the morning plate of Hogarth's Four Times of the Day. This church was destroyed by fire in 1795 and was rebuilt in its present form by Hardwick. Charing Cross was still a narrow spot where three streets met. What is now Trafalgar Square was covered with houses and the Royal Mews. St. Martin's Church was not built by Gibbs for a dozen years later in 1726. Soho and Seven Dials were fashionable neighborhoods. Mrs. Teresa Cornley's House of Entertainment, of which we hear so much from the writers of the time of Anne, was considered to be most fashionably situated. Ambassadors and peers dwelt in Gerard Street. Bolingbroke lived in Golden Square. Traces of former splendor still linger about these decayed neighborhoods. Paintings by Sir James Thornhill, Hogarth's master and father-in-law, and elaborate marble mantelpieces with Corinthian columns and entablatures still adorn the interiors of some of these houses. Bits of quaint Queen Anne architecture and finely wrought iron railings still lend an air of faded gentility to some of the dingy exteriors. Parts of London that are now fashionable had not then come into existence. Grosvenor Square was only begun in 1716, and it was not until 1725 that the new quarter was sufficiently advanced for its creator, Sir Richard Grosvenor, to summon his intending tenants to a splendid entertainment at which the new streets and squares were solemnly named. Though we of today have seen a good deal of what are called Anne and Georgian houses of red brick, curiously gabled, springing up in all directions, we must not suppose that the London of 1714 was chiefly composed of such cheerful buildings. Wren and Vanborough would be indeed surprised if they could see the strange works that are now done, if not in their name, at least in the name of the age for which they built their heavy, plain, solid houses. We can learn easily enough from contemporary engravings what the principal London streets and squares were like, 
when George the Elector became George the King. There are not many remains now of Anne's London, but Queen Anne's Gate, some few houses in Queen Square, Bloomsbury, and here and there a house in the city, preserve the ordinary architecture of the age of Anne. Marlborough House bears witness to what it did in the way of more pretentious buildings. The insides of these houses were scarcely less like the Queen Anne revival of our time than the outsides. The rooms were, as a rule, sparingly furnished. There would be a center table, some chairs, a settee, a few pictures, a mirror, possibly a spinet or musical instrument of some kind, some shelves perhaps for displaying the Chinese and Japanese porcelain, which everyone loved, and of course heavy window curtains. Smaller tables were used for the incessant tea drinking. Large screens kept off the too frequent draughts. Handsomely wrought stoves and andirons stood in the wide fireplaces. The rooms themselves were lofty. The walls of the better kind wainscoted and carved, and the ceilings painted in allegorical designs. Wallpapers had only begun to come into use within the last few years of Anne's reign. Windows were long and narrow, and small panes were a necessity, as glassmakers had not yet attained the art of casting large sheets of glass. The stairs were exceedingly straight. It was mentioned as a recommendation to new houses that two persons could go upstairs abreast. The rents would seem curiously low to Londoners of our time. Houses could be got in Pall Mall for two hundred a year, and in good parts of the town for thirty, forty, and fifty pounds a year. Lady Wentworth, in 1705, describes a house in Golden Square with garden, stables, and coach house, the rent of which was only three score pounds a year. Pretty riverside homes let at from five to ten pounds a year. Lodgings would seem cheap now, though they were not held so then, for Swift complains of paying eight shillings a week when he lodged in Bury Street for a dining room and bedroom on the first floor. There was no general numbering of houses in 1714. That movement of civilization did not take place until 1764. Places were known by their signs or their vicinity to a sign. Blue boars, black swans, and the red lions were in every street, and people lived at the red bodice, or over against the pestle. The tattler tells the story of a young man seeking a house in Barbican for a whole day through a mistake in a sign whose legend read, This is the beer, instead of This is the bear. Another tried to get into a house at Stocks Market under the impression that he was at his own lodgings at Charing Cross, being misled by the fact that there was a statue of the king on horseback in each place. Signs were usually very large, and jutted so far out from the houses that in narrow streets they frequently touched one another. As it was the fashion to have them carefully painted, carved, gilded, and supported by branches of wrought iron, they were often very costly, some being estimated as worth more than a hundred guineas. The ill-paved streets were too often littered with the refuse which careless householders, reckless of fines, flung into the open way. In wet weather the rain roared along the kennel, converting all the accumulated filth of the thoroughfare into loathsome mud. The gutter spouts, which then projected from every house, did not always cast their cataracts clear of the pavement, but sometimes soaked the unlucky passer-by who had not kept close to the wall. Umbrellas were the exclusive privilege of women. Men never thought of carrying them. Those whose business or pleasure called them abroad in rainy weather, and who did not own carriages, might hire one of the eight hundred two-horsed hackney coaches, jolting, uncomfortable machines with perforated tin sashes instead of window glasses, and grumbling, ever dissatisfied drivers. There were very few sedan chairs, these were still a comparative novelty for general use, and their bearers were much abused for their drunkenness, clumsiness, and incivility. The streets were always crowded. Coaches, chairs, wheelbarrows, fops, chimney sweeps, 
porters bearing huge burdens, bullies swaggering with great swords, bailiffs chasing some impecunious poet, cut purses, funerals, christenings, weddings, and street fights would seem from some contemporary accounts to be invariably mixed up together in helpless and apparently inextricable confusion. The general bewilderment was made more bewildering by the very babble of street cries bawled from the sturdy lungs of orange girls, chair menders, broom sellers, ballad singers, old clothes men, and wretched representatives of the various jails, raising their plaintive appeal to remember the poor prisoners. The thoroughfares, however, would have been in still worse condition, but for the fact that so much of the passenger traffic of the metropolis was done by water and not by land. The wherries on the Thames were as frequent as the gondolas on the canals of Venice. Across the river, down the river, up the river, passengers hurried incessantly in the swift little boats that plied for hire, and were rowed by one man with a pair of skulls or two men with oars. Despite the numbers of the river steamers at present, and the crowds who take advantage of them, it may well be doubted whether so large a proportion of the passenger traffic of London is borne by the river in the days of Queen Victoria as there was in the days of Queen Anne. Darkness and danger ruled the roads at night with all the horrors of the Rome of Juvenal. Oil lamps flickered freely in some of the better streets, but even these were not lit so long as any suggestion of twilight served for an excuse to delay the illumination. When the moon shone, they were not lit at all. Link boys drove a busy trade in lighting belated wanderers to their homes and saving them from the perils of places where the pavement was taken up or where open sewers yawned. Precaution was needful, for pitfalls of the kind were not always marked by warning lanterns. Footpads roamed about, and worse than footpads. The fear of the Mohawks had not yet faded from civic memories, and there were still wild young men enough to rush through the streets, wrenching off knockers, insulting quiet people, and defying the watch. Indeed, the watch were as a rule as unwilling to interfere with dangerous revelers as were the billmen of Messina, and seemed to have been little better than thieves or Mohawks themselves. They were freely accused of being ever ready to levy blackmail upon those who walked abroad at night by raising ingenious accusations of insobriety and insisting upon being bought off or conveying their victim to the roundhouse. The fleet ditch, which is almost as much of a myth in our generation as the stream of black Cossetus itself, was an unsavory reality still in the London which George I entered. It was a tributary of the Thames, which, rising somewhere among the gentle hills of Hampstead, sought out the river and found it at Blackfriars. At one time, it was used for the conveyance of coals into the city, and colliers of moderate size used to ascend it for a short distance. But toward the end of Anne's reign, and indeed for long before, it had become a mere trickling puddle, discharging its filth and refuse and sewage into the river and poisoning the air around it. Mayfair was still, and for many years later, celebrated in the now fashionable quarter, which bears its name. The fair lasted for six weeks and left about six months' demoralization behind it. Smock races, that is to say races run by young women for a prize of a laced chemise, the competitors sometimes being attired only in their smocks, were still to be seen in Pall Mall and various other places. This popular amusement was kept up in London until 1733 and lingered in country places to a much later time. Bartholomew Fair was scarcely less popular or less renowned for its specialty of roast-sucking pig than in the days when Ben Jonson's master little wit and his wife, win the fight, made acquaintance with its wild humors. There is a colored print of about this time which gives a sufficiently vivid presentment of the fair. 
At Lee and Harper's booth the tragedy of Judith and Holofernes is announced by a great glaring painted cloth, while the platform is occupied by a gentleman in Roman armor and a lady in Eastern attire, who are, no doubt, the principal characters of the play. A gaudy harlequin and his brother Scaramouche invite the attention of the passers-by. In another booth, rope-dancing of men and women is offered to the less tragically minded, and in yet another the world-renowned Fox displays the announcement of his conjuring marvels. A peep-show of the siege of Gibraltar allures the patriotic. Toy shops presided over by attractive damsels lure the light-hearted and the light-fingered too, for many an intelligent pickpocket seizes the opportunity to rifle the pocket of some too occupied customer. There is a revolving swing, and go-carts are drawn by dogs for the delight of children. Hucksters go about selling gin, aniseed, and fruits, and large booths offer meat, cider, punch, and skittles. The place is thronged with visitors and beggars. A portly figure in a scarlet coat and wearing an order is said to be no less a person than Sir Robert Walpole, who is rumored to have occasionally honored the fair with his presence. Few of the clubs that play so important a part in the history of last century London had come into existence in 1714. The most famous of them either were not yet founded or lived only as coffee or chocolate houses. There had been literary associations like the Sclibleris Club, which was started by Swift and was finally dissolved by the quarrels of Oxford and Bolingbroke. The Saturday and Brothers Clubs had been political societies, at both of which Swift was all-powerful, but they too were no more. The Kit Kat Club, of mystic origin and enigmatic name, with all its loyalty to Hanover and all its memories of bright toasts of steel, Addison and Godfrey Neller, had passed away in 1709, and met no more in Shire Lane off Fleet Street or at the Upper Flask Inn at Hampstead. It had not lived in vain, according to Walpole, who declared that its patriots had saved the country. Within its rooms, the evil omen Lord Mohun had broken the gilded emblem of the crown off his chair. Jacob Tonson, the bookseller, who was secretary to the club, querulously insisted that the man who would do that would cut a man's throat, and Lord Mohun's fatal career fully justified Tonson's judgment. If the Kit Kat Patriots had saved the country, the Tory Patriots of the October Club were no less prepared to do the same. The October Club came first into importance in the latest years of Anne, although it had existed since the last decade of the 17th century. The stout Tory squires met together in the Bell Tavern in narrow, dirty King Street, Westminster, to drink October ale under Dahl's portrait of Queen Anne, and to trouble with their fierce, uncompromising Jacobitism, the fluctuating purposes of Harley and the crafty counsels of St. John. The genius of Swift tempered their hot zeal with the cool air of his advice. Then the wilder spirits seceded and formed the March Club, which retained all the angry Jacobitism of the parent body but lost all its importance. There were wilder associations like the Hellfire Club, which under the presidency of the Duke of Wharton was distinguished for the desperate attempts it made to justify its name. But it was, like its president, short-lived and soon forgotten. There are fantastic rumors of a Cavs Head Club, organized in mockery of all kings and especially of the royal martyrs. It was said by obscure pamphleteers to be founded by John Milton, but whether the body ever had any real existence seems now to be uncertain. Next to the clubs came the mug houses. The mug houses were political associations of a humbler order, where men met together to drink beer and denounce the Whigs or Tories according to their convictions. But at this time, the coffee houses occupied the most important position in social life. There were a great many of them, each with some special association, which still keeps it in men's memories. 
at Garraway's in Change Alley, tea was first retailed at the high prices which then made tea a luxury. The Rainbow in Fleet Street, the second coffee house opened in London, is mentioned in The Spectator. The first was Bowman's in St. Michael's Alley, Cornhill. Lloyd's in Lombard Street was dear to Steele and Addison. At Don Saltero's by the river at Chelsea, Mr. Salter exhibited his collection of curiosities and delighted himself and no one else by playing the fiddle. At the Smyrna, Pryor and Swift were wont to receive their acquaintances. From the St. James's, the last house but one on the southwest corner of St. James's Street, the Tatler dated its foreign and domestic news and conferred fame on its waiter, Mr. Kidney, who has long conversed with and filled tea for the most consummate politicians. It was the headquarters of Whigs and officers of the guards. Letters from Stella were left here for Swift, and here in later years originated Goldsmith's retaliation. Wills, at the north corner of Russell Street and Bow Street, famous for its memories of Dryden and for the Tatler's dramatic criticisms, had ceased to exist in 1714. Its place was taken by Buttons, at the other side of Russell Street, started by Addison in 1712. Here, later, was the Lion Head letter box for The Guardian, designed by Hogarth. At Child's, in St. Paul's Churchyard, the spectator often smoked a pipe. Sir Roger de Coverley was beloved at Squires near Gray's Inn Gate. Slaughter's in St. Martin's Lane was often honored by the presence first of Dryden and then of Pope. Searle's near Lincoln's Inn was cherished by the law. At the Gresham in Devereux Court, Strand, learned men met and quarreled. A fatal duel was once fought in consequence of an argument there over the accent on a Greek word. At the Gresham, too, Steele amused himself by putting the action of Homer's Iliad into an exact journal and planning his temple of fame. From White's Chocolate House, which afterwards became the famous club, came Mr. Isaac Bickerstaff's accounts of gallantry, pleasure, and entertainment. The Cocoa Tree was the Tory Coffee House in St. James's Street. Ozinda's Chocolate House, next to St. James's Palace, was also a Tory resort, and its owner was arrested in 1715 for supposed complicity in Jacobite conspiracy. To these coffee and chocolate houses came all the wit and all the fashion of London. Men of letters and statesmen, men of the robe and men of the sword, lawyers, dandies, poets, and philosophers met there to discuss politics, literature, scandal, and the play. There were often very strange figures among the motley crowd behind the red-curtained windows of a St. James's coffee house. The gentleman who made himself so agreeable to the barmaid, or who chatted so affably about the conduct of the Allies or the latest news from Sweden, might meet you again later on, if your road lay at all outside town, an imperious request you to stand and deliver. But of all the varied assembly, the strangest figures must have been the bow and exquisites, in all their various degrees of dappers, fops, smart fellows, pretty fellows, and very pretty fellows. They made a brave show in many-colored splendor of attire, heavily scented with orange flower water, civet violet or musk, with large falbalal periwigs, or long powdered duvilliers, with snuff-boxes and dragon or right jamery canes, curiously clouded and amber-headed, dangling by a blue ribbon from the wrist or the coat-button. The staff was as essential to an early Georgian gentleman as to an Athenian of the age of Pericles, and the cane-carrying custom incurred the frequent attacks of the satirists. Cane-bearers were made to declare that the knocking of the cane upon the shoe, leaning one leg upon it, or whistling with it in the mouth, were such reliefs to them in conversation that they did not know how to be good company without it. Some of these young men appear to have affected effeminacy, like an Agathon or a Henri Trois. Steele has put it on record that he heard some 
who set up to be pretty fellows calling to one another at White's or the St. James's by the names of Betty, Nellie, and so forth. Servants play almost as important parts as their masters in the humors of the time. Rich people were always surrounded by a throng of servants. First came the valet de chambre, who was expected to know a little of everything, from shaving and wig-making to skill in country sports, and had as much experience in all town matters as a servant out of Terence or Moliere. Last came the negro slave, who waited on my lord or my lady, with the silver collar of servitude about his neck. End of chapter 5, part 1. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Section 6 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. Chapter 5, What the King Came to, Part 2. Servants wore fine clothes and aped fine manners. The footmen of the lords and commons held mimic parliament while waiting for their masters at Westminster, parodying with elaborate care the proceedings of both houses. They imitated their masters in other ways, too, taking their titles after the fashion made famous by Jules Blas and his fellow valets, and familiar by the farce of High Life Below Stairs. The writer of The Patriot of Thursday, August 19, 1714, satirizes misplaced ambition by, quote, a discourse which I overheard not many evenings ago as I went with a friend of mine into Hyde Park. We found, as usual, a great number of gentlemen servants at the park gate, in my friend, being unacquainted with the saucy custom of those fellows to usurp their master's titles, was very much surprised to hear a lusty rogue tell one of his companions who inquired after his fellow servant that his grace had his head broke by the cookmaid for making a sop in the pan. Presently, after another assured the company of the illness of my lord bishop, the information had doubtless continued, had not a fellow in a blue livery alarmed the rest with the news that Sir Edward and the Marquis were at fisticuffs about a game at Chuck, and that the brigadier had challenged the Major General to a bout at cudgels." It is only fair, after enumerating so many of the eccentricities and discomforts of early Georgian London, to mention one proof of civilization of which Londoners were then able to boast. London had a penny post, of which it was not unreasonably proud. This penny post is thus described in Stripe's edition of Stowe's Survey of London, quote, For a further convenience to the inhabitants of this city and parts adjacent for about ten miles compass, another post and that of foot post, commonly called the penny post, was erected, and though at first set up by a private hand, yet being of such considerable amount is since taken into the post office and made a branch of it. And in this, all letters and parcels not exceeding a pound weight, and also any sum of money not above ten pounds, or parcel of ten pound value, is safely conveyed, and at the charge of a penny, to all parts of the city and suburbs, and but a penny more at the delivery to most towns within ten miles of London, and to some towns at a farther distance and for the better management of this office there are in London and Westminster six general post offices, at all which there constantly attend officers to receive letters and parcels from the several places appointed to take them in, there being a place or receiving house for the receipt thereof in most streets, and a table hung at the door or shop window in which is printed in great letters, penny post letters and parcels are taken in here and at those houses they have letter-carriers to call every hour, all the day long they are employed, some in going their walks to bring in, and others to carry out." End quote. The next town in population to London was Bristol, and Bristol had then only one-seventeenth of London's population. The growth of the manufacturing industry, which has created such a cluster of great towns in the north of England, had hardly begun to show itself 
when George I came to the throne. Bristol was not only the most populous place after London at this time, but it was the great English seaport. It had held this rank for centuries. Even at the time when Tom Jones was written, many years after the accession of George I, the Bristol alderman filled the same place in popular imagination that is now assigned to the aldermen of London. Fielding attributes to the Bristol alderman that fine appreciation of the qualities of turtle soup with which more modern humorists have endowed his metropolitan fellow. Liverpool was hardly thought of in the early Georgian days. It was only made into a separate parish a few years before George came to the throne, and its first dock was opened in 1709. Manchester was comparatively obscure and unimportant, and had not yet made its first export of cotton goods. At this time, Norwich, famous for its worsted and woolen works and its fuller's earth, surpassed it in business importance. By the middle of the century, the population of Bristol is said to have exceeded 90,000, Norwich to have had more than 56,000, Manchester about 45,000, Newcastle 40,000, and Birmingham about 30,000, while Liverpool had swelled to about 30,000 and ranked as the third port in the country. York was the chief city of the northern counties, Exeter the capital of the west. Shrewsbury was of some account in the region toward the Welsh frontier. Worcester, Derby, Nottingham, and Canterbury were places of note. Bath had not come into its fashion and its fame as yet. Its first pump room had been built only a few years before George entered England. The strength of England now, if we leave London out of consideration, lies in the north and goes no further southward than a line which would include Birmingham. In the early days of the Georges, this was just the part of England which was of least importance, whether as regards manufacturing energy or political power. Ireland just then was quiet. It had sunk into a quietude something like that of the grave. Civil war had swept over the country. A succession of civil wars indeed had plagued it. There was a time just before the outbreak of the parliamentary struggle against Charles I when, according to Clarendon, Ireland was becoming a highly prosperous country, growing vigorously in trade, manufacture, letters, and arts, and beginning to be, as he puts it, a jewel of great luster in the royal diadem. But civil war and religious persecution had blighted this rising prosperity, and for the evils coming from political proscription and religious persecution, the statesmen of the time could think of no remedy but new prescription and fresh persecution. Roman Catholics were excluded from the legislature, from municipal corporations, and from the liberal professions. They were not allowed to teach or to be taught by Catholics. They were not permitted to keep arms. The trade and navigation of Ireland was put under ruinous restrictions and disabilities. In the reign of Anne, new acts had been passed by the Irish Parliament and sanctioned by the Crown, quote, to prevent the further growth of popery. End quote. Some of these later measures introduced not a few of the very harshest conditions of the penal code against Catholics. The Irish Parliament at that time was merely, in fact, what has since been called the British garrison. It consisted of the conquerors and the settlers. The Irish people had no more to do with it except in the way of suffering under it, than the slaves in Georgia thirty years ago had to do with the Congress at Washington. Dublin has perhaps changed less than London since 1714, but it has changed greatly notwithstanding. The Irish Parliament was already established in College Green, but not in the familiar building which it afterwards occupied. 
it met in Chichester House, which had been built as a hospital by Sir George Carew at the close of the 16th century. From him it passed into the possession of Sir Arthur Chichester, an English soldier of fortune, who had distinguished himself in France under Henry the Fourth, and who afterwards came to Ireland and played an active part in the plantation of Ulster. It was not until 1728 that Chichester House was pulled down and the new building erected upon its site. Trinity College, of course, stood on College Green, so did two other stately dwellings, Charlemont House and Clan Carty House, both of which have long since passed away. There were several bookshops on the green as well, and a great many taverns and coffee shops. The statue of King William III had been set up in 1701. The collegians professed great indignation at the manner in which the statue turned its back to the college gates, and the effigy was the object of many indignities for which the students sometimes got into grave trouble with the authorities. St. Patrick's Well was one of the great features of Dublin in the early part of the last century. It stood in the narrow way by Trinity College, the name of which had not long been altered from Patrick's Well Lane to Nassau Street. The change had been made in compliment to a bust of William the Third, which adorned the front of one of the houses, but for long after the place was much more associated with the well than with the House of Orange. The waters of the well were popularly supposed to have wonderful curative and health-giving properties, and it was much used. It dried up suddenly in 1729 and gave Swift the opportunity of writing some fiercely indignant national verses, but the water was restored to it in 1731, and it still exists in peaceful, half-forgotten obscurity in the college grounds. Dawson Street, off Nassau Street, had only newly come into existence. It was called after Joshua Dawson, who had just built for himself a handsome mansion with gardens round it. He sold the house in 1715 to the Dublin Corporation to be used as a mansion house for the Lord Mayors. Where Molesworth and Kildare Streets now stand, there was at this time a great piece of wasteland called Molesworth's Fields. Chapel Lazad, now a sufficiently populous suburb, was then the little village of Chapel Izud, said to be so called from that Belle Izud, daughter of King Anguish of Ireland, who was beloved by Tristram. The general post office in Sycamore Alley had for postmaster general Isaac Manley, who was a friend of Swift's. Manley incurred the dean's resentment in 1718 by opening letters addressed to him. The postal arrangements were, as may be imagined, miserably defective. Owing to the carelessness of postmasters, the idleness of postboys, bad horses, and sometimes the want of horses, much time was lost and letters constantly miscarried. The amusements of Dublin were those of London on a small scale. Dublin was as fond of its coffee-houses as London itself. Lucas's in Cork Street was the favorite resort of beaux, gamesters, and bullies. Here Talbot Edgeworth, Miss Edgeworth's ancestor, whom Swift called the Prince of Puppies, displayed his follies, his fine dresses, and his handsome face, and believed himself to be the terror of men and the adoration of women, till he died mad in the Dublin Bridewell. The yard behind Lucas's was the theatre of numerous duels, which were generally witnessed from the windows by all the company who happened to be present. These took care that the laws of honourable combat were observed. Close at hand was the Swan Tavern in Swan Alley, a district devoted chiefly to gambling houses. On Cork Hill was the Cockpit Royal, where gentlemen and ruffians mingled together to witness and wager on the sport. Cork Hill was not a pleasant place at night. Pedestrians were often insulted and roughly treated by the chairman hanging about Lucas's and the Eagle Tavern. Even the waiters of these establishments sometimes amused themselves 
by pouring pailfuls of foul water upon the aggrieved passer-by. It is not surprising, therefore, to find that an Irish edition of the Hellfire Club was set up at the Eagle in 1735. The roughness of the time found its way into the theatre in Smock Lane, which was the scene of frequent political riots. Dublin had its Pasquin or Marforio in an oaken image known as the Wooden Man, which had stood on the southern side of Essex Street, not far from Eustace Street, since the end of the 17th century. Cork, Limerick, Waterford, and Belfast were the only considerable towns in Ireland after the Irish capital. Not many years had passed since Cork was besieged by Marlborough himself and taken from King James. The Duke of Grafton, one of the sons of Charles the Second, was killed then in a little street or lane, which still commemorates the fact by its name. The same year that saw Marlborough besieging Cork saw Limerick invested by the forces of King William under William's own command. The Irish general Sarsfield held out so gallantly that William had to give up the attempt, and it was not until the following year, and after the cause of James had gone down everywhere else, that Sarsfield consented to accept the terms most honorable to him of the famous Treaty of Limerick. There was but little feeling in Ireland in favor of the Chevalier at the time of Queen Anne's death. Any sympathy with the Stuart cause that still lingered was sentimental merely, and even as such hardly existed among the great mass of the people. To these, indeed, the change of masters could matter but little. They had had enough of the Stuarts, and the conduct of James the Second during his Irish campaign had made his name and his memory despised. Rightly or wrongly, he was charged with cowardice. He, who in his early days had heard his bravery in action praised by the great Turenne, and the charge was fatal to him in the minds of the Irish people. The penal laws of Anne's days were not excused because of any strong Jacobite sympathies or active Jacobite schemes in Ireland. The union between England and Scotland was only seven years old when George came to the throne of these kingdoms, and already an attempt had been made by a powerful party in Scotland to obtain its repeal. The union was unquestionably accomplished by Lord Somers and other English statesmen with the object of securing the succession much rather than the national interests of the Scottish people. It was for a long time detested in Scotland. The manner of its accomplishment, mainly by bribery and threats, made it more odious. Yet it was based on principles which secured the dearest interests of Scotland and respected the religious opinions of the population. Scottish law, Scottish systems, and the Scotch church were left without interference, and constitutional security was given for the maintenance of the Presbyterian establishment. In plain words, the Union admitted and maintained the rights and the claims of the great majority of the Scotch people, and therefore, when the first heat of dislike to it had gone out, Scotland began to find that she could be old Scotland still, even when combined in one constitutional system with England. She soon accepted cordially the conditions which opened new ways to her industrial and trading energy and did not practically interfere with her true national independence. Edinburgh was then and remained for generations to come much the same as it appeared when Mary Stuart first visited it. Historians like Brantome and poets like Ronsard lamented for their fair princess exiled in a savage land. But the daughter of the House of Lorraine might well have been content with the curious beauty of her new capital. Even now, more than three centuries since Mary Stuart landed in Scotland, and more than a century and a half since her descendant raised the standard of rebellion against the elector of Hanover, Edinburgh Old Town retains more of its antique characteristics than either of the capitals of the sister kingdoms. It is true that 
that the northern Athens has followed the example of its Greek original in shifting the scene of its social life. The Attic Athens of today occupies a different site from that of the city of Pericles. New Edinburgh has reared itself on the other bank of that chasm where once the North River flowed and where now the trains run. Edinburgh, however, more fortunate than the city of Xicrops, while founding a new town, has not lost the old. But at the time of the Hanoverian accession, and for generations later, not a house of the new town had been built. Edinburgh was still a walled city, with many gates or ports occupying the same ground that she had covered in the reign of James the Third along the ridge between the grey castle on the height at the west and haunted Holyrood in the plain at the east. All along this ridge rose the huge buildings, lands as they were called, stretching from peak to peak like a mountain range, five, six, sometimes ten stories high, pierced with innumerable windows, crowned with jagged fantastic roofs and gables, and as crowded with life as the insulae of imperial Rome. Over all rose the graceful pinnacle of St. Giles' Church, around whose base the booths of goldsmiths and other craftsmen clustered. The great main street of this old town was and is the Cannon Gate, with its hundred or so of narrow closes or winds running off from it at right angles. The houses in these closes were as tall as the rest, though the space across the street was often not more than four or five feet wide. The Cannon Gate was Edinburgh in the early days of the last century, far more than St. James's Street was London. Its high houses with their wooden panelings, with the old armorial devices on their doors, and their common stair climbing from story to story outside have seen the whole panorama of Scottish history pass by. Life cannot have been very comfortable in Edinburgh. There were no open spaces or squares in the royalty, with the exception of the Parliament Close. The houses were so well and strongly built that the city was seldom troubled by fire, but they were poor inside, with low dark rooms. We find in consequence that houses inhabited by the gentry in the early part of the 18th century were considered almost too bad for very humble folk at its close, and the success of the new town was assured from the day when its first foundation stone was laid. But if not very comfortable, life was quiet and simple. People generally dined at one or two o'clock at Edinburgh, when George I was king. Shopkeepers closed their shops when they dined and opened them again for business when the meal was over. There was very little luxury. Wine was seldom seen on the tables of the middle classes, and few people kept carriages. There were not many amusements. Friends met at each other's houses to take tea at five o'clock and perhaps to listen to a little music. For the Edinburghers were fond of music, and an annual concert which was established early in the century lingered on till within three years of its close. But this simplicity was not immortal, and we hear sad complaints as the century grows old concerning the decadence of manners made manifest in the luxurious practice of dining as late as four or five, the freer use of wine, and other signs of over-civilization. Glasgow, in the Clyde Valley, ranked next to Edinburgh in importance among Scotch towns. More than twenty years later than the time of which we treat, the author of a pamphlet called Memoirs of the Times could write, Glasgow is become the third trading city in the island. But in 1714, the future of its commercial prosperity, founded upon its trade with the West Indies and the American colonies, had scarcely dawned. The Scotch merchants had not yet been able, from want of capital, and it was said the jealousy of the English merchants, to make much use of the privileges conferred upon them by the Union, and Glasgow was on the wrong side of the island for sharing in Scotland's slight continental trade. Still, 
Glasgow was fairly thriving, thanks to the inland navigation of the Clyde. Some of its streets were broad, many of its houses substantial and even stately. Its pride was the great minster of St. Mungo's, a solid wheel jointed mason work that will stand as lang as the world keep hands and gum puller aff it. To quote the enthusiastic words of Andrew Fairservice, the streets were often thronged with the wild highlanders from the hills who came down as heavily and as variously armed as a modern Albanian chieftain to trade in small cattle and shaggy ponies. At this time, the average Englishman knew little about the lowlands and nothing about the highlands of Scotland. The Londoner of the age of Anne would have looked upon any traveller who had made his way through the highlands of Scotland with much the same curiosity as his descendants a generation or two later regarded Bruce when he returned from Abyssinia, and would probably have received most of his statements with a politer but not less profound disbelief. It was cited as a proof of the immense popularity of the spectator that despite all the difficulties of intercommunication it found its way into Scotland. George I had passed away, and George II was reigning in his stead before any Englishman was found foolhardy enough to explore the Scottish highlands, and lucky enough to escape unhurt and publish an account of his experiences and put on record his disgust at the monstrous deformity of the highland scenery. But the Londoner in 1714 was scarcely better informed about the Scotch lowlands, what he could learn was not of a nature to impress him very profoundly. Scotland then, and for some time to come, was very far behind England in many things, most of all in everything connected with agriculture. In the villages the people dwelt in rude but fairly comfortable cottages, made chiefly of straw-mixed clay and straw-thatched, wearing clothes that were usually homespun, home-woven, and home-tailored, Living principally, if not entirely, on the produce of his own farm, the lowland farmer passed a life of curious independence and isolation. To plough his land with its strange measurements of oxgate, ploughgate, and dawach, he had clumsy wooden ploughs, the very shape of which is now almost a tradition, but which were certainly at least as primitive in construction as the plough Ulysses guided in his farm at Ithaca. Wheeled vehicles of any kind, carts or wheelbarrows, were rarities. A parish possessed of a couple of carts was considered well provided for. Even where carts were known, they were of little use. They were so wretchedly constructed, and the few roads that did exist were totally unfit for wheeled traffic. Roads were as rare in Scotland then as they are today in the Peloponnesus. An enterprising Aberdeenshire gentleman, Sir Archibald Grant of Moneymusk, is deservedly distinguished for the interest he took in road-making about the time of the Hanoverian accession. Some years later, statute labor did a little, a very little, toward improving the public roads, but it was not until after the rebellion of 1745, when the government took the matter in hand, that anything really efficient was done. A number of good roads then were made, chiefly by military labor, and received in popular language the special title of the King's Highways. But in the early part of the century there was little use for carts, even of the clumsiest kind. Such carriage as was necessary was accomplished by strings of horses tethered in Indian file, like the lines of camels in the east, and laden with sacks or baskets. The cultivation of the soil was poor, quote, the surface was generally unenclosed, oats and barley, the chief grain products, wheat little cultivated, little hay made for winter, the horses then feeding chiefly on straw and oats, the arable land ran in narrow slips, with stony wastes between like the moraines of a glacier, end quote. The hay meadow was an undrained marsh, where rank grasses mingled with rushes and other aquatic plants yielded a coarse fodder. About the time when George I became King of England, Lord Haddington introduced the sowing of clover and other grass seeds. Some ten years earlier, 
an Englishwoman, Elizabeth Mordaunt, daughter of the Earl of Peterborough and wife of the Duke of Gordon, introduced into her husband's estates English ploughs, English ploughmen, the system of fallowing up in that time unknown in Scotland, planted moors, sowed foreign grasses, and showed the Mauritius farmers how to make hay. As a natural result of the primitive and incomplete agriculture, dearth of food was frequent, and even severe famine, in all its horrors of starvation and death not uncommon. When George I came to the throne, the century was not old enough for the living generation of Scotsmen to forget the ghastly seven years that had brought the seventeenth century to its close, seven empty ears blasted with east wind. So many died of hunger that in the grim words of one who lived through that time, quote, the living were wearied with the burying of the dead. The plague of hunger took away all natural and relative affections, so that husbands had not sympathy for their wives, nor wives for their husbands, parents for their children, nor children for their parents, end quote. The saddest proof of the extent of the suffering is shown in the irreligious despair which seized upon the sufferers. Scotland then, as now, was strongly marked for its piety, but want made men defiant of heaven, prepared like her who counseled the man of ooze to curse God and die by the roadside. Warned by no dream of thin and ill-favored kind, the pharaohs of Westminster had passed an act, enforced, while the famine was well begun, against the importation of meal into Scotland. At the sorest of the famine, the importation of meal from Ireland was permitted, and exportation of grain from Scotland prohibited. But in the beginning of the 18th century, when the famine had but just subsided, a government commission ordered that all loads of grain brought from Ireland into the west of Scotland should be staved and sunk. The empire over which King George came to rule was as yet in a growing, almost a fluid condition. In North America, England had, by one form of settlement or another, New York, but lately captured, New Jersey, the New England states, such as they then were, Virginia, an old possession, Maryland, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, settled by William Penn, whose death was now very near. Louisiana had just been taken possession of by the French. The city of New Orleans was not yet built. The French held the greater part of what was then known of Canada. Jamaica, Barbados, and other West Indian islands were in English ownership. The great East Indian Empire was only in its very earliest germ. Its full development was not yet foreseen by statesman, thinker, or dreamer. The English flag had only begun to float from the rock of Gibraltar. End of chapter 5, part 2. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Section 7 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6, Part 1. Oxford's Fall, Bolingbroke's Flight. King George did not make the slightest concealment of his intentions with regard to the political complexion of his future government. He did not attempt or pretend to conciliate the Tories, and on the other hand, he was determined not to be a puppet in the hands of a junto of illustrious Whigs. He therefore formed a cabinet composed exclusively, or almost exclusively, of pure Whigs, but he composed it of Whigs who at that time were only rising men in the political world. He was going to govern on Whig principles, but he was not going to be himself governed by another junto of senior Whig statesmen, like that which had been so powerful in the reign of William the Third. He acted with that shrewd, hard common sense, which was an attribute of his family, and which often served instead of genius or enlightenment or intelligence or even experience. A man of infinitely higher capacity than George might have found himself puzzled as to his proper policy under conditions entirely new and unfamiliar, but George acted as if the conditions were familiar to him, 
and set about governing England as he would have set about managing his household in Hanover, and he somehow hit upon the course which, under all the circumstances, was the best he could have followed. It is not easy to see how he could have acted otherwise with safety to himself. It would have been idle to try to conciliate the Tories. The more active spirits among the Tories were, in point of fact, conspirators on behalf of the Stuart cause. The colorless Tories were not men whose influence or force of character would have been of much use to the king in endeavoring to bring about a reconciliation between the two great parties in the state. The Civil War was not over or nearly over yet, and there were still to come some moments of crisis when it seemed doubtful whether, after all, the cause supposed to be fallen might not successfully lift its head again. As the words of Scott's spirited ballad put it, before the Stuart crown was to go down, quote, there were heads to be broke, end quote. For George I to attempt to form a coalition cabinet of Whigs and Tories at such a time would have been about as wild a scheme as for Monsieur Thiers to have formed a coalition cabinet of Republicans and Bonapartists while Napoleon III was yet living at Chislehurst. The Tories had been much discredited in the eyes of the country by the Peace of Utrecht, the long war of the succession had been allowed to end without securing to England and to Europe the one purpose with which it was undertaken by the Allies. It was a war to decide whether a French prince, a grandson of Louis the Fourteenth, and whose accession seemed to threaten a future union of Spain with France, should or should not be allowed to ascend the throne of Spain. The end of the war left the French prince on the throne of Spain. Yet even this fact would not in itself have been very distressing or alarming to the English people, however it might have pained others of the Allied States. The English people probably would never have drawn a sword against France in this quarrel if it had not been for the rash act of Louis the Fourteenth in recognizing the Chevalier James Stuart as King of England on the death of his father, James the Second. But England felt bitterly that the Peace of Utrecht left France and Louis not only unpunished, but actually rewarded. All the campaigns, the victories, the sacrifices, the genius of Marlborough, the heroism of his soldiers, had ended in nothing. Peace was secured at any price. It was not that the people of England did not want to have a peace made at the time. On the contrary, most Englishmen were thoroughly tired of the war, and felt but little interest in the main objects for which it had been originally undertaken. Most Englishmen would have agreed to the very terms which were contained in the treaty, disadvantageous as these conditions were in many points, but they were ashamed of the manner in which the treaty had been brought about, more than of the treaty itself. France lost little or nothing by the arrangement, she sacrificed no territory, and was left with practically the same frontier which she had secured for herself twenty years before. Spain had to give up her possessions in Italy and the Low Countries. The Dutch got very little to make up to them for their troubles and losses, but they could do nothing for themselves, and the English statesmen were determined not to continue the war. Yet on the whole, these terms were not altogether unsatisfactory to the people of England. The war was becoming an insufferable burden, the national debt was swollen to a size which alarmed at that time and almost horrified many persons, and there seemed no chance whatever of the expulsion of Philip, the French prince, from Spain. All these considerations had much influence over the public mind, and possibly would of themselves have entirely borne down the arguments of those who contended that an opportunity was now come to England of bringing France, so long her principal enemy and greatest danger, completely to her feet. Marlborough's victories had indeed made it easy to march to Paris and dictate there such terms of peace as would keep France powerless for generations to come. But the English people were disgusted by the manner in which the Treaty of Utrecht had been brought about. In order to secure that arrangement, it was absolutely necessary to destroy the authority of Marlborough, and the Tory statesmen set about this work with the most shameless and undisguised pertinacity. 
through the influence of Mrs. Masham, a cousin of the Duchess of Marlborough, introduced by the Duchess herself to the Queen, the Tory statesmen contrived to get the Whig ministry dismissed, and a ministry formed under Harley and Bolingbroke. These statesmen opened secret negotiations with France. They were determined to bring about a peace by any sort of arrangement. They betrayed England's allies by entering into secret negotiations with the enemy in express violation of the conditions of the alliance. They sacrificed the Catalonian populations of northern Spain in the most shameless manner. The Catalans had been encouraged to rise against the French prince, and England had promised in return to protect them and to secure them the restoration of all their ancient liberties. In making the peace, the Catalans were wholly forgotten. The best excuse that can be made for the Tory ministers is to suppose that they positively and actually did forget all about the Catalans. Anyhow, the Catalans were left at the mercy of the new King of Spain and were treated after the severest fashion of the time in dealing with conquered but obstinate rebels. In order to make such a peace, it was necessary to remove Marlborough. Some accusations were pressed against him to secure his removal. He was charged with having taken perquisites from the contractors who were supplying the army with bread, and with having deducted two and a half percent from the pay which England allowed to the foreign troops in her service. Marlborough's defense would not have been considered satisfactory in our day, and indeed it is impossible to think of any such accusation being made, or any such defense being needed in times like ours. Imagination can hardly conceive the possibility of such charges being seriously made against the Duke of Wellington, for example, or the Duke of Wellington condescending to plead custom and usage in reply to them. But in Marlborough's day, things were very different, and Marlborough was able to show that as regarded some of the accusations, he had only done what was customary among men in his position, and what he had full authority for doing, and as regarded others that he had applied the sums he got to the business of the state as secret service money and had not made any personal profit. He did not indeed produce any accounts, but assuming his defense to be well-founded, it is quite possible that the keeping of accounts might have been an undesirable and inconvenient practice. At all events, it was certain that Marlborough had not done any worse than other statesmen of the time, in civil as well as in military service, had been in the habit of doing, and considering all the conditions of the period, the defense which he set up ought to have been satisfactory to everyone. It probably would have satisfied his enemies, but that they were determined to get rid of him. They were indeed compelled to get rid of him in order to make their secret treaty with France, and they succeeded. Marlborough was dismissed from all his employments and went for a time into exile. The English people, therefore, saw that peace had been made by the sacrifice of the greatest English commander who up to that time had ever taken the field in their service. The treaty had been obtained by the most shameless intrigues to bring about the downfall of this great soldier. No matter how desirable in itself the peace might be, no matter how reasonable the conditions on which it was based, yet it became a national disgrace when secured by means like these. Nor was this all. The Tory statesmen, finding it imperative for their purpose to have a majority in the House of Lords as well as in the House of Commons, prevailed upon the Queen to stretch her royal prerogative to the extent of making twelve peers. All these new peers were Tories. One of them was Mr. Masham, husband of the woman who had assisted so efficiently in the degradation of the Duke of Marlborough. When they first appeared in the House of Lords, a Whig statesman ironically asked them whether they proposed to vote separately or by their foreman. Never, perhaps, has a mean and treacherous policy like that which brought about the Treaty of Utrecht had so splendid a literary defense set up for it. Swift, with the guidance of Bolingbroke, and put up, indeed, to the work by Bolingbroke, devoted the best of his powers to defame Marlborough and to justify the conduct of the Tory ministry. No matter how clear one's own opinion on the question may be, it is impossible, even at this distance of time, to study the writings of Swift on this subject without finding our convictions sometimes shaken. <laughs>
the biting satire, which seems only like cool common sense and justice taking their keenest tone, the masterly array, or perhaps we should rather say disarray of facts, dates, and arguments, the bold assumptions which by their very case and confidence bear down the reader's knowledge and judgment, the clear, unadorned style made for convincing and conquering, all these qualities and others too unite with almost matchless force to make the worst seem the better cause. It is true that the mind of the reader is never impressed by Swift's vindication of the Tories, as it is always impressed by Burke's denunciation of the French Revolution. Swift does not make one see, as Burke does, that the whole soul and conscience of the author are in his work. Swift is evidently the advocate retained to conduct the case. Burke is the man of impassioned conviction, speaking out because he cannot keep silent. Still, we have all of us been sometimes made to question our own judgment and almost to repudiate our own previously formed impressions as to facts by the skill of some great advocate in a court of law, and it is skill of this kind and of the very highest order that we have to recognize in Swift's efforts to justify the policy of the Treaty of Utrecht. To make out any case, it was necessary to endeavor to lower Marlborough in the estimation of the English people, just as it was necessary to destroy his power in order to get the ground open for the arrangement of the treaty. Swift set himself in this task with a malignity equal to his genius. Arbuthnot, hardly inferior as a satirist to Swift, wrote a history of John Bull to hold up Marlborough and Marlborough's wife to ridicule and to hatred. He depicted the great soldier as a low and roguish attorney, who is deluding his clients into the carrying out of a long and costly lawsuit for the mere sake of putting money into his own pocket. He lampooned England's allies, as well as England's great general. He described the Dutch, whom the Tory ministers had shamefully betrayed, as self-seeking and perfidious traitors, for whose protection we were sacrificing all, until we found out that they were secretly juggling with our enemies for our destruction." No stronger argument could be found to condemn the conduct of the Tory ministers than the mere fact that Swift and Arbuthnot failed to secure their acquittal at the bar of public opinion. All the attacks on Marlborough were inspired by Bolingbroke, and it has only to be added that Marlborough had been Bolingbroke's first and best benefactor. The king appointed Lord Townsend, his Secretary of State, the office was then regarded as that of First Lord of the Treasury is now. It carried with it the authority of Prime Minister. James Stanhope was Second Secretary. Walpole was at first put in the subordinate office of Paymaster General, without a seat in the Cabinet, a place in administration which at a later period was assigned to no less a man than Edmund Burke. Walpole's political capacity soon, however, made it evident that he was fitted for higher office, and we shall find that he does not remain long at the post of Paymaster General. The Duke of Shrewsbury had resigned both his offices, that of Lord Treasurer and that of Viceroy of Ireland. Lord Sunderland accepted the Irish Viceroyalty, and the Lord Treasurership was put into commission and from that time was heard of no more. Next to Walpole himself, the most notable man in the administration, the man, that is to say, who became best known to the world afterwards, was Pulteney, now Walpole's devoted friend, before long to be his bitter and unrelenting enemy. Pulteney just now is still a very young man, only in his thirty-third year, but he is the hereditary representative of good Whig principles and has already distinguished himself in the House of Commons as a skillful and fearless advocate of his political faith. He is a keen and clever pamphleteer. In later days, if he had lived then, he would undoubtedly have been a writer of leading articles in newspapers. His style is polished and penetrating, like that of an epigrammatist. He has traveled much for that time, and is what was then called an elegant scholar. The eloquent and silver-tongued Lord Cowper was restored to the office of Lord Chancellor, which he had already held under Queen Anne, and by virtue of which he had presided at the impeachment of Sacheverell. When Cowper was made Lord Keeper of the Great Seal by Anne in 1705, 
he was in the forty-first year of his age, but looked very much younger. He wore his own hair at that time, an unusual thing, in Queen Anne's days, and this added to his juvenile appearance. The Queen insisted that he must have his hair cut off and must wear a heavy wig. Otherwise, she said, the world would think that she had given the seals to a boy. Cowper was a prudent, cautious, clever man, whose abilities made a considerable impression upon his own time but have carried his memory only in a faint and feeble way unto ours. He was a fine speaker, so far as style and manner went, and he had a charming voice. Chesterfield said of him that the ears and the eyes gave him up the hearts and understandings of the audience. The Duke of Argyle became commander-in-chief for Scotland. In Ireland, Sir Constantine Phipps was removed from the office of Chancellor on the ground of his Jacobite opinions, and it is a curious fact worth noting as a sign of the times that the University of Oxford unanimously agreed to confer on him an honorary degree almost immediately after, on the day, in fact, of the King's coronation. Lord Townsend, the Prime Minister, as we may call him, was not a man of any conspicuous ability. He belonged to that class of competent, capable, trustworthy Englishmen who discharge satisfactorily the duties of any office to which they are called in the ordinary course of their lives. Such a man as Townsend would have made a respectable Lord Mayor or a satisfactory Chairman of Quarter Sessions if fortune had appointed him to no higher functions. He might have changed places probably with an average Lord Mayor or Chairman of Quarter Sessions without any particular effect being wrought on English history. Men of this stamp have nothing but official rank in common with the statesmen prime ministers, the Walpoles and Peels and Palmerstons, or with the men of genius, the Pitts and Disraelis and Gladstones. Lord Townsend had performed the regular functions of a statesman in training at that time. He had been an envoy extraordinary and had made treaties. He was a brother-in-law of Walpole. Just now, Walpole and he are friends as well as connections. The time came when Walpole and he were destined to quarrel, and then Townsend conducted himself with remarkable forbearance, self-restraint, and dignity. He was an honest and respectable man, blunt of speech and of rugged homespun intelligence, about whom since his day the world is little concerned. Such name as he had is almost absorbed in the more brilliant reputation of his grandson, the spoiled child of the House of Commons, as Burke called him, that Charles Townsend of the famous Champagne speech, the Chancellor of the Exchequer of whom we shall hear a good deal later on, and who by the sheer force of animal spirits, feather-headed talents, and ignorance became, in a certain perverted sense, the father of American independence. The second Secretary of State, James, afterwards Earl, Stanhope, was a man of very different mold. Stanhope was one of the few Englishmen who have held high position in arms and politics. He had been a brilliant soldier, had fought in Flanders and Spain, had distinguished himself at Barcelona, even under a commander like Peterborough, whose daring spirit rendered it hard for any subaltern to shine in rivalry, had been himself raised to command, and kept on winning victories until his military genius found itself overcrowed by that of the great French captain, the Duc de Vendôme. His soldier's career came to a premature close, as indeed his whole mortal career did, not very long after the time at which we have now arrived. Stanhope was a man of scholarly education, almost a scholar. He had abilities above the common, he had indomitable energy, and was as daring and resolute in the council as in the field. He had a domineering mind, was outspoken and haughty, trampling over other men's opinions as a charge of cavalry treads down the grasses of the field it traverses. He made enemies and did not heed their enmity. He was single-minded, and what was not very common in that day, he was free from any love of money or taint of personal greed. He does not rank high either among statesmen or soldiers, but as statesman and soldier together, he has made for himself a distinct and peculiar place. His career will always be remembered without effort by the readers of English history. A new Privy Council was formed 
which included the name of Marlborough. The Duchess of Marlborough urged her husband not to accept this office of barren honor. It is said that the one only occasion on which Marlborough had ventured to act against the dictation of his wife was when he thus placed himself again at the disposal of the king. He never ceased to regret that he had not followed her advice in this instance as in others. His proud heart soon burnt within him when he found that he was appreciated, understood, and put aside, mocked with a semblance of power, humiliated under the pretext of doing him honor. Much more humiliating and much more ominous, however, was the reception awaiting Oxford and Bolingbroke. From the moment of his arrival, the king showed himself determined to take no friendly notice of the great Tories. Oxford found it most difficult even to get audience of his majesty. The morning after the king's arrival, Oxford was allowed, after much pressure and many entreaties, to wait upon the sovereign and to kiss his hand. He was received in chilling silence. Truly, it was not likely that much conversation would take place, seeing that George spoke no English and Oxford spoke no German. But there was something in the king's demeanor towards him, as well as the mere fact that no words were exchanged, which must have told Oxford that his enemies were in triumph over him and were determined to bring about his doom. Even before George had landed in England, he had sent directions that Bolingbroke should be removed from his place of Secretary of State. On the last day of August, this order was executed in a manner which made it seem especially premature and even ignominious. The Privy Council, as it stood, was then dissolved, and the new council appointed, which consisted of only thirty-three members. Summers was one of this new council, but in name alone— his growing years, his increasing infirmities, and the flickering decay of his once great intellect allowed him but little chance of ever again taking an active part in the affairs of the state. Marlborough was named a member of it, as we have seen. The Lord Justice has ordered that all dispatches addressed to the Secretary of State should be brought to them. Bolingbroke himself had to wait at the door of the council chamber with his dispatch box to receive the commands of his new masters. France, tired of war, recognized the new King of England. The coronation of the King took place on October 20th. Bolingbroke and Oxford were both present. We learn from some of the journals of the day that it had rained on the previous afternoon, and that many of the Jacobites promised themselves that the rain would continue to the next day and so retard, if only for a few hours, the hateful ceremony but their hopes of foul weather were disappointed. The rain did not keep on, and the coronation took place successfully in London, not, however, without some Jacobite disturbances in Bristol, Birmingham, Norwich, and other places. End of chapter 6, part 1. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Section 8 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oxford's Fall, Bolingbroke's Flight, Part 2. The government soon after issued a proclamation dissolving the existing parliament and another summoning a new one. The latter called on all the electors of the kingdom, in consequence of the evil designs of men disaffected to the king, to have a particular regard to such as showed a firmness to the Protestant succession when it was in danger. The appeal was clearly unconstitutional, according to our ideas, but it was made probably in answer to James Stuart's manifesto a few weeks before, in which the pretender reasserted his claims to the throne and declared that he had only waited until the death of the princess our sister, of whose good intentions toward us we could not for some time past well doubt. The general elections showed an overwhelming majority for the Whigs. The not unnatural fluctuations of public opinion at such a time were effectively illustrated by the sudden and complete manner in which the majority was transferred, now to this side, now to that. Just at this moment, and indeed for long after, the Whigs had it all their own way. Only a few years ago, their fortunes had seemed to have sunk to zero, 
and now they had mounted again to the zenith. The king opened Parliament in person. The speech was read for him by the Lord Chancellor, for the very good reason that George could not pronounce English. That speech declared that the established constitution, church and state, should be the rule of his government. The debate on the address was remarkable. In the House of Lords, the address contained the words, to recover the reputation of this kingdom. Bolingbroke made his last speech in Parliament. He objected to these words and proposed an amendment with an eloquence and an energy worthy of his best days, and with a front as seemingly fearless as though his fortunes were at the full. He contended that to talk of recovering the reputation of the kingdom was to cast a stigma on the glory of the late reign. He proposed to substitute the word maintain for the word recover. His amendment was defeated by 66 votes to 33, exactly two to one. In the House of Commons, the address which was moved by Walpole contained words still more significant. The address spoke of the pretender's attempts to stir up your majesty's subjects to rebellion, declared that his hopes were built upon the measures that had been taken for some time past in Great Britain, and added, it shall be our business to trace out those measures whereon he placed his hopes, and to bring the authors of them to condign punishment. These words were the first distinct intimation given by the ministers that they intended to call their predecessors to account. Stanhope stated their resolve still more explicitly in the course of the debate. Bolingbroke sat and heard it announced that he and his late colleagues were to be impeached for high treason. He put on an appearance of serenity and philosophical boldness for a time, but in his heart he had already taken fright. For a few days he went about in public, showing himself ostentatiously, with all the manner of a man who is happy in his unwonted ease, and is only anxious for relaxation and amusement. He professed to be rejoiced by his relief from office, and those of his friends who wished to please him offered him their formal congratulations on his promotion to a retirement that placed him above the petty struggles and cares of political life. He visited Drury Lane Theatre on March 26, 1715, went about amongst his friends, chatted, flirted, paid compliments, received compliments, arranged to attend another performance at the same theatre the following evening. That same night, he disguised himself as a serving man, slipped quietly down to Dover, escaped from thence to Calais, and went hurriedly on to Paris, ready to place himself and his talents and his influence, such as it might be, at the service of the Stuarts. There seems good reason to believe that the Duke of Marlborough, by a master stroke of treachery, avenged himself on Bolingbroke at this crisis in Bolingbroke's fortunes, and decided the flight to Paris. Bolingbroke sought out Marlborough, and appealing to the memories of their old friendship, begged for advice and assistance. Marlborough professed the utmost concern for Bolingbroke, and gave him to understand that it was agreed upon between the ministers of the Crown and the Dutch government that Bolingbroke was to be brought to the scaffold. Marlborough pretended to have certain knowledge of this, and he told Bolingbroke that his only chance was in flight. Bolingbroke fled, and thereby seemed to admit in advance all the accusations of his enemies and to abandon his friends to their mercy. One of Bolingbroke's biographers appears to consider that on the whole this was well done by Marlborough, and that it was only a fair retaliation on Bolingbroke. In any case, it is clear that Bolingbroke acted in strict consistency with the principles on which he had molded his public and private life. He consulted for himself, first of all. It may have been necessary for his own safety that he should fly from the threatening storm. It is certain that he had bitter and unrelenting enemies. These would not have spared him if they could have made out a case against him. No one but Bolingbroke himself could know to the full how much of a case there was against him, but his flight, if it saved himself, might have been fatal to those who were in league with him for the return of the Stuarts. If he had stood firm, it is probable that his enemies would not have been able to prevail any farther against him than they were able to prevail in his absence against Harley, 
whom his flight so seriously compromised. Nobody needs to be told that the one last hope for conspirators whose plans are being discovered is for all in the plot to stand together or all to fly together. Bolingbroke does not seem to have given his associates any chance of considering the position and making up their minds. A committee of secrecy was struck. It was composed of 21 members, and the hearts of Bolingbroke's friends may well have sunk within them as they studied the names upon its roll. Many of its members were conscientious Whigs, Whigs of conviction, eaten up with the zeal of their house, like James Stanhope himself, and Spencer Cowper, and Lord Coningsby, and young Lord Finch, and Pulteney, now in his period of full devotion to Walpole. There were Whig lawyers like Lechmer. There were steady, obtuse Whigs like Edward Wortley Montague, husband of the brilliant and beautiful woman whom Pope first loved and then hated. There was Aylaby, then treasurer of the navy, afterwards chancellor of the exchequer, who came to disgrace at the bursting of the South Sea bubble, and who would, at any time, have elected to go with the strongest and loved to tread the path lighted by his own impressions as to his own interests. Thomas Pitt, grandfather to the great Chatham, the Governor Pitt of Madras, whose diamonds were objects of admiration to Lady Mary Wortley Montague, was a member of the committee, and so was Sir Richard Onslow, afterwards Speaker of the House of Commons and uncle of the much more celebrated Speaker Onslow. From none of these men could Bolingbroke have much favor to expect. Those who were honest and unselfish would be ill-disposed toward him because of their honesty and unselfishness. Those who were not exactly honest and certainly not unselfish would, by reason of their character, probably be only too anxious to help the winning party to get rid of him. But the names that must have showed most formidable in the eyes of Bolingbroke and his friends were those of Robert Walpole and Richard Hampton. Two years before this time, the persistent enmity of Bolingbroke had sent Walpole to the Tower, branded with the charge of corruption and expelled from the House of Commons. Now things were changed indeed. Walpole is chairman of the committee, and hast thou found me, O mine enemy? St. John had threatened Hampton, who was a lineal descendant of the Hampden of the Civil War, with the Tower, for daring to censure the ministry of the day, and was only deterred from carrying out his threat by prudent counsellors who showed him that Hampton would be only too proud to share Walpole's imprisonment. These were men not likely to forget or to forgive such injuries. At first the Tories seemed scarcely to have believed that the Whigs would push their policy to extremities. The eccentric Jacobite Shippen publicly scoffed at the committee and declared to the House of Commons that its investigations would vanish into smoke. Such confidence was quickly and rudely shattered. June 9th saw a memorable scene. On that day, Robert Walpole, as chairman of the Committee of Secrecy, rose and told the House of Commons that he had to present a report, but that he was commanded by the committee to move in the first instance that a warrant be issued by the Speaker to apprehend several persons who should be named by him, and that meantime no member be permitted to leave the House. Thereupon the lobbies were cleared of all strangers, and the sergeant-at-arms stood at the door in order to prevent any member from going out. Then Walpole named Mr. Matthew Pryor, Mr. Thomas Harley, and other persons, and the Speaker issued his warrant for their arrest. Mr. Pryor was arrested at once, Mr. Harley a few hours afterwards. Pryor was the poet, the friend, and correspondent of Bolingbroke. He had been much engaged in the negotiations for the Treaty of Utrecht, and had at one time actually held the rank of English envoy. He had but lately returned from Paris, had arrived in London just before Bolingbroke's flight. Thomas Harley, cousin of Lord Oxford, had also been concerned in the negotiations in a less formal and more underhand sort of way. When the arrests had been ordered, Walpole informed the House that the Committee of Secrecy had agreed upon their report and had commanded him to submit it to the House of Commons, 
the report which Walpole himself, as chairman of the committee, had drawn up was a document of great length. It occupied many hours in the reading. But the time could not have seemed tedious to those who listened. The report was an indictment and a state paper combined. It arrayed with the utmost skill all the evidences and arguments, all the facts, and all the passages of correspondence necessary to make out a case against the accused statesman. It carried with it beyond question the complete historical condemnation of Oxford and Bolingbroke in all that related to the Treaty of Utrecht. Never was it more conclusively established for the historian that ministers of state had used the basest means to bring about the basest objects. It was made clear as light that the national interests and the national honor had been sacrificed for partisan and for personal purposes. Objects in themselves criminal for statesmen to aim at had been sought by means which would have been shameful even if employed for justifiable ends. Had Bolingbroke and Oxford been endeavoring to save the state by the arts which they employed to sacrifice it, their conduct would have called for the condemnation of all honest men. But as regards the transactions with James Stewart, there was ample ground shown for suspicion. There was good reason to conjecture or to infer, but there was no positive evidence of intended treason. An historian reading over the report would in all probability come to the conclusion that Oxford and Bolingbroke had been plotting with James Stewart, but he would not see in it satisfactory grounds for an impeachment. No jury would convict on such evidence. No jury, probably, would even leave the box for the purpose of considering their verdict. In the course of the events that were soon to follow, it was placed beyond any doubt that Bolingbroke and Oxford had all along been trying to arrange for the return of the Stuarts. They were not driven to throw themselves in despair into the Stuart cause by reason of harsh proceedings taken against them by their enemies in England, they had been pipe-laying, to use an expressive American word, for the Stuart restoration during all the closing years of Queen Anne's reign. The reader must decide for himself as to the degree of moral or political guilt involved in such transactions. It has to be remembered that nearly half, some still say more than half, of the population of these countries was in favor of such a restoration, and that Anne herself unquestionably leaned to the same view. What is certain is that Oxford and Bolingbroke were planning for it, but what seems equally clear is that the report of the secret committee did not contain satisfactory evidence on which to sustain a charge of treason. Swift is not a trustworthy witness on these subjects, but he is quite right when he says that the allegations were more proper materials to furnish out a pamphlet than an impeachment. Bolingbroke's friends must have felt deeply grieved at his flight when they heard the statement of the case against him. Even as regards the Treaty of Utrecht, it seems questionable whether the historical conviction assuredly obtained against him by the contents of the report would, in the existing condition of politics and parties, have been followed by any sort of judicial conviction whether in a court of law or a trial by Parliament. The day after the reading of the report gave Walpole his long-desired revenge, he impeached Bolingbroke of high treason. There was a dead silence in the house when he had finished. Then two of Bolingbroke's friends, Mr. Hungerford and General Ross, mustered up courage to speak a few words for their lost leader. The star of the morning, the Tory Lucifer, had fallen indeed. Lord Coningsby got up and made a clever little set speech. Walpole had impeached the hand, and Lord Coningsby impeached the head. Walpole had impeached the clerk, and Coningsby impeached the justice. Walpole had impeached the scholar, and Coningsby impeached the master. This head, this justice, this master, was, of course, the Lord Oxford. As a piece of dramatic declamation, Coningsby's impeachment was telling enough. As an historical presentation of the case against the two men, it was absurd. Through all Anne's later years, Oxford had been nothing and Bolingbroke everything. On the very eve of the Queen's death, Bolingbroke had secured his triumph over his former friend, 
by driving Oxford out of all office. Had Oxford been first impeached, and the speech of Lord Coningsby been aimed at Bolingbroke, it would have been strikingly appropriate. As it was, it became meaningless rhetoric. Next day, Oxford went to the House of Lords and tried to appear cool and unconcerned. But according to a contemporary account, finding that most members avoided sitting near him and that even the Earl Powlett was shy of exchanging a few words with him, he was dashed out of countenance and retired out of the House. Impeachments were now the order of the day. The loyal Whigs of the Commons were incessantly passing between the upper house and the lower with articles of impeachment, and still further articles when the first were not found to be strong enough for the purpose. Stanhope impeached the Duke of Ormond, Aileby impeached Lord Strafford, not of high treason, but of high crimes and misdemeanors. Strafford was accused of being not only the tool of a Frenchified ministry, but the adviser of most pernicious measures. Strafford's part in the negotiations had not been one of any considerable importance. He had been sent as English plenipotentiary to the Congress at Utrecht. Associated with him as second plenipotentiary was Dr. John Robinson, then Bishop of Bristol, and more lately made Bishop of London, the churchman on whom the office of the Privy Seal had been conferred by Harley, to the great anger of the Whigs. It was said that Strafford, in his high and mighty way, had refused flatly to accept a mere poet-like prior for his official colleague. Strafford had in reality little or nothing to do with the making of the treaty. The negotiations were carried on between Bolingbroke and the Marquis de Torcy, French Secretary of State and nephew of the great Colbert. And when these wanted agents, they employed men more clever and less pompous than Strafford. Aileby, in bringing on his motion, drew a curious distinction between Strafford and Strafford's official colleague. The good and pious prelate, he said, had been only a cipher and seemed to have been put at the head of that negotiation only to palliate the iniquity of it under the sacredness of his character. He was glad, therefore, that nothing could be charged upon the bishop and complacently observed that the course taken with regard to Dr. Robinson, who was not to be impeached, ought to convince the world that the church was not in danger. There was some wisdom, as well as wit, in a remark made thereupon by a member of the House in opposing the motion. The bishop, it seems, is to have the benefit of clergy. The motions for the impeachment of Bolingbroke and Oxford were carried without a division. This fact, however, would be little indication as to the result of an impeachment after a long trial, and after the minds of men had cooled down on both sides, when Whigs had grown less passionate in their hate, and Tories had recovered their courage to sustain their friends. Even at the moment, the impeachment of the Duke of Ormond was a matter of far greater difficulty. Ormond had many friends, even among the most genuine supporters of the Hanoverian succession, he was the idol of the high church party, at all events of the high church mob. Had he acted with anything like a steady resolve, he would in all probability have escaped even impeachment. To some of the most serious charges against him, his refusal, for instance, to attack the French while the secret negotiations for the Treaty of Utrecht were going on, he could fairly have pleaded that he had acted only as a soldier taking positive instructions and carrying them out. His clear and obvious policy would have been to take the quiet stand of a man conscious of innocence, and therefore not afraid of the scrutiny of any committee or the judgment of any tribunal. But Ormond hesitated. Ormond was always hesitating. Many of his influential supporters urged him to seek an audience of the king at once, and to profess to George his unfailing and incorruptible loyalty. Had he taken such a course, it is not at all unlikely that the king might have caused the measures against him to be abandoned. Ormond's friends, indeed, were full of hope that they could, in any case, induce the ministry not to persevere in the proceedings against him. On the other hand, he was urged to join in an insurrection in the west of England, toward which, beyond doubt, he had already himself taken some steps. The less cautious of his friends assured him that, 
that his appearance in the West would be welcomed with open arms, and would bring a vast number of adherents round him, and that a powerful blow could be struck at once against the Hanoverian succession. Ormond, however, took neither the one course nor the other. To do him justice, he was far too honorable for the utter perfidy of the first course, and it is doing him no injustice to say that he was too feeble for the daring enterprise of the second. It is believed that Ormond had an interview with Oxford before his flight, and that he urged Oxford to attempt an escape in terms not unlike those with which William the Silent in Goethe's play endeavors to persuade Egmont not to remain in the power of Philip II. Then Ormond himself fled to France. He lived there for thirty years after. He led a pleasant, easy, harmless life, and was completely forgotten in England for years and years before his death. More than twenty years after his flight, he is described by vivacious Mary Wortley Montague as one who seems to have forgotten every part of his past life and to be of no party. He was a weak man, with only a very faint outline of a character, but he was more honorable and consistent than was common with the men of his time. When he had once taken up a cause or a principle, he held to it. He was the very opposite of Bolingbroke. Bolingbroke was genius and force without principle. Ormond had principle without genius or force. Two, then, of the great accused peers were beyond the reach of the House of Lords. Oxford alone remained. On July ninth, 1715, articles of impeachment were brought up against him. The impeachment does not seem to have been very substantial in its character. The great majority of its articles referred to the conduct of Oxford with regard to the Treaty of Utrecht. One article accused him of having abused his influence over Her Majesty by prevailing upon her to exercise, in the most unprecedented and dangerous manner, her prerogative for the creation of twelve peers in 1711. A notion that Oxford be committed to the Tower was made, and in this motion he spoke a few words which were at once ingenious and dignified. He asserted his innocence of any treasonable practice or thought, and declared that what he had done was done in obedience to the positive orders of the Queen. He asked the House what might not happen if ministers of state, acting on the immediate commands of their sovereign, were afterwards to be made accountable for their proceedings. Then, in a few words, he commended his cause to the justice of his brother peers and took leave of the House of Lords, as he put it, perhaps forever. Such an impeachment would have been impossible in more recent days. If Oxford had been accused of treasonable dealings with the Stuarts, and if evidence could have been brought home to him, there indeed might have been a reasonable ground for impeachment. But there was no sufficient evidence for any such purpose, and to impeach a statesman simply because he had taken a political course which was afterwards disapproved by the nation, and which was discredited by results, was simply to say that any failure in the policy of a minister of the crown might make him liable to impeachment when his enemies came into power. The Peace of Utrecht, bad as it was, had been condoned, or rather approved of, by two successive parliaments. Shrewsbury, who was now in high favor, had been actively concerned in its promotion. It was a question of compromise altogether, on which politicians were entitled to form the strongest opinion. No doubt the enemies of the Tory party had ample ground for condemning and denouncing the peace. But the part which a statesman had taken in bringing about the peace could not, according to our modern ideas, form any just ground of ministerial impeachment. Much more reasonably might the statesmen of a later day have been impeached who by their blundering and their obstinacy brought about the armed resistance and the final independence of the North American colonies. It is curious in our eyes to find Oxford defending his conduct on the ground that he had simply obeyed the positive orders of his sovereign. The minister would run more risk of impeachment in our days, who declared that he had acted in some great public crisis simply in obedience to his sovereign's orders, than if he were to stand accountable for the greatest errors, the grossest blunders, committed on the judgment and on the responsibility of himself and his colleagues. Oxford was committed to the Tower, 
whither he went escorted by an immense popular procession of his admirers, who cheered vociferously for him and for High Church together. He may now be said to drop out of our history altogether. He was destined to linger in long confinement, almost like one forgotten by friends and enemies. We shall have to tell afterwards how he petitioned for a trial and was brought to trial, and in what fashion he came to be acquitted by his peers. The remainder of his life he passed in happy quietude among his books and curious manuscripts, the books and manuscripts which formed the original stock of the Harleian Library, afterwards completed by his son. Harley lived until 1724, and he was not an old man even then, only 63. It is not necessary that in this work we should concern ourselves much more about him. Despite all the praises of his friends, some of them men of the highest intellectual gifts like Swift and Pope, there does not seem to have been any great quality, intellectual or moral, in Harley. He had a narrow and feeble mind. He was incapable of taking a large view of anything. He was selfish and deceitful, although it has to be said that sometimes that which men call deceit in him was but a lack of the capacity to look straight before him and make up his mind. He often led astray those who acted with him merely because his own confusion of intellect and want of defined purpose were leading himself astray. Perhaps the most dignified passage in his life was that which showed him calmly awaiting the worst in London when men like Bolingbroke and Ormond had chosen to seek safety in flight. Yet even the course which he took in this instance seems to have been rather the result of indecision than of independent self-sufficing courage and resolve. He does not appear to have been able to decide upon anything until the time had passed when movement of any kind would have availed, and so he remained where he was. Many a man has gained credit for courage and has seemed to surround himself with dignity because at a moment of alarm, when others did this or that, he was unable to quite make up his mind as to what he ought to do, and so did nothing, and let the world go by. On September 17th, Norroy, King at Arms, came solemnly down to the House of Lords and raised the names of Ormond and Bolingbroke from the roll of peers. Bolingbroke had some consolation of a sham kind. He had wished and schemed to be Earl of Bolingbroke before his fall, and now his new king, James of Saint-Germain, had given him the patent of enhanced nobility. If he ceased to be a viscount in the eyes of English peers and of English heralds, he was still an earl in the pretender's court. Bolingbroke had too keen a sense of humor not to be painfully aware of the irony of the situation. Nor was he likely to find much satisfaction in the peerage which the government had just conferred upon his father, Sir Henry St. John, by creating him Baron of Battersea and Viscount St. John. Sir Henry St. John was an idle, careless roué, a haunter of St. James's coffee houses, living in the manner and in the memories of the Restoration, listlessly indifferent to all parties, leaning perhaps a little to the Whigs. He had no manner of sympathy with his son or appreciation of his genius. When the son was made a peer, the father only said, Well, Harry, I thought thee would be hanged, but now I see thee will be beheaded. The father himself was once very near being hanged. In his wild youth, he had killed a man in a quarrel and was tried for murder and condemned to death, and then pardoned by the king, Charles II, in consideration, it is said, of a liberal money payment to the merry monarch and his yet more merry mistresses. End of chapter 6, part 2 Recording by Pamela Nagami Section 9 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 The White Cockade When Bolingbroke got to Paris, he did not immediately attach himself to the service of James. Even then and there, he still appears to have been undecided. In the modern American phase, he sat on the fence for a while. Probably 
if he had seen even then a chance of returning with safety to England, if the impeachments had not been going on, and if any manner of overture had been made to him from London, he would forthwith have dropped the Jacobite cause and returned to profess his loyalty to the reigning English sovereign. After a while, however, seeing that there was no chance for him at home, he went openly into the cause of the Stuarts and accepted the office of Secretary of State to James. It must have been a trying position for a man of Bolingbroke's genius and ambition when he found himself compelled to put up with an empty office at a sham court. Bolingbroke's desire was to play on a great stage with a vast admiring audience. He loved the heat and passion of debate. He enjoyed his own rhetorical triumphs. He must have been chilled and cramped indeed in a situation which allowed him no opportunity of displaying his most splendid and genuine qualities, while it constantly called on him for the exercise of the very qualities which he had least at hand. Nature had never meant him for a conspirator, or even for a subtle political intriguer, nor indeed had nature ever intended him to be the adherent of a lost cause. All that could have made a position like this tolerable to a man of his peculiar capacity could have been faith in the cause, that faith which would have prevented him from seeing any but its noble and exalted qualities, and would have made him forget himself in its hopes, its perils, its triumphs, and its disasters. On the contrary, it would seem that Bolingbroke found it difficult to take the Stuart cause seriously, even when he was himself playing the part of its leading statesman. A critical observer writes from Paris in the early part of the year 1716, saying that he believed Bolingbroke's chief fault was that he could not play his part with a grave enough face. He could not help laughing now and then at such kings and queens. Meantime, Bolingbroke amused himself in his moments of recreation after his old fashion. He indulged in amour after amour, intrigue after intrigue, Lord Chesterfield said of him that, though nobody spoke and wrote better upon philosophy than Lord Bolingbroke, no man in the world had less share of philosophy than himself. The least trifle, such as the over-roasting of a leg of mutton, would strangely disturb and ruffle his temper. On the other hand, a glance from a pretty woman or a glimpse of her ankle would send all Bolingbroke's political combinations and philosophical speculations flying into the air and convert him in a moment from the statesman or philosopher into the merest petit maître, macaroni, and gallant. Louis the Fourteenth refused to give open assistance to the cause of the Stuarts, but he was willing enough to lend any help that he could in private to Bolingbroke and to them. His death was the first severe blow to the cause which Bolingbroke now represented. Louis the Fourteenth was, according to Bolingbroke himself, the best friend James then had. When I engaged, says Bolingbroke, in this business, my principal dependence was on his personal character. My hopes sank as he declined and died when he expired. The regent, Duke of Orléans, was a man who, with all his coarse and unrestricted dissipation, had some political capacity and even statesmanship. He saw that the Stuart was a sinking, the Hanoverian a rising cause. Even when the two seemed most nearly balanced, it yet appeared to Orléans, if we may quote a phrase more often used in our days than in his, that the one cause was only half alive, but the other was half dead. Orléans, moreover, had a good deal of that feeling which was more strongly marked still in a Duke of Orléans of a later day, he had a liking for England and for English ways. He was, indeed, rather inclined to affect the political manners of an English statesman. He, therefore, leaned to the side of the government established in England, and, at the urgent request of the English ambassador in Paris, he acted with some energy in preventing the sailing of vessels intended for the uses of an expedition to the English coast. James Stuart seemed as if he were determined still further to imperil the chances of his family and to embarrass his adherents. The right moment for a movement in his favor had been allowed to pass away, and now, with characteristic blundering and ill fortune, he seized upon the most unsuitable time that could possibly have been employed for such an attempt. 
Something might have been done, perhaps. A temporary alteration in the dynasty might have been obtained if energy and decision had been shown in that momentous interval when Queen Anne lay dying. But when that time had been allowed to pass, the clear policy of the pretender was to permit the fears of Englishmen to go to sleep for a while, to endeavor to reorganize his plans and his party, to wait until a certain reaction should set in, a reaction very likely to come about because of the apparent incapacity and the unattractive character of George I, and then, at some timely hour, with well-matured preparations, to strike an energetic blow. George I was only a year on the throne when the adherents of James got up a miserable attempt at an insurrection. There were three conditions under which, and under which alone, an insurrection just then would have had a reasonable chance of success. These conditions were fully recognized and understood by the Jacobite leaders in England, Scotland, and France. The first was that a rising should take place at once in England and in Scotland. The second, that the Chevalier in person should take the field, and the third, that France should give positive assistance to the enterprise. The Jacobite cause was strong in the southwestern counties of England, and there the influence of the Duke of Ormond was strong likewise. The general arrangement, therefore, in the minds of the Jacobite chiefs was that James Stuart should make his appearance in Scotland, that at the same moment the Duke of Ormond should raise the standard of revolt in some of the southwestern counties, and that France should assist the expedition with men, money, and arms. When James, acting against the advice of his best counsellors, resolved on striking a blow at once, two of the necessary conditions were clearly wanting. France was not willing to give any actual assistance, and Ormond was not ready to raise the standard of rebellion in England. Ormond's sudden appearance in Paris struck dismay into the hearts of the Jacobite counsellors, men and women there. It had been distinctly understood that he was to remain in England, and that if threatened with arrest, he was to hasten to one of the western counties where he and his friends were strong and strike a sudden blow. He was to seize Bristol, Exeter, Plymouth, and other towns, and set the Stuart flag flying all over that part of England. When he appeared in France, a mere solitary fugitive, all men of sense saw that the game was up. Bolingbroke at once sent through safe hands a clear statement of the condition of things to be laid before Lord Mar. Bolingbroke's object was to restrain Mar from any movement in the altered state of affairs. The letter, however, came too late. Mar had already made his movement toward the Highlands. There was no stopping the enterprise then. The rebellion had taken fire. James was determined more than ever to go. His arguments were the arguments of mere desperation. I cannot but see, he wrote to Bolingbroke, that affairs grow daily worse and worse by delays, and that as the business is now more difficult than it was six months ago, so these difficulties will in all human appearance rather increase than diminish. Violent diseases must have violent remedies, and to use none has in some cases the same effect as to use bad ones. Indeed, it was impossible that the Chevalier himself or the Duke of Ormond could hold back. Both had personal courage quite enough for such an attempt. On the 28th of October, James Stuart, after many delays, set out in disguise and traveled westward to Saint-Malo. Ormond sailed from the coast of Normandy to that of Devonshire, but found there no sign of any arrangement for a rising. His plans had long been known to the English government, and measures had been taken to frustrate them. In that little Jacobite parliament sitting in Paris, which Bolingbroke spoke of with such contempt, and from which, as he puts it, no sex was excluded, there was hardly any secret made of the projects that were carrying on. Before the sudden appearance of Ormond in Paris, they had counted with the utmost confidence on a full success and were already talking of the restoration as if it were an accomplished fact. Every word they uttered, which it was of the least importance for the British government to hear, was instantly made known to Lord Stair, the new English ambassador, a resolute and capable man, a brilliant soldier, an astute and bold diplomatist, equal to any craft, ready for any emergency, 
charming to all, dear to his friends, very formidable to his enemies. Ormond found that as he had let the favorable moment slip when he fled from England to France, there was now no means whatever of recalling the lost opportunity. He returned to Brittany, and there he found the Chevalier preparing to start for Scotland. After various goings and comings, the Chevalier was at last enabled to embark at Dunkirk in a small vessel, with a few guns and half a dozen Jacobite officers to attend him, and he made for the Scottish coast. About the same time, and as if in obedience to some word of command from France, there was a general and almost simultaneous outburst of Jacobite demonstration in England amounting in most places to riot. In London and all over England, so far as one can judge, the popular feeling appears to have been rather with the Jacobites than against them. Stout Jacobites toasted a mysterious person called Job, who had no connection with the prophet, but whose name contained the initial letters of James, Ormond, and Bolingbroke. And Kit was no less popular, because it stood for King James the Third, while the mysterious symbolism of the three Bs implied best-born Britain, and so the Chevalier de Saint-Georges. The Chevalier's birthday, the 10th of June, was celebrated with wild outbursts of enthusiasm in several places. Stuart loving Oxford in especial made a brave show of its white roses. The loyalists who endeavored to do a similar honor to the birthday of King George were often violently assailed by mobs. In many places, the windows of houses whose inmates refused to illuminate in honor of the Chevalier were broken. William III was burnt in effigy in various parts of London and in many towns throughout the country. So serious at one period did the revulsion of Jacobite feeling appear to be that it was thought necessary to form a camp in Hyde Park and to bring together a large body of troops there. The lifeguards and horse grenadiers, three battalions of the foot guards, the Duke of Argyll's regiment, and several pieces of cannon were established in the camp. By a curious coincidence, the troops were reviewed by King George, the Prince of Wales, and the Duke of Marlborough on the 25th of August, 1715, the very day on which, as we shall presently see, the Highland clans set up the standard of the Stuarts at Braemar in Scotland. The camp had a certain amount of practical advantage in it, independently of its supposed political necessity. It made Hyde Park safe at night. Before the camp was established and after it was broken up, the park appears to have been little better than Bagshot Heath or Hounslow Heath. It was the favorite parade ground of highway robbers and murderers. The soldiers themselves were occasionally suspected of playing the part of highwaymen. A man in those days, says Scott, might have all the external appearance of a gentleman and yet turn out to be a highwayman, and the profession of the polite and accomplished adventurer who nicked you out of your money at White's or bowled you out of it at Marlebun was often united with that of the professed ruffian who on Bagshot Heath or Finchley Common commanded his brother Bo to stand and deliver. Robbers, a fertile and alarming theme, filled up every vacancy, and the names of the golden farmer the flying highwayman, Jack Needham, and other beggars' opera heroes were familiar in our mouths as household words. The revulsion of Jacobite feeling actually showed itself sometimes amongst the soldiers in the camp. Accounts published at the time tell us of men having been flogged and shot for wearing Jacobite emblems in their caps. Perhaps in mentioning this Hyde Park camp, it may not be inappropriate to notice the fact that General McCartney, who had figured in a terrible tragedy in the park two or three years before, returned to England and obtained the favor of George by bringing over 6,000 soldiers from Holland to assist the king. General McCartney was the man who had acted as second to Lord Mohun in the fatal duel in Hyde Park on the 15th November, 1712, when both Mohun and the Duke of Hamilton were killed. McCartney escaped to Holland and was charged by the Duke of Hamilton's second with having stabbed the Duke through the heart while Colonel Hamilton was endeavoring to raise him from the ground. McCartney came back and took his trial, but was only found guilty of manslaughter, that is to say, found guilty of having taken part in the duel, 
and escaped without punishment. Probably McCartney and Hamilton and Moen and the Duke are best remembered in our time because of the effect which that fatal meeting had upon the fortunes of Beatrix Esmond. The insurrection had already broken out in Scotland. John Erskine, eleventh Earl of Mar, set himself up as lieutenant general in the cause of the Chevalier. Lord Mar was a man of much courage and some capacity. He had held high office under Queen Anne. One of the biographers of that period describes Mar as a devoted adherent of the Stuarts. His career is indeed a fair illustration of the sort of thing which then sometimes passed for devoted adherence to a cause. When King George reached England, he dismissed Mar from office, suspecting him of sympathy with the Jacobite movement. Mar had expected something of the kind and had written an obsequious and a groveling letter to George in which he spoke of the king's happy accession, professed unbounded devotion to the house of Hanover, and promised that you shall ever find in me as faithful a subject as ever any king had. The new king, however, declined to trust to the faithfulness of this subject, and a year after the faithful subject had returned to his Jacobite convictions and was gathering the Highland clans in James Stuart's name. The clans were got together at Braemar. The white cockade was mounted there by clan after clan, the Mackintoshes being the first to display it as the emblem of the Stuart cause. Inverness was seized. King James was proclaimed at several places, notably at Dundee by Graham, the brother of conquering Graham, Bonnie Dundee, the fearless, cruel, clever Claverhouse, who fell at Killiecrankie. Perth was secured. The force under Mar's leadership grew greater every day. He had begun with a handful of men. He had now a little army. He had set up his standard almost at haphazard at Braemar, and now nearly all the country north of the Tay was in the hands of the Jacobites. The Duke of Argyll was put in command of the royal forces and arrived in Scotland in the middle of September 1715. He hastened to the camp, which had been got together somehow at Stirling. He came there almost literally alone. He brought no soldiers with him. He found few soldiers there to receive him. Under his command, he had altogether about a thousand foot and half as many dragoons, the latter consisting in great measure of the famous and excellent Scots Greys. His prospect looked indeed very doubtful, he could expect little or no assistance from his own clan. He had work enough to do in guarding against the possible attack from some of the followers of Lord Mar. Glasgow, Dumfries, and other towns were likewise in imminent danger from some of the Highland clans and were kept in a continual agony of apprehension. It seemed likely enough that Argyll might soon be surrounded at Stirling. If Mar had only made a forward movement, it is impossible to say what degree of success he might not have accomplished. It seems almost marvelous, when we look back and survey the state of things, to see what a miserable force the government had to rely upon. In the whole country, they had only about 8,000 men. They had more men abroad than at home, and in the critical condition of things which still prevailed upon the continent, it did not seem clear that they could except in the very last extremity, bring home many of the men whom they kept abroad. Of that little force of 8,000 soldiers, they did not venture to send a considerable proportion up to the north. They had perhaps good reason. They did not know, yet, where the serious blow was to be struck for the Stuart cause. Many of George's counsellors still looked upon the movement in Scotland as something merely in the nature of a feint. They believed that the real blow would yet be struck by Ormond in the west of England. But the evil fortune which hung over the Stuart cause in all its later days clung to it now. There was no conceivable reason why Mar should not have marched southward. The forces of the king were few in number and were not well placed for the purpose of making any considerable resistance. But in an enterprise like that of Mar, all depends upon rapidity of movement. What we may call the ultimate resources of the country were in the hands of the king and his adherents. Every day's delay enabled them to grow stronger. 
every day's delay beyond a certain time discouraged and weakened the invaders. Mar might at one critical moment have swept Argyle's exhausted troops before him, but he was feeble and timorous. He dallied, he let the time pass, he allowed Argyle to get away without making an effort to attack him. It was then that one of the Gordon clan broke into that memorable exclamation, Oh, for one hour of Dundee, the exclamation which Byron has paraphrased in the line, Oh, for one hour of blind old Dandolo. Certainly one hour of Dundee might at more than one crisis in this melancholy struggle have secured for the time the cause of the Stuarts and won for James at least a temporary occupation of the throne of his ancestors. Mar's little force remained motionless long enough to allow the Duke of Argyll to get sufficient strength to make an attack upon it at Sheriff Muir. Sheriff Muir was not much of a victory. Each side, in fact, claimed the conqueror's honor. Mar was not annihilated, nor Argyll driven back. The Duke of Argyll probably lost more of his men, but on the other hand, he captured many guns and standards, and he reappeared on the same field the next day, while Mar showed there no more. Tested in the only practical way, it is clear that the Duke of Argyll had the better of it. Lord Mar wanted to do something and was prevented from doing it at a time when to him everything depended on advance and on success. The Duke of Argyll successfully interposed between Mar and his object and therefore was clearly the victor. It is on record that no small share of Mar's ill success was due to the action, or rather the inaction, of the famous Highland outlaw Rob Roy. He and his clan had joined Mar's standard, but his sympathies seemed to have been with Argyll. He had an unusually large body of men under his command, for many of the clan Macpherson had been committed to his leadership in consequence of the old age of their chief, but at a critical moment he refused to lead his men to the charge and stood on a hill with his followers unconcernedly surveying the fight. It is said, had he kept faith, he could have turned the fortunes of the day. Argyle and the cause he represented could afford to wait, and Mar could not. The insurrection already began to melt. James Stewart himself made his appearance in Scotland. He was characteristically late for Sheriff Muir, and when he did throw himself into the field, he seemed unable to take any decisive step, or even to come to any clear decision. He did not succeed in making himself popular, even for the moment among his followers in Scotland. The occasion was one in which gallant bearing and kingly demeanor would have gone for much, and indeed it is not at all impossible that a leader of a different stamp from James might even then have so inspired the Highland clansmen and so made use of his opportunity as to overwhelm Argyll and the Hanoverian forces and turn the whole crisis to his favor. But James was peculiarly unsuited to an enterprise of the kind. He had graceful manners, a mild, serene temper, and great power of application to work. His personal courage was undoubted, and he was willing enough to risk his own life on any chance, but he had none of the spirit of a commander. He was sometimes weak and sometimes obstinate. His very appearance was not in his favor among the Highland men, to whom he had previously been unknown. He was tall and thin, with pale face and eyes that wanted fire and expression. His words were few, his behavior always sedate and somewhat depressed. Here among the Scottish clansmen on the verge of rebellion, he seemed utterly borne down by the greatness of the enterprise. He was wholly unable to infuse anything like spirit or hope into his followers. On the contrary, his appearance among them, when he did show himself, had a dispiriting and a depressing effect on almost every mind. Those who remember the manner and demeanor of the late Louis Napoleon, Emperor of the French, the silent shyness, the appearance of almost constant depression, which were characteristic of that sovereign, will, we think, be easily able to form a clear idea of the effect that James Stuart produced among his followers in Scotland. He did not care to see the soldiers exercise and handle their weapons. He avoided going among them as much as possible. The men at last began to feel a mistrust of his courage, 
the one great quality which he certainly did not lack. A feeling of something like contempt began to spread abroad. Can he speak at all? some of the soldiers asked. He was all ice. His very kindness was freezing. A man like Dundee, called to such an enterprise, would have set the clans of Scotland aflame with enthusiasm. James Stuart was only a chilling and a dissolving influence. His more immediate military counsellors were like himself, and their only policy seemed to be one of postponement and delay. They advised him against action of every kind. The clansmen grew impatient. At Perth, one devoted Highland chief actually suggested that James should be taken away by force from his advisers and brought amongst men who were ready to fight. If he is willing to die like a prince, said this man, he will find there are ten thousand gentlemen in Scotland who are willing to die with him. If James had followed the bent of his disposition, he might even then have died like a prince or gone to a throne. His opponents were as little inclined for action as his own immediate advisers. The Duke of Argyll himself delayed making an advance until peremptory orders were sent to him from London. So long and with so little excuse did he delay that statesmen in London suspected, not unreasonably, that Argyll was still willing to give James Stuart a chance or was not yet quite certain whether the cause of the Stuarts was wholly lost. It is characteristic of the time that so long as there seemed any possibility of James's redeeming his crown, Argyll's own colleagues suspected that Argyll was not willing to put himself personally in the way. At last, however, the peremptory order came that Argyll must advance upon Perth. The moment the advance became apparent, the counsellors of James Stuart insisted on retreat. On a day of ill omen to the Stuart cause, the 30th of January, 1716, the anniversary of the day when Charles I was executed, the retreat from Perth was resolved on. That retreat was the end of the enterprise. Many Jacobites had already made up their minds that the struggle was over, that there was nothing better to be done than to disperse before the advancing troops of King George, that the sooner the forces of James Stuart melted away and James Stuart himself got back to France, the better. James Stuart went back to France and the clansmen returned to their homes. Some of the Roman Catholic gentlemen rose in Northumberland and endeavored to form a junction with a portion of Mar's force which had come southward to meet them. The English Jacobites, however, were defeated at Preston, and compelled to surrender. After a voyage of five days in a small vessel, James succeeded in reaching Gravelines safely on the 8th of February, 1716. His whole expedition had not occupied him more than six weeks. It was believed at the time that the councils of the Duke of Marlborough were mainly instrumental in bringing about the prompt suppression of the rebellion. Marlborough's advice was asked with regard to the military movements and dispositions to be made, and the belief of the day was that it was his counsel and the manner in which the government followed it out which led to the utter overthrow of James Stuart and the dispersion of his followers. Marlborough is said to have actually told in advance the very time at which, if his advice were followed, the rebellion would be put down. Nothing is more likely than that Marlborough's advice should have been sought and should have been given. It would not in the least degree militate against the truth of the story that the outbreak took place so soon after Marlborough had been professing the most devoted attachment to the cause of the Stuarts, and had declared, as we have said already, that he would rather cut off his right hand than do anything to injure the claims of the Chevalier Saint-Georges. But it would not seem that any advice Marlborough might have given was followed out very strictly in the measures taken to put down the rebellion. We may be sure that Marlborough's would have been military counsel worthy of the greatest commander of his age, but in the measures taken to put down the rebellion, we can see nothing but incapacity, vacillation, and even timidity. An energetic man in Argyle's position, seeing how James Stuart halted and fluctuated, must have made up his mind at once that a rapid and bold movement would finish the rebellion, and we find no such movement made until at last the most peremptory orders from London compelled Argyll at all hazards to advance. If then Marlborough gave his advice in London, which is very likely, it would seem that for some reason or other the advice was not followed by the commanders in the field. 
the whole story reminds one of the belief long entertained in France, and which we suppose has some votaries there even still, that the great success of the Duke of Wellington in the latter part of the war against Napoleon was due to the military councils of Dumouriez, then in exile in London. There was a plan for the capture of Edinburgh Castle, which, like other Stuart enterprises, would have been a great thing if it had only succeeded. Edinburgh Castle was then full of arms, stores, and money. Some eighty of the Jacobites, chiefly Highlanders, contrived a well-laid scheme by which to get possession of the castle. They managed by bribes and promises to get over three soldiers in the castle itself. The arrangement was that these men were to be furnished with ladders of a peculiar construction suited to the purpose, which, at a certain hour of the night, they were to lower down the castle rock on the north side, the side looking on the Prince's Street of our day. By these ladders, the assailants were quietly to ascend, and then overpower the little garrison and possess themselves of the castle. When the stroke had been done, they were to fire three cannon, and men stationed on the opposite coast of Fife were thereupon to light a beacon, and the flash of that light would be the signal for other beacons from hill to hill to bear the news to Mar, as the lights along the Argive hills carried the tale of Troy's fall to Argos. The plan was an utter failure. It broke down in two places. One of the conspirators told his brother, the brother told his wife, the wife took alarm and sent an anonymous letter disclosing the whole plot to the Lord Justice Clark. Yet even then, had the conspirators been in time, their plan might have succeeded, for the anonymous letter did not reach its destination till an hour after the time appointed to make the attempt on the castle. But the conspirators were not punctual. Some of them were in a tavern in Edinburgh, drinking to the success of their enterprise. Everyone in the neighborhood seems to have known what their enterprise was, to have had some sympathy with it, to have talked freely about it. Eighteen of these heroes kept up their conviviality in the tavern till long after the appointed time. The hostess of the place was heard to say that they were powdering their hair to go to the attack on the castle. A strange sort of powder, Lord Stanhope remarks, to provide on such an occasion. Lord Stanhope evidently takes the hostess's words in a literal sense, and believes that the lady really meant to say that the jovial conspirators were actually powdering their locks as if for a ball. We may assume that the hostess spoke as Hamlet did, tropically. Whether she did or not, whether they were really adorning their locks or simply draining the flagon, the result was all the same. They came too late, the plot was discovered, the sympathizing soldiers from the castle were already under arrest. The conspirators had to disperse and fly. Few of them were arrested. Their neighbors were only too willing to help them to escape. It cannot be doubted that there was sympathy enough in Edinburgh to have made their plan the beginning of a complete success, if it had only itself been allowed to succeed. But the disclosure to the lady and the powder for the hair brought all to nothing. The whole story might almost be said to be an allegorical illustration of the fortunes of the Stuarts. The pint and the petticoat always came in the way of a success to that cause. When James reached Gravelines, he hurried on to Saint-Germain. There, the next morning, Bolingbroke came to see him. Bolingbroke, to do him justice, had done all in his power to dissuade James from making his fatal expedition at such a time and under such untoward circumstances. He had shown judgment, prudence, and in the true sense, courage. He had shown himself a statesman. He might very well have met James in the mood, and with the remonstrances of the councillors, who after the event are able to say, I told you so. But Bolingbroke appears to have had more discretion and more manliness. He advised James to withdraw once again from the dominions of the king and take refuge in Lorraine. Bolingbroke knew well by this time that there was not the slightest chance of any open assistance from the French court and even that the French court would be only too ready to throw James over and sacrifice him, if by doing so they could strengthen the bonds of good feeling between France and England. James professed to take Bolingbroke's counsel in very friendly fashion, and parted from Bolingbroke with many expressions of confidence and affection. Yet it is certain that at this time he had made up his mind not to see Bolingbroke any more. He went for a time to a house near Versailles, a kind of headquarters of intriguing political women, 
and thence immediately dispatched a letter to Bolingbroke, relieving him of all his duties as Secretary of State. Bolingbroke affects to have taken his dismissal very composedly, but it cannot be doubted that his heart burnt within him at what he doubtless believed to be the ingratitude of the prince for whom he had done and sacrificed so much. For Bolingbroke had that unlucky gift of fancy which enables a man to see himself and his own doings and his own merits in whatever light is most gratifying to his personal vanity. He had, in truth, never risked or sacrificed anything for the sake of James or the Stuart cause. He never had the least idea of risking or sacrificing anything for that cause or for any other. It was only when his fortunes in England became desperate, when impeachment, and as he believed, a scaffold, threatened him, when he had no apparent alternative left but to join the pretender or stay at home and lose all. It was only then that he took any decided step as an adherent of the cause of the Stuarts. We cannot doubt that James Stuart knew to the full the part that Bolingbroke had played. He knew that he owed Bolingbroke no favor, and that he could have no confidence in him. Still it remains to the present hour a mystery why James should then, and in that manner, have got rid of Bolingbroke for ever. Bolingbroke himself does not appear to have known the cause of his dismissal. It may be that James had grown tired of the whole fruitless struggle, and was glad to get rid of a minister whose restless energy and genius would always have kept political intrigue alive and political enterprise going. Or it may be that just then there had fallen into James's hands some new and recent evidences of Bolingbroke's willingness to treat on occasion with either side. However this may be, James made up his mind to dismiss his great follower, and Bolingbroke at once made up his mind to endeavor to ingratiate himself into the favor of the House of Hanover and to secure his restoration to London society. Almost at the very moment of his dismissal, he made application to some of his friends in London to endeavor to obtain for him a permission to return. We do not absolutely say a farewell to Bolingbroke now and here, as he stands dismissed from the service of the Stuarts and disqualified for the service of the Hanoverians. Nearly forty years of life were yet before him, but his work as a statesman was done. Never again had his genius a chance of shining in the service of a throne. The master politician of the age was out of employment forever. We do not know if history anywhere supplies such another example of a great political career snapped off so suddenly at its midst, hardly even at its midst, and never put together again. Bolingbroke reappeared again and again in England, he even took more than once a certain kind of part in politics, that is, in pamphleteering. He tried to be the inspiration and the guiding star of Pulteney and other rising men who had come, for one reason or another, to detest Walpole. But even these soon began to find Bolingbroke rather more of a hindrance than a help, and were glad to shake him off and be rid of him. He becomes everything by turns, plays at cool philosophy and philosophic retreat, is always assuring the world in tones of highly suspicious eagerness that he is done forever with it and its works and pomps, and he is always yearning and striving to get back to the works and pomps again. He plays at farming, actually puts on countrified manners, and dines ostentatiously off homely farmer-like fare to the amusement of some of his friends. He undertakes to settle the whole question of religion, of this world and the next, including the entire code of human ethics, and at the same time he is very fond of expatiating to young men concerning the most effective ways for the seduction of women, the course to be followed with a lady of quality, the different course in dealing with an actress, the policy of a long siege, and the policy of an attack by storm. He marries again and gets money from his wife, a French marquise, once beautiful, somewhat older than himself, and seems to be fond of her, and happy with her, and discourses to her, as to others, about the variety of his successful amours. Through long, long years his shadow, his ghost, for in the political sense it is nothing else, keeps revisiting the glimpses of the moon in England. For all the influence he is destined to have on the realities of political life, he might as well be already lying in that tomb in the old church on the edge of the Thames at Battersea, where his strangely brilliant, strangely blighted career is to come to an end at last.
End of Section 9 Recording by Pamela Nagami Section 10 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. After the Rebellion. All this time the Jacobite demonstrations were still going on in London and in various parts of England with as much energy as ever. Green boughs and oak apples were worn and even flaunted about the streets by groups of persons on May 29th, the anniversary of Charles II's restoration. We read of riots in London, of Whigs of the Loyal Society, going about with little warming pans as emblems of their hostility to the Stuart cause, and being met by other mobs bearing white roses as badges of the Stuart cause. There was a continual battle of pamphleteers and of ballad writers. High Church and Ormond were shouted for and sung on one side of the political field, and the Pope and Perkin, that is to say, James Stuart, were as liberally denounced on the other. The scandals about King George's mistresses were freely alluded to in the Jacobite songs. The public of all parties seemed to have very cordially detested the ill-favored ladies whom George had brought over from Hanover. The coarsest and grossest abuse was poured forth in ballads and in pamphlets against the king's favorites and courtiers, and was sung and shouted day and night in the public streets. Then, and for long after, these public streets were battlegrounds, on which Whigs and Tories, Hanoverians and Jacobites, fought out their quarrel. Men carried turnips in their hats, in mockery of the German elector who had threatened to make St. James's Park a turnip field, and were prepared to fight lustily for their bucolic emblem. Women fanned the strife, wore white roses for the king over the water, or sweet William in compliment to the immortal memory of William of Nassau. Sometimes even women were roughly treated. On one occasion we read of a serving girl who had made known the hiding place of a Jacobite, being attacked and nearly murdered by a Jacobite mob and rescued by some Whig gentlemen. On another occasion, a Whig gentleman, seeing a young lady in the street with a white rose in her bosom, jumped from his coach, tore out the disloyal blossom, lashed the young lady with his whip, and handed her over to a gang of Whigs who would have stripped and scourged her but for the timely appearance of some Jacobite gentry by whom she was carried home in safety. The flying post warns all he Jacobites and she Jacobites that if they are not careful, they will meet with more severe treatment than hitherto, and then alludes to some pretty severe treatment the poor she Jacobites had already received. To do the king and his family justice, they behaved with courage and composure through this long season of popular excitement. They went everywhere as they pleased, braving the dangers that certainly existed. Once a man named Moore spat in the face of the Princess of Wales as she was going through the streets, and he was scourged till he cried, God bless King George. In 1718, a youth named Shepherd was hanged for planning King George's death. This led a Hanoverian fanatic named Bowes to suggest to the ministry that in return he should go to Italy and kill King James. His proffer of political retaliation only resulted in his being shut up as a madman. At last, the temper of the times and the frequent threats of assassination compelled the king to take more care of himself. Though he walked in Kensington Gardens every day, the gardens were first searched and then carefully watched by soldiers. When the rebellion was over, the government found they had a large number of prisoners on their hands, many of them of high rank. Several officers taken on the field had already been treated as deserters and shot after a trial by drumhead court-martial. Some of the prisoners of higher rank were brought into London in a manner like that of captives dragged along in an old Roman triumph, or like that of actual convicts taken to Tyburn. They were marched in procession from Highgate through London, each man sitting on a horse 
having his arms tied with cords behind his back, the horses led by soldiers with a military escort drumming and fifing a march of triumph. The men of noble rank were confined in the tower. Others, many of them men of position such as Mr. Thomas Forster, a Northumberland gentleman and member for his county, were thrust into Newgate, whose horrors have been so well described in Scott's Rob Roy. The Reverend Robert Patton, who had been a conspicuous Jacobite, played a Titus Oates part in betraying his companions, and his name figures for King's evidence incessantly in the political trials. When he tired of treachery, he retired to the obscurity of his parish of Allendale in Northumberland, and gave the world his history of the rebellion in which he played so base a part. Among the chief prisoners were Lord Widrington, the Earl of Nithsdale, the Earl of Wintoun, the Earl of Carnwith, the Earl of Derwentwater, Viscount Kenmure, and Lord Nairn. These noblemen were impeached before the House of Lords, and all except Lord Wintoun pleaded guilty and prayed for the mercy of the King. Every effort was made to obtain a pardon for some of the condemned noblemen. Women of rank and beauty implored the king's mercy. Audacious attempts were made to bribe the ministers. Some eminent members of the Whig party in the House of Commons spoke up manfully and courageously in favor of a policy of mercy. It is something pleasant to recollect that Sir Richard Steele, who had got into Parliament again, was conspicuous amongst these. In the House of Lords, the friends of the condemned men succeeded in carrying, despite the strong resistance of the government, a motion for an address to the king, beseeching him to extend mercy to the noblemen in prison. Walpole himself had spoken very harshly in the House of Commons, and condemned in unmeasured terms those of his party, the Whig party, who could be so unworthy as, without blushing, to open their mouths in favor of rebels and parricides, and he had carried an adjournment of the House of Commons from the 22nd of February to the 1st of March, in order to prevent any further petitions in favor of the rebel lords from being presented before the day fixed for their execution. One of these petitions, it is worth while recollecting, was presented by the kindly hand and supported by the manly voice of Sir Richard Steele. The ministers returned a merely formal answer on the king's behalf to the address, but they thought it wise to recommend a respite to be given to Lord Nairn, the Earl of Cairnwath, and Lord Widrington, and in order to get rid of any further appeals for mercy, they resolved that the execution of Lord Nithsdale, Lord Derwentwater, and Lord Kenmure should take place the very next day. Lord Nithsdale, however, was lucky enough to make his escape, somewhat after the fashion in which Lavelette, at a much later date, contrived to get out of prison by the courage, devotion, and ingenuity of his wife. It is a curious fact that most of the contemporaries of Nithsdale, who tell the story of his escape, have represented his mother and not his wife as the woman who took his place in prison and to whose energy and adroitness he owed his life. Smollett is one of those who gives this version as if there were no doubt about it. Lord Stanhope, in the first edition of his History of England from the Peace of Utrecht to the Peace of Versailles, accepted the story on authorities which seemed so trustworthy. Lord Stanhope knew that many modern writers had described the escape as being effected by Lord Nithsdale's wife, but he assumed that the name of the wife was substituted in later tradition as being more romantic. A letter from Lady Nithsdale herself, written to her sister, settles the whole question, and of course Lord Stanhope immediately adopted this genuine version. Lady Nithsdale tells how at first she endeavored to present a petition to the king. The first day she heard that the king was to go to the drawing-room, she dressed herself in black as if in mourning, and had a lady to accompany her, because she did not know the king personally, and might have mistaken some other man for him. This lady and another came with her, and the three remained in the room between the king's apartments and the drawing-room. When George was passing through, I threw myself at his feet and told him in French that I was the unfortunate Countess of Nithsdale. Perceiving that he wanted to go off without receiving my petition, 
I caught hold of the skirt of his coat that he might stop and hear me. He endeavored to escape out of my hands, but I kept such strong hold that he dragged me upon my knees from the middle of the room to the very door of the drawing room. One of the attendants of the king caught the unfortunate lady round the waist, while another dragged the king's coat skirt out of her hands. The petition which I had endeavored to thrust into his pocket fell down in the scuffle, and I almost fainted away through grief and disappointment. Seldom, perhaps, in the history of royalty is there a description of so ungracious, unkingly, and even brutal reception of a petition presented by a distracted wife praying for a pardon to her husband. Then Lady Nithsdale determined to effect her husband's escape. She communicated her design to Mrs. Mills and took another lady with her also. This lady was of tall and slender make, and she carried under her own riding hood one that Lady Nithsdale had prepared for Mrs. Mills, as Mrs. Mills was to lend hers to Lord Nithsdale, so that in going out he might be taken for her. Mrs. Mills was also not only of the same height, but nearly of the same size as my lord. On their arrival at the tower, Mrs. Morgan was allowed to go in with Lady Nithsdale. Only one at a time could be introduced by the lady. She left the riding hood and other things behind her. Then Lady Nithsdale went downstairs to meet Mrs. Mills, who held her handkerchief to her face, as was very natural for a woman to do when she was going to bid her last farewell to a friend on the eve of his execution. I had indeed desired her to do it, that my lord might go out in the same manner. Mrs. Mills' eyebrows were a light color, and Lord Nithsdale's were dark and thick. So, says Lady Nithsdale, I had prepared some paint of the color of hers to disguise his with. I also bought an artificial headdress of the same color as hers, and I painted his face with white and his cheeks with rouge to hide his long beard, which he had not time to shave. All this provision I had before left in the tower, the poor guards whom my slight liberality the day before had endeared me to, let me go quietly with my company, and were not so strictly on the watch as they usually had been, and the more so as they were persuaded from what I had told them the day before, that the prisoners would obtain their pardon. Then Mrs. Mills was taken into the room with Lord Nithsdale, and rather ostentatiously led by Lady Nithsdale past several sentinels and through a group of soldiers and of the guards' wives and daughters. When she got into Lord Nithsdale's presence, she took off her riding hood and put on that which Mrs. Morgan had brought for her. Then Lady Nithsdale dismissed her and took care that she should not go out weeping as she had come in, in order, of course, that Lord Nithsdale, when he went out, might the better pass for the lady who came in crying and afflicted. When Mrs. Mills was gone, Lady Nithsdale dressed up her husband in all my petticoats excepting one. Then she found that it was growing dark and was afraid that the light of the candles might betray her. She therefore went out, leading the disguised nobleman by the hand, he holding his handkerchief pressed to his eyes, as Mrs. Mills had done when she came in. The guards opened the doors, and Lady Nithsdale went downstairs with him. As soon as he had cleared the door, I made him walk before me for fear the sentinels should take notice of his walk. Some friends received Lord Nithsdale and conducted him to a place of security. Lady Nithsdale went back to her husband's prison, and when I was in the room, I talked to him as if he had been really present, and answered my own questions in my lord's voice as nearly as I could imitate it. I walked up and down as if we were conversing together, till I thought they had time enough to clear themselves of the guards. I then thought proper to make off also. I opened the door and stood half in it, that those in the outward chamber might hear what I said, but held it so close that they could not look in. I bid my lord a formal farewell for that night, and she added some words about the petition for his pardon and told him, I flattered myself that I should bring favorable news. Then she closed the door with some force behind her, and I said to the servant as I passed by, who was ignorant of the whole transaction, that he need not carry any candles to his master till my lord sent for him, 
as he desired to finish some prayers first. I went downstairs and called a coach, as there were several on the stand. I drove home to my lodgings. Soon after, Lady Nithsdale was taken to the place of security where her husband was remaining. They took refuge at the Venetian ambassadors two or three days after. Lord Nithsdale put on a livery and went in the retinue of the ambassador to Dover. The ambassador, it should be said, knew nothing about the matter, but his coach and six went to Dover to meet his brother, and it was one of the servants of the embassy who acted in combination with Lord and Lady Nithsdale. A small vessel was hired at Dover, and Lord Nithsdale escaped to Calais, where his wife shortly after joined him. It is said by nearly all contemporary writers that King George, when he heard of the escape, took it very good-humouredly, and even expressed entire satisfaction with it. Lady Nithsdale does not seem to have believed this story of George's generosity. The statement made to her was that, when the news was brought to the king, he flew into an excess of passion, and said he was betrayed, for it could not have been done without some confederacy. He instantly dispatched two persons to the tower to see that the other prisoners were well secured. Lord Derwentwater and Lord Kenmure were executed on Tower Hill on the 24th of February. The young and gallant Derwentwater declared on the scaffold that he withdrew his plea of guilty and that he acknowledged no one but King James as his king. Kenmure, too, protested his repentance at having even formally pleaded guilty and declared that he died with a prayer for James Stuart. Lord Wintoon was not tried until the next month. He was a poor and feeble creature, hardly sound in his mind, not perfect in his intellectuals, a writer in a journal of the day observed of him. He was found guilty, but afterwards succeeded in making his escape from the tower. Like Lord Nithisdale, he made his way to the continent, and like Lord Nithisdale, he died long after at Rome. Humbler Jacobites could escape too. Forster escaped from Newgate through the aid of a clever servant and got off to France, while the angry Whigs hinted at connivance on the part of persons in high places. The redoubted Brigadier Mackintosh, who figures in descriptions of the time as a beetle-browed, grey-eyed man of sixty speaking broad Scotch, succeeded in escaping, together with his son and seven others, in a rush of prisoners from the Newgate Press Yard. Mr. Charles Radcliffe had an even stranger escape. For one day, growing tired as well as he might of prison life, he simply walked out of Newgate under the eyes of his jailers in the easy disguise of a morning suit and brown tie-wig. Once, some Jacobite prisoners who were being sent to the West Indian plantations rose against the crew, seized the ship, steered it to France, and quietly settled down there. Later still, some prisoners got out even more easily. Brigadier Mackintosh's brother was discharged from Newgate on his own prayer and on showing that he was very old and altogether friendless. Immediately after the execution of the rebel nobleman, the ministry set to work to take some steps which might render political intrigue and conspiracy less dangerous in the future. One idea, which especially commended itself to the statesmen of that time, was to make the laws more rigorous against Roman Catholics. Law and popular feeling were already strongly set against the Catholics. On the death of Queen Anne, officers in the army, when informing their companies of the accession of the Elector of Hanover, carried their loyal and religious enthusiasm so far as to call upon any of their hearers who might be Catholics to fall forthwith out of the ranks. The writers who supported the Hanoverian succession and were in the service of the Whig ministry were not ashamed to declare that the ceremony of the paternoster would infallibly cure a stranger of the spleen, and that any man in his senses would find excellent comedy in the recital of an Ave Mary. How common it is, says the writer of the Patriot, to find a wretch of this persuasion to be deluded to such a degree that he shall imagine himself engaged in the solemnity of devotion, while in reality he is exceeding the fopperies of a jack-pudding. So great was the distrust of Catholics that it was often the practice to seize upon the horses of Catholic gentlemen in order to impede them in the risings which they were always supposed to be meditating. But the condition of the Catholics in England 
was not bad enough to content the ministry. An act was passed, in fact what would be now called rushed through Parliament, to strengthen the Protestant interest in Great Britain by making more severe the laws now in being against Papists, and by providing a more effective and exemplary punishment for persons who, being Papists, should venture to enlist in the service of His Majesty. The spirit of political freedom, as we now understand it, had not yet even begun to glimmer upon the councils of statesmen. The idea had not yet arisen in the minds of Englishmen, even of men as able as Walpole, that liberty meant anything more than liberty for the expression of one's own opinions and for the carrying into action of one's own policy. Those who were in power immediately made it their business to strengthen their own hands, and to prevent, as far as possible, the growth of opinions, the expression of ideas, unfavorable to themselves. Yet, at such a time, there were not wanting advocates of the administration to write that it was, indeed, the peculiar happiness and glory of an Englishman, that he must first quit these kingdoms before he can experimentally know the want of public liberty. Most people, even still, read history by the light of ideas which prevailed up to the close of George I's reign. We are all ready enough to admit that in our time it would not be a free system which suppressed or prevented the expression of other men's opinions, or which attached any manner of penal consequences to the profession of one creed or the adhesion to one party. But most of us are nevertheless ready enough to describe one period of English history the reign perhaps of one sovereign as a period of religious liberty and another season or reign as a time when liberty was suppressed some englishmen talk with enthusiasm of the spirit of elizabeth's reign or the spirit of the reign of william the third and condemn in unmeasured terms the spirit which influenced james the second and which would no doubt have influenced james the second's son if he had come to the throne but any one who will put aside for the moment his own particular opinions will see that in both cases the guiding principle was exactly the same. Never were there greater acts of political and religious intolerance committed than during the reign of Elizabeth and during the reign of William the Third. The truth is that the modern idea of constitutional and political liberty did not exist among English statesmen even so recently as the reign of William the Third, At the period with which we are now dealing, it would not have occurred to any statesman that there could be a wiser course to take than to follow up the suppression of the insurrection of 1715 by making more stringent than ever the laws already in existence against the religion to which most of the rebels belonged. The government made another change of a different kind, and for which there was better political justification. They passed a measure altering the period of the duration of parliaments. At this time, the limit of the existence of a parliament was three years. An act was passed in 1641, directing that parliament should meet once at least in every three years. This act was repealed in 1664. Another and a different kind of triennial parliament bill passed in 1694. This act declared that no parliament should last for a longer period than three years. But the system of short parliaments had not apparently been found to work with much satisfaction. The impression that a House of Commons with so limited a period of life before it would be more anxious to conciliate the confidence and respect of the constituencies had not been justified in practice. Indeed, the constituencies themselves at that time were not sufficiently awake to the meaning and the value of parliamentary representation to think of keeping any effective control over those whom they sent to speak for them in Parliament. Bribery and corruption were as rife and as extravagant under the triennial system as ever they had been before, or as they ever were since. But no doubt the immediate object of repealing the triennial bill was to obtain a better chance for the new condition of things by giving it a certain time to work in security. If the new dynasty was to have any chance of success at all, it was necessary that ministers should not have to come almost immediately before the country again. 
Shippen in the Commons and Atterbury in the Lords were among the most strenuous opponents of the new measure. Both staunch Jacobites, they had everything to gain just then by frequent appeals to the country. Shippen urged that it was unconstitutional in a Parliament elected for three years to elect itself for seven years without an appeal to the constituencies. Steele defended the bill on the ground that all the mischiefs which, which could be brought under the Septennial Act could be perpetuated under the Triennial, but that the good which might be compassed under the Septennial could not be hoped for under the Triennial. Not a few persons in both houses seemed to be of one mind with the bewildered Bishop of London, who declared that he did not know which way to vote, for he was confounded between dangers and inconveniences on one side and destruction on the other. It is not out of place to mention here that when a bill was unsuccessfully brought in nearly twenty years after for the repeal of the Septennial Act, many of those who had voted in favor of parliaments of seven years in 1716 voted the other way, while opponents in 1716 were turned into allies in 1734. The system of short parliaments has ardent admirers in our own day. Annual parliaments formed one of the points of the people's charter. Many who could not accept the chartist idea of annual parliaments would still regard as one of the articles of the true creed of liberalism the principle of the triennial parliament. But even if that creed were true in the politics of the present day, it would not have been true in the early days of King George. One of the great constitutional changes which the times were then making, and which Walpole welcomed and helped to carry out, was the change which gave to the House of Commons the real ruling power in the Constitution. No representative chamber could then have held its own against the House of Lords or the Court, or the Court and the House of Lords combined, if it had been subject to the necessity of frequent re-elections. Short parliaments have even in our own days been made in Europe the most effective weapons of despotic power. No test more trying can be found for a party of men, sincerely anxious to maintain constitutional rights at a season of danger, than to subject them to frequent and close electoral struggles. Much more important in the historical and constitutional sense was it at the opening of King George's reign that the House of Commons should be strengthened than that any particular party should have unlimited opportunities of trying its chances at a general election. It mattered little when once the position of the representative body had been made secure, whether George or James sat on the throne. With the representative body, an inconsiderable factor in the state system, Brunswick would soon have been as unconstitutional as Stuart. One of the last acts of the life of Lord Somers was to express to Lord Townsend his approval of the principle of the Septennial Bill. He did not live to see it actually passed into law. He was but sixty-six years old at the time of his death. Disease and not age had weakened his fine intellect and had kept him for many years from playing any important part in the affairs of the state. The day when Somers died was the very day when the Septennial Bill passed its third reading in the House of Commons. It had come down from the House of Lords, and had to go back to that House, in consequence of some alterations made in the Commons. Somers lived just long enough to be assured of its safety. Born in 1650, the son of a Worcester attorney, he had won for himself the proudest honors of the law and had written his name high up in the role of English statesman. Steele wrote of him that he was as much admired for his universal knowledge of men and things as for his eloquence, courage, and integrity in the exerting of such extraordinary talents. The Spectator, in dedicating its earliest papers to him, spoke of him as one who brought into the service of his sovereign the arts and policies of ancient Greece and Rome, and praised him for a certain dignity in himself which made him appear as great in private life as in the most important offices he had borne. It was in allusion to Summers, indeed, that Swift said Bolingbroke wanted for success a small infusion of the alderman. This was a sneer at Summers, as well as a sort of rebuke to Bolingbroke. If the small infusion of the alderman 
was another term for order and method in public business than it may be freely admitted by his greatest admirers that Somers had more of the alderman in his nature than Bolingbroke. Perhaps the only thing except great capacity which he had in common with Bolingbroke was an ungoverned admiration of the charms of women. His fame was first established by the ability with which he conducted his part of the defense of the seven bishops in James the Second's reign. His consistent devotion to the Whig party and his just and almost prescient appreciation of the true principles of that party set him in sharp contrast to other statesmen of the time, to men like Marlborough and Shrewsbury and Bolingbroke. His is a noble figure, even in its decay, and the historian of such a time parts from him with regret, feeling that the average of public manhood and virtue is lowered when Summers is gone. While Jacobites were lingering in prison and dying on Tower Hill, Lady Mary Wortley Montague was writing from abroad imperishable letters to her friends. We may turn away from politics for a moment to observe her and her career. Mr. Wortley Montague had been appointed ambassador to Constantinople and set out for his post, accompanied by the witty and beautiful wife for whom he cared so little. Ever since he first met her and presented her with a copy of Quintus Curtius in honor of her Latinity and some original verses of his own, in earnest of his admiration, he had been an exacting, impatient lover. After his marriage, he seems to have grown absolutely indifferent to her, leaving her alone for months together while he remained in town and pleading as his excuse his parliamentary duties. She, who, on the contrary, had made no unreasonable display of affection for the lover, appears to have become deeply attached to the husband, and to have been bitterly pained by his careless indifference, an indifference which at last, and it would appear most unwillingly, she learned to return. When this life had been lived for a year or two, Queen Anne died, and with Walpole's accession to power, Mr. Wortley got office, and brought his beautiful wife up from Yorkshire to be the wonder and admiration of the English court and the Hanoverian monarch. For two bright years, Lady Mary shone like a star in the brilliant constellation of women of wits of politicians and men of letters who thronged St. James's Palace and peopled St. James's Parish. Then came the Constantinople Embassy. Lady Mary had always a longing for foreign travel, and now that her desires were gratified, she enjoyed herself with all the delight of a child and all the intelligence of a gifted woman. Travel was a rare pleasure for women then. A young English gentleman made the grand tour and brought back, if he were foolish, nothing better than a few receipts for strange dishes and some newer notions of vice than he had set out with. If he were wise, he became possessed of the tongues and bore home spoils of voyage in the shape of Titians and Correggios and Raphaels, genuine or the reverse, to stock a picture gallery in the family mansion. But women very seldom traveled much in those days. Certainly, no man or woman could then write of travels as Mary Wortley Montague could and did. We may well imagine the delight with which Mistress Skerritt and Lady Rich and the Countess of Bristol languid Lord Harvey's mother in adoring Mr. Pope, received these marvellous letters, which were destined to rank with the epistles of the younger Pliny and of Madame de Sevigné. Mr. Pope, whose translation of the Odyssey had not yet made its appearance, may well have thought that Ulysses himself had not seen men in cities to greater advantage than the beautiful wanderer whom he was destined first to love and then to hate. As we read her letters, we seem to live with her in the great gay gloomy life of Vienna, to hear once more the foolish squabbles of Radispon society as to who should and should not be styled excellency, and to smile at the loyal crowds of English thronging the wretched inns of Hanover. But the fidelity of her descriptions may best be judged from her accounts of life in Constantinople. The Vienna of today is very different from the ill-built, high-storied city of Maria Theresa. But the condition of Constantinople has scarcely changed with the century and a half that has gone by since Lady Mary was English ambassadress there. 
she seems indeed to have seen the heads upon the famous monument of bronze twisted serpents in the hippodrome and perhaps she did for spahn and wheeler's sketch of it in sixteen seventy five gives it with the triple head still perfect though these serpent heads and all traces of them have long since disappeared in constantinople lady mary first became acquainted with that principle of inoculation for the smallpox which she so enthusiastically advocated which she introduced into england in spite of so much hostility and disfavor and which now accepted by almost all the civilized world is still wrangled fiercely over in england perhaps we may anticipate by some half century to tell of lady mary's further career she came back to london again and shone as brilliantly as before and was made love to by pope and laughed at her lover and savagely scourged by him in return with whips of stinging and shameful satire one can understand better the story of the daughters of lycambes hanging themselves under the pain of the iambics of archilochus when one reads the merciless cruelty with which the great english satirist treated the woman he had loved when lady mary grew old she went abroad to live without any opposition on her husband's part they parted with mutual indifference and mutual esteem she lived for many years in italy chiefly in venice then she came back to london for a short time to live in lodgings off hanover square and be the curiosity of the town and then she died lady mary always had a dread of growing old and she grew old and ill-favoured as horace walpole was spiteful enough to put on record when pope was laughed at by the beauty he might have said to her in the words that clarendon used to the fair castlemaine woman you will grow old and have felt that in those words he had almost repaid the bitterness of her scorn horace walpole indeed avenged the offended poet long dead and famous when he wrote thus of lady mary her dress her avarice and her impudence must amaze any one that never heard her name she wears a foul mob that does not cover her greasy black locks that hang loose never combed or curled an old magazine blue wrapper that gapes open and discovers a canvas petticoat her face partly covered with white paint which for cheapness she has bought so coarse that you would not use it to wash a chimney such is one of the latest portraits of the woman who had been a poet's idol and the cherished beauty of a court lady mary who had outlived her husband left an exemplary daughter who married lord bute and a most unexemplary son to whom she bequeathed one guinea and who spent the greater part of his life drifting about the east and acquiring all kinds of strange and useless knowledge end of section 10 recording by pamela nagami Section 11 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1 by Justin McCarthy. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 9 Malice Domestic, Foreign Levy. Some of the earlier letters of Lady Mary Wortley Montague are written from Hanover and give a lively description of the crowded state of that capital in the autumn of 1716. Hanover was crowded in this unusual way because King George was there at the time, and his presence was the occasion for a great gathering of diplomatic functionaries and statesmen and politicians of all orders. Some had political missions, open and avowed. Some had missions of still greater political importance, which, however, were not formally avowed and were for the most part conducted in secret. A turning point had been reached in the affairs of Europe and the king's visit to Hanover was an appropriate occasion for the preliminary steps to certain new arrangements that had become inevitable. Even before the king's visit to his dear Hanover, the English government had been paving the way for some of these new combinations and alliances. The very day after the royal coronation, Stanhope had gone on a mission to Vienna, which had something to do with the arrangements subsequently made. It would, however, be paying too high a compliment to the patriotic energy of the king to suppose that he had gone to Hanover for the sake of promoting arrangements calculated to be of advantage to England. 
Let us do justice to George's sincerity. He never pretended to any particular concern for English interests when they were not bound up with the interests of Hanover. But he had long been pining for a sight of Hanover. He had now been away from his beloved Herrenhausen for nearly two years, and he was consumed by an unconquerable homesickness. That his absence might be inconvenient to his newly acquired country or to his ministers had no weight in his mind to counterbalance the desire of walking once more in the prim Herrenhausen avenues and looking over the level Hanoverian fields or treading the corridors of the old Schloss where the ancestral Guelphs had reveled and where the ghost of Königsmark might well be supposed to wander. The act for restraining the king from going out of the kingdom was repealed in May of 1716. The Prince of Wales was to be appointed temporary ruler in the king's absence. This appointment was the only obstacle that George admitted to his journey. In the Hanover family, father had hated son and son father with traditional persistence. George was animated by the sourest jealousy of his son. One reason, if there had been no other, for this animosity was that the young man was well known to have some sympathy for the sufferings of his mother, the unhappy Sophia Dorothea, imprisoned in Alden, and had at least once made an unsuccessful effort to see her. Since George came to England, he persisted in regarding his eldest son as a rival for popular favor, and this feeling was naturally kept alive by the enemies of the House of Hanover. To this detested son, George had now to entrust the care of his kingdom, or else abandon his visit to dear Herrenhausen. The struggle was severe, but patriotic affection triumphed over paternal hatred. The prince was named, not indeed regent, but guardian of the realm and lieutenant, with as many restrictions upon his authority as the king was able or was allowed to impose, and on July 9th, George set out for Hanover, accompanied by Secretary Stanhope. He was not long absent from England, however. On November 14th, he came back again. Loyalists issued prints of the monarch, waited upon by angels and accompanied by flattering verses, addressed to the president of the loyal Mughouses. But the devotion of the Mughouses could not make George personally popular, or diminish the general dislike to his German ministers, his German mistresses, and the hordes of hungry foreigners, the Hanoverian rats, as Squire Western would have called them, who came over with him to England, seeking for place and pension, or pension without place. The Thames was frozen over in the winter of this year, 1716, and London made very merry over the event. The ice was covered with booths for the sale of all sorts of wares, and with small coffee-houses and chop-houses. Wrestling rings were formed in one part. In another, an ox was roasted whole. People played at pushpin, skated, or drove about on ice-boats brave with flags. Coaches moved slowly up and down the highway of barges and wherries, and hawkers cried their wares lustily in the new field that winter had offered them. All the banks of the river, and especially such places as the Temple Gardens, were crowded with curious throngs surveying the animated and unusual scene. During George's absence from England, he and his ministers had made some new and important arrangements in the policy of Europe. From this time forth, indeed, from the reign of Queen Anne, England was destined, doomed perhaps, to have a regular part in the politics of the continent. Before that time, she had often been drawn into them, or had plunged enterprisingly or recklessly into them, but from the date of the accession of the House of Hanover, England was as closely and constantly mixed up in the political affairs of the continent as Austria or France. In the opening years of George's reign, France, the Empire, Austria, that is to say, for the Holy Roman Empire had come to be merely Austria, and Spain, were the important continental powers. Russia was only coming up. The genius of Peter the Great was beginning to make her way for her. Italy was as yet only a geographical expression, 
a place divided among minor kings and princes, who in politics sometimes bowed to the Pope's authority and sometimes evaded or disregarded it. The power of Turkey was broken, never to be made strong again. The Republic of Venice was already beginning to sink like a seaweed into whence she rose. The position of Spain was peculiar. Spain had for a long time been depressed and weak and disregarded. For many years it was thought that she was going down with Turkey and Venice, that the star of her fate had declined forever. Suddenly, however, she began to raise her head above the horizon again and to threaten the peace of the continent. The peace of the continent could not now be threatened without menace to the peace of England, for George's Hanoverian dominions were sure to be imperiled by European disturbance, and George would take good care that Hanover did not suffer while England had armies to move and money to spend. The English government found it necessary to look out for allies. France was under the rule of a remarkable man, Philip, Duke of Orléans and Regent of the Kingdom, ought to have been a statesman of the Byzantine Empire. He was steeped to the lips in profligacy. He had no moral sense whatever, unless that which was supplied by the so-called Code of Honor. His intrigues, his carouses, his debaucheries, his hordes of mistresses gave scandal even in that time of prodigal license. But he had a cool head, a daring spirit, and an intellect capable of accepting new and original ideas. He must be called a statesman, and despite the vulgarity of some of his vices, he has to be called a gentleman as well. He could be trusted, he would keep his word once given. Other statesmen could treat with him and not fear that he would break a promise or betray a confidence. How rare such qualities were at that day among the politicians of any country, the readers of the annals of Queen Anne do not need to be told. The regent's principal adviser at this time was a man quite as immoral and also quite as able as himself, the Abbe Dubois, afterwards cardinal and prime minister. Dubois had a profound knowledge of foreign affairs, and he thoroughly understood the ways of men. He had fought his way from humble rank to a great position in church and state. He had trained his every faculty, and all his faculties were well worth the training, to the business of statecraft and of diplomatic intrigue. It is somewhat curious to note that the three ablest politicians in Europe at that day were churchmen, Swift in England, Dubois in France, and Alberoni, of whom we shall presently have to speak in Spain. The quick and unclouded intelligence of the regent, unclouded despite his days and nights of debauchery, saw that the cause of the Stuarts was gone. While that cause had hope, he was willing to give it a chance, and he would naturally have welcomed its success. But he had taken good care during its late and vain effort not to embroil himself in any quarrel or even any misunderstanding with England on its account. And now that the poor struggle was over for a time, he believed that it would be for his interest to come to an understanding with King George. The idea of such an understanding originated with the regent himself. There has been some discussion among English historians as to the title of Townsend or Stanhope to be considered its author. Whether Townsend or Stanhope first accepted the suggestion does not seem a matter of much consequence. It is clear that the overture was made by the regent. While King George and his minister Stanhope were in Hanover, the regent sent Dubois on various pretexts to places where he might have an opportunity of coming to an understanding with both. Dubois had lived in England and had made the personal acquaintance of Stanhope there. What could be more natural than that the regent who was a lover of art, should ask Dubois to visit The Hague for the purpose of buying some books and pictures, about the time that the English minister was known to be in the neighborhood. And how could old acquaintances like Stanhope and Dubois, thus brought into close proximity, fail to take advantage of the opportunity and to have many a quiet and informal meeting? What more natural than that Dubois should afterwards go to Hanover to visit his friend Stanhope there, in that he should live in Stanhope's house. The account which the lively Lady Mary Wortley Montague gives of the manner in which Hanover was then crowded 
would of itself explain the necessity for Dubois availing himself of Stanhope's hospitality and for Stanhope's offer of it. The Portuguese ambassador, Lady Mary says, thought himself very happy to be the temporary possessor of two wretched parlors in an inn. Dubois and Stanhope had many talks, and the result was an arrangement which could be accepted by the king and the regent. The foreign policy of the Whigs had for its object the maintenance of peace on the European continent by a close observance of the conditions laid down by the Treaty of Utrecht. The settlement made under that treaty was, however, very unsatisfactory to Spain. The new Spanish king, Philip of Anjou, had formally renounced his own rights of succession to the throne of France and had given up the Italian provinces which formerly belonged to the Spanish crown. But, as in most such instances at that time, an ambitious European sovereign had no sooner accepted conditions which appeared to him in any wise unsatisfactory than he went to work to endeavor to set them aside or to get out of them somehow. Philip's whole mind was turned to the object of getting back again all that he had given up. This would not have seemed an easy task, even to a man of the stamp of Charles V. It would almost appear that any attempt in such a direction must bring Europe in arms against Spain. The regent Duke of Orléans stood next in succession to the French throne in consequence of Philip's renunciation of his rights by virtue of the Treaty of Utrecht. The Italian provinces, which had once been Spain's, were now handed over to Austria, and Austria would of course be resolute in their defense. King Philip was not the man to confront the difficulties of a situation of this kind by his own unaided powers of mind. He was very far indeed from being a Charles V. He was not even a Philip II. But he had for his minister a man as richly endowed with statesmanship and courage as he himself was wanting in these qualities. Giulio Alberoni, an Italian, born at Piacenza in 1664, was at one time appointed agent of the Duke of Parma at the court of Spain, and in this position acquired very soon the favor of Philip. Alberoni was of the most humble origin. His father was a gardener, and he himself a poor village priest. He rose, however, both in diplomacy and in the church, having worked his way up to the favor of the Duke of Parma, to work still further on to the complete favor of Philip V. The first marked success in his upward career was made when he contrived to commend himself to the Duke de Vendôme, the greatest French commander of his day. The Duke of Parma had occasion to deal with Vendôme and sent the Bishop of Parma to confer with him. The Duc de Vendôme was a man who affected roughness and brutality of manners, and made it his pride to set all rules of decency at defiance. Peter the Great, Potemkin, Suoro, would have seemed men of ultra-refinement when compared with him. His manner of receiving the bishop was such that the bishop quitted his presence abruptly and without saying a word, and returning to Parma, told his master that no consideration on earth should induce him ever to approach the brutal French soldier again. Alberoni was beginning to rise at this time. He offered to undertake the mission, feeling sure that not even Vendôme could disconcert him. He was entrusted with the task of renewing the negotiations, and he obtained admission to the presence of Vendôme. Every reader remembers the story in the Arabian Nights of that brother of the talkative barber who threw himself into the spirit of the rich Barmecide's humor and by outdoing him in the practical joke secured forever his favor and his friendship. Alberoni acted on this principle at his first meeting with Vendôme. He outbuffooned even Vendôme's buffoonery. The story will not bear minute explanation, but Alberoni soon satisfied Vendôme that he had to do with a man after his own heart what Elizabethan writers would have called a mad wag, indeed, and Vendôme gave him his confidence. Alberoni was made prime minister by Philip in 1715, and cardinal by the court of Rome shortly after. The ambition of Alberoni was, in the first instance, to recover to Spain her lost Italian provinces, and to raise Spain once more to the commanding position she had held 
when Charles V abdicated the crown. Alberoni's policy, indeed, was a mistake as regarded the strength and the prosperity of Spain. Spain's Italian and Flemish provinces were of no manner of advantage to her. They were sources of weakness because they constantly laid Spain open to an attack from any enemy who had the advantage of being able to choose his battleground for himself so long as Spain had outlying provinces scattered over the continent. Indeed, it is made clear from the testimony of many observers that Spain was rapidly recovering her domestic prosperity from the moment when she lost these provinces and when the continual strain to which they exposed her finances was stopped. At that epoch of Europe's political development, however, the idea had hardly occurred to any statesman that national greatness could come about in any other way than by the annexing or the recovery of territory. Alberoni intrigued against the regent, and was particularly anxious to injure the emperor. He was well inclined to enter into negotiations, and even into an alliance with England. He lent his help when first he took office to bring to a satisfactory conclusion some arrangements for a commercial treaty between England and Spain. This treaty gave back to British subjects whatever advantages in trade they had enjoyed under the Austrian kings of Spain, and contained what we should now call a most favored nation clause, providing that no British subjects should be exposed to higher duties than were paid by Spaniards. Alberoni cautiously refrained from giving any encouragement to the Stuarts, and always professed to the British minister the strongest esteem and friendship for King George. Stanhope himself had known Alberoni formerly in Spain, and had from the first formed a very high opinion of his abilities. He now opened a correspondence with the cardinal, expressing a strong wish for a sincere and lasting friendship between England and Spain, and this correspondence was kept up for some time in so friendly and confidential a manner that very little was left for the regular accredited minister from Spain at the court of King George to do. Alberoni, however, was somewhat too vain and impatient. He had brought over Sweden to his side, partly because he found Charles the Twelfth in a bad humor on account of the cession to Hanover of certain Swedish territories by the King of Denmark, who had clutched them while the warlike Charles was away in Turkey. The cession of these places brought Hanover to the sea, and were of importance thus to Hanover and to England alike. George the Elector was in his petty way an ambitious Hanoverian prince, however little interest he had in English affairs. He had always been anxious to get possession of the districts of Bremen and Verden, which had been handed over to Sweden at the Peace of Westphalia. Reckless enterprise had carried Charles the Twelfth, Swedish Charles, with a frame of adamant, a soul of fire, whom no dangers frighted and no labors tired, the unconquered lord of pleasure and of pain, too far in the rush of his chivalrous madness. His vaulting ambition had overleaped itself and fallen on the other side, and after his defeat at Pultoa, all his enemies, and some of whom he had scared into inaction before, turned upon him as the nations of Europe turned upon Napoleon I after Moscow. Charles had gone into Turkey and taken refuge there, and it seemed as if he had fallen never to rise again. In his absence, the King of Denmark seized Schleswig-Holstein, Bremen, and Verden. At the close of 1714, Charles suddenly roused himself from depression and appeared at the town of Stralsund, almost as much to the alarm of Europe as Napoleon had caused when he left Elba and landed on the southern shore of France. The King of Denmark shuddered at the prospect of a struggle with Charles, and in order to secure some part of his spoils, he entered into a treaty with the Elector of Hanover, by virtue of which he handed over Bremen and Verden to George, on condition that George should pay him a handsome sum of money and join him in resisting Sweden. Nothing could be less justifiable or indeed more nefarious than these arrangements. They were discreditable to George I, and they were disgraceful to the King of Denmark. Yet the general policy of that time 
seems to have approved of the whole transaction and regarded it as merely as good a stroke of business for Hanover and for England. Alberoni, having secured the help of Sweden, got together great forces, both by sea and by land, and prepared for a reconquest of the lost Italian provinces. He occupied Sardinia and made an attempt on Sicily, but this was going a little too far and too fast. Alberoni frightened the great states of Europe into activity against him. England, France, and Holland formed a triple alliance, the basis of which was that the House of Hanover should be guaranteed in England and the House of Orléans in France should the young king, Louis XV, die without issue. Not long after, the Triple Alliance was expanded into a quadruple alliance, the Emperor of Germany becoming one of its members. An English fleet appeared in the Straits of Messina, and a sea fight took place in which the Spaniards lost almost all their vessels. Alberone tried to get up another fleet for the purpose of making a landing in Scotland under the Duke of Ormond, with a view to a great Jacobite rising. But the seas and skies seemed always to have been fatal to Spanish projects against England, and the expedition under Ormond was as much of a failure as the great expedition under Alexander of Parma. The fleet was wrecked in the Bay of Biscay, the French were invading the northern provinces of Spain, and the King of Spain was compelled not only to get rid of Alberoni, but to renounce once more any claim to the French throne and to abandon his attempts on Sardinia and Sicily. Another danger was removed from England by the death of Charles the Twelfth. Quote, a petty fortress and a dubious hand brought about the end of him who had like the wind's blast, never resting, homeless, stormed so long across war-convulsed Europe, and left that name at which the world grew pale to point a moral or adorn a tale. Quote. Charles the Twelfth had just entered into an alliance with Peter the Great for an enterprise to destroy the House of Hanover and restore the Stuarts when the memorable bullet at the siege of Frederikshall in Norway brought his strange career to a close in December 1718. A junction between such men as Charles the Twelfth and Peter the Great might indeed have had matter in it. Peter was probably the greatest sovereign born to a throne in modern Europe. An alliance between Peter's profound sagacity and indomitable perseverance and Charles's unbounded courage and military skill might have been ominous for any cause against which it was aimed. The good fortune, which from first to last seems on the whole to have attended the House of Hanover and followed it even in spite of itself, was with it when the bullet from an unknown hand struck down Charles the Twelfth. These international arrangements have for us now very little real interest. They were entirely artificial and temporary. Nothing came of them that could long endure or make any real change in the relations of the European states. They had hardly anything to do with the interests of the various peoples over whose heads and without whose knowledge or concern they were made. It was still firmly believed that two or three diplomatists meeting in a half-clandestine way in a minister's closet or a lady's drawing room could come to agreements which would bind down nations and rule political movements. The first real upheaving of any genuine force, national or personal, in European life tore through all their meshes in a moment. Frederick the Great, soon after, is to compel Europe to reconstruct her scheme of political arrangements. Later yet, the French Revolution is to clear the ground more thoroughly and violently still. The Triple Alliance, concocted by the Regent and Stanhope and Dubois, had not the slightest permanent effect on the general condition of Europe. It was a clever and an original idea of the regent to think of bringing England and France, these old hereditary enemies, into a permanent alliance, and it was right of Stanhope to enter the spirit of the enterprise, but the actual conditions of England and France did not allow of an abiding friendship. The national interest, as it was then understood, of the one state was in antagonism to the national interest of the other. 
nor could France and England combined have kept down the growth of other European states then rising into importance and beginning to cast their shadows far in front of them. It seems only amusing to us now to read of King George's directions to his minister, quote, to crush the Tsar immediately, to secure his ships, and even to seize his person, end quote. The courageous and dull old king had not the faintest perception of the part which either the Tsar or the Tsar's country was destined to play in the history of Europe. At present, we are all inclined, and with some reason, to think that French statesmen, as a rule, are wanting in a knowledge of foreign politics, in an appreciation of the relative proportions of one force and another in the affairs of Europe outside France. But in the days of George I, French statesmen were much more accomplished in the knowledge of foreign politics than the statesmen of England. There was not probably in George's administration any man who had anything like the knowledge of affairs of foreign countries which was possessed by Dubois. But it had not yet occurred to the mind of Dubois, or the regent, or anybody else, that the relations of one state to another, or one people to another, are anything more than the arrangements which various sets of diplomatic agents think fit to make among themselves and to consign to the formality of a treaty. The interest we now have in all these understandings, engagements, and so-called alliances is personal rather than national. So far as England is concerned, they led to a squabble and a split in George's administration. It would hardly be worth while to go into a minute history of the quarrel between Townsend and Stanhope, Sunderland and Walpole. Sunderland, a man of great ability and ambition, had never been satisfied with the place he held in the king's administration, and the disputes which sprang up out of the negotiations for the Triple Alliance gave him an opportunity of exerting his influence against some of his colleagues. Fresh occasion for intrigue, jealousy, and anger was given by the desire of the king to remain during the winter in Hanover, and his fear, on the other hand, that his son, the prince, who was at the head of affairs in his absence, was forming a party against him and was caballing with some of the members of the government. Sunderland acted on the king's narrow and petty fears. He distinctly accused Townsend and Walpole of a secret understanding with the prince and the Duke of Argyle against the sovereign's interests. The result of all this was that the king dismissed Lord Townsend and that Walpole insisted on resigning office. The king, to do him justice, would gladly have kept Walpole in his service, but Walpole would not stay. It is clear that Walpole was glad of the opportunity of getting out of the ministry. He professed to be deeply touched by the earnestness of the king's remonstrances. He was moved, it is stated, to tears. At all events, he got very successfully through the ceremony of tear-shedding. But although he wept, he did not soften. His purpose remained fixed. He went out of office and to all intents and purposes passed straightway into opposition. Stanhope became first Lord of the Treasury and Chancellor of the Exchequer. For a long time it must have been apparent to everyone that Walpole was the coming minister. Walpole himself must have felt satisfied on the point. But he was probably well content to admit to himself that his time had not yet come. Walpole was not a great man. He wanted the moral qualities which are indispensable to greatness. He was almost as much wanting in them as Bolingbroke himself. But if his genius was far less brilliant than that of Bolingbroke, he was amply furnished with patience and steadiness. He could wait. He did not devise half a dozen plans for one particular object and fly from one to the other when the moment for action was approaching and end by rejecting them all when the moment for action had arrived. He made up his mind to a certain course, and he held to it. If its chance did not come today, it might come tomorrow. He had no belief in men's sincerity or women's either. There seems reason to believe that the famous saying ascribed to him about every man having his price was not used by him in that unlimited sense, that he only spoke of these men, of certain men, and said that every one of them had his price. But he always acted as if the description he gave of these men might safely be extended to all men. He had a coarse, licentious nature. He enjoyed the company of loose women. He loved obscene talk. 
Not merely did he love it, but he indulged in and encouraged it for practical purposes of his own. He thought it useful at men's dinner parties, because it gave even the dullest man a subject on which he could find something to say. One could not call Walpole a patriot in the higher sense. He wanted altogether that fine fiber in his nature, that exalted half-poetic feeling, that faculty of imagination, which quickens practical and prosaic objects with the spirit of the ideal, and which are needed to make a man a patriot in the noblest meaning of the word. But he loved his country in his own heavy, practical, matter-of-fact sort of way, and that was just the sort of way which at the moment happened to be most useful to England. Let it be said, too, in justice to Walpole, that the most poetic and lyrical nature would have found little subject for enthusiasm in the England of Walpole's earlier political career. It was not exactly the age for a Philip Sidney or for a Milton. England's home and foreign policy had for years been singularly ignoble. At home it had been a conflict of mean intrigues, abroad a policy of selfish alliances and base compromises and surrenders. The splendid military genius of Marlborough only shone, as it did, as if to throw into more cruel light the infamy of the intrigues and plots to which it was often sacrificed. No man could be enthusiastic about Queen Anne or George I. The statesmen who professed the utmost ardor for the Stuart cause were ready to sell it at a moment's notice, to secure their own personal position. Most of those who groveled before King George were known to have been in treaty up to the last with his rival. We may excuse Walpole if, under such conditions, he took a prosaic view of the state of things and made his patriotism a very practical sort of service to his country. It was, as we have said, precisely the sort of service England just then stood most in need of. Walpole applied himself to secure for his country peace and retrenchment. He did not indeed maintain a sacred principle of peace. He had no sacred principle about anything. We shall see more lately that he did not scruple for party reasons to lend himself to a wanton and useless war, well knowing it was wanton and useless. But his general policy was one of peace, and so long as he had his own way, there would have been no waste of England's resources on foreign battlefields. He despised war and the trade of war in his heart. To him, War showed only in its vulgar, practical, and repulsive features. The soldier was a man who got paid for the trade of killing. Walpole might be likened to a shrewd and sensible steward who is sincerely anxious to manage his master's estate with order and economy, and who for that reason is willing to indulge his master's vices and to sanction his prodigalities to a certain extent knowing that if he attempts to draw the purse-strings too closely, an open rupture will be the result, and then some steward will come in who has no taste for saving, and who will let everything go to rack and ruin. He was the first of the long line of English ministers who professed to regard economy as one of the great objects of statesmanship. He established securely the principle that to make the two ends meet was one of the first duties of patriotism. He founded, if we may use such an expression, the dynasty of statesmen to which Pitt and Peel and Gladstone belong. The change in our constitutional ways, which set up that new dynasty, was of infinitely greater importance to England than the change which settled the Brunswicks in the place of the Stuarts. End of chapter 9 Section 12 of A History of the Four Georges in Four Volumes, Volume 1 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. Home Affairs. Meanwhile, the public seemed to have forgotten all about Lord Oxford. Harley, the nation's great support, as Swift had called him, had been nearly two years in the tower, and the nation did not seem to miss its great support or to care anything about him. In May 1717, Lord Oxford sent a petition to the House of Lords complaining of the hardship and injustice of this unaccountable delay in his impeachment, 
and the House of Lords began at last to put on an appearance of activity. The Commons, too, revived and enlarged their secret committee, of which it will be remembered that Walpole was the chairman. Times, however, had changed. Walpole was not in the administration and felt no anxiety to assist the minister in any way. He purposely absented himself from the sittings, and a new chairman had to be chosen. Probably Walpole had always known well enough that there was not evidence to sustain a charge of high treason against his former rival. Perhaps now that the rival was down in the dust, never to rise again, he did not care to press for his punishment. At all events, he made it clear that he felt no interest in the impeachment of Lord Oxford. The friends of the ruined minister had recourse to an ingenious artifice. June 24th, 1717, had been appointed for the opening of the proceedings. Westminster Hall, lately the scene of the impeachment of Summers, and soon to be the scene of the impeachment of Warren Hastings, was of course the place where Oxford had to come forward and meet his accusers. The King, the Prince, and the Princess of Wales were seated in the hall. Most of the foreign ambassadors and ministers were spectators. The imposing formalities and artificial terrors of such a ceremonial were kept up. Lord Oxford had been brought from the tower to Westminster by water. He was now led bareheaded up to the bar by the deputy lieutenant of the tower. Having the axe borne before him, its edge turned away from him as yet, symbolic of the doom that might await the prisoner, but to which he had not yet been declared responsible. When the reading of the articles of impeachment and other opening passages of the trial had been gone through, Lord Harcourt, Oxford's friend, interposed and announced that he had a motion to make. In order to hear his motion, the peers had to withdraw to their own house. There, Lord Harcourt moved that the House should dispose of the two articles of impeachment for high treason before going into any of the evidence to support the charges for high crimes and misdemeanors. The argument for this course of proceeding was plausible. If Oxford were convicted of high treason, he would have to forfeit his life, and in such case, where would be the use of convicting him of a minor offense? The plan on which the Commons proposed to act, that of taking all the evidence in order of time, no matter to which charge it had reference, before coming to any conclusion, might, as Lord Harcourt put it, draw the trial into prodigious length, and absolutely to no purpose. Should the accused be found guilty of high treason, he must suffer death, and there would be an end of the whole business. Should he be acquitted of the graver charge, he might then be impeached on the lighter accusation, in what harm would have been done or time lost. The motion was carried by a majority of 86 to 56. Now it is hardly possible to suppose that the peers who voted in the majority did not know very well that the Commons would not and could not submit to have their mode of conducting an impeachment, which it was their business to manage, thus altered at the sudden dictation of the other chamber. The House of Commons was growing in importance every day. The House of Lords was proportionately losing its influence. The Commons determined that they would conduct the impeachment in their own way or not at all. Doubtless, some of them, most of them, were glad to be well out of the whole affair. July 1st was fixed for the renewal of the proceedings. Some fruitless conferences between Lords and Commons wasted two days, and on the evening of July 3rd the Lords sat in Westminster Hall and invited by proclamation the accusers of Oxford to appear. No manager came forward to conduct the impeachment on the part of the Commons. The peers sat for a quarter of an hour as if waiting for a prosecutor, well knowing that none was coming. A solemn farce was played. The peers went back to their chamber, and there a motion was made acquitting Robert Earl of Oxford and Earl Mortimer on the ground that no charge had been maintained against him. A crowd without hailed the adoption of the motion with cheers. Oxford was released from the tower and nothing more was ever heard of his impeachment. The Duke of Marlborough was furious with rage at Oxford's escape and the Duchess is described as almost distracted that she could not obtain her revenge. 
Magnanimity was not a characteristic virtue of the early days of the Georges. This was what has sometimes been called the honorable acquittal of Oxford. An English judge once spoke humorously of a prisoner having been honorably acquitted on a flaw in the indictment. Harley's was like this. It was not an acquittal. It was not honorable to the man impeached. The house that forbeared to press the impeachment or the house that contrived his escape from trial. Oxford had been committed to the Tower and impeached for reasons that had little to do with his guilt or innocence or with true public policy. He was released from prison and relieved from further proceedings in just the same way. There was not evidence against him on which he could be convicted of high treason, and this was well known to his enemies when they first consigned him to the Tower. But there was not the slightest moral doubt on the mind of any man that Oxford had intrigued with the Stuarts and had endeavored to procure their restoration, and that he had done this even since his committal to the Tower. His guilt, whatever it was, had been increased by him and not diminished since the beginning of the proceedings taken against him. But he had only done what most other statesmen of that day had been doing, or would have done if they had seen advantage in it. He was not more guilty than some of his bitterest opponents, the Duke of Marlborough among others. All but the very bitterest opponents were glad to be done with the whole business. It must have come to a more or less farcical end sooner or later, and sensible men were of the opinion that the sooner the better. Of Harley, Earl of Oxford, and Earl Mortimer, as his titles ran, we shall not hear any more. We have already foreshadowed the remainder of his life and death. This short account of his sham impeachment is introduced here merely as a part of the historic continuity of the narrative. History has few characters less interesting than that of Oxford. He held a position of greatness without being great. He fell, and even his fall could not invest him with tragic dignity. On December 13, 1718, Lord Stanhope, who had been raised to the peerage first as Viscount and then as Earl Stanhope, introduced into the House of Lords a measure ingeniously entitled A Bill for Strengthening the Protestant Interest in These Kingdoms. The title of the bill was strictly appropriate according to our present ideas and according to the ideas of enlightened men in Stanhope's days also, and it must at first have misled some of Stanhope's audience. Most churchmen are now ready to admit that the interests of the Church of England are strengthened by every measure which tends to secure religious equality, but most churchmen were not quite so sure of this in the reign of George I. The bill brought in by Stanhope was really a measure intended to relieve dissenters from some of the penalties and disabilities imposed on them in the reign of Queen Anne. The second reading of the bill was the occasion of a long and animated debate. Several noble lords appealed to the opinion of the bishops, and the bishops spoke in answer to the appeal. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, the Bishop of London, the Bishop of Bristol, the Bishop of Rochester, Atterbury, the Bishop of Chester, and other prelates spoke against the bill. The Bishop of Bangor, the Bishop of Gloucester, the Bishop of Lincoln, the Bishop of Norwich, and the Bishop of Peterborough spoke in its favor. The Bishop of Peterborough's was a strenuous and an eloquent argument in favor of the principle of the bill. Quote, the words church and church's danger, said the Bishop of Peterborough, had often been made use of to carry on sinister designs, and then these words made a mighty noise in the mouth of silly women and children. But in his opinion, the church, which he defined to be a scriptural institution upon a legal establishment, was founded upon a rock and could not be in danger as long as we enjoyed the light of the gospel and our excellent constitution." End quote. The argument would have been perfect if the eloquent bishop had only left out the proviso about our excellent constitution, for the opponents of the measure were contending, as was but natural, that the bill, if passed into law, would not leave to the church the constitutional protection which it had previously enjoyed. 
The bill passed the House of Lords on December 23rd and was sent down to the Commons next day. It was read there a first time at once, was read a second time after a debate of some nine hours, and was passed without amendment by a majority of 221 against 170 on January 10th, 1719. The test majority, however, by which the bill had been decisively carried on the motion to go into committee was but small, 243 against 202, and this majority was mainly due to the vote of the Scottish members. Stanhope, it is well known, would have made the measure more liberal than it was, and was persuaded from this intention by Sunderland, who insisted that if it were too liberal, it would not pass the House of Commons. The result seems to prove that Sunderland was right. Walpole spoke against the bill, limited as its concessions were. It would be interesting to know what sort of argument a man of Walpole's principles could have offered against a measure embodying the very spirit and sense of Whig policy. Unfortunately, we have no means of knowing. The galleries of the House of Commons were rigidly closed against strangers on the day of the debate, and all we are allowed to hear concerning Walpole's part in the discussion is that, quote, Mr. Robert Walpole made a warm speech, chiefly leveled against a great man in the present administration, end quote. There is something characteristic of Walpole in this. He was never very particular about principle, or even about seeming consistency, but still, when opposing a measure which he might have been expected to support, he would have probably found it more expedient as well as more agreeable to confine himself chiefly to the task of attacking some great man in the present administration. It ought to be said of Stanhope that he was distinctly in advance of his age as regarded the recognition of the principle of religious equality. He was not only anxious to put the Protestant dissenters as much as possible on a level with churchmen in all the privileges of citizenship, but he was even strongly in favor of mitigating the severity of the laws against the Roman Catholics. In his History of England from the Peace of Utrecht to the Peace of Versailles, Lord Stanhope, the descendant of the minister whose career and character have done so much honor to a name and a family, claims for him the credit of having put on paper a scheme not undeserving of attention as the earliest germ of Roman Catholic emancipation. Stanhope's life was too soon and too suddenly cut short to allow him to push forward his scheme to anything like a perfect position, and it is not probable that he could in any case have done much with it at such a time. Still, though fate cut short the life, it ought not to cut short the praise. The Peerage Bill raised a question of some constitutional importance. The principal object of this measure which was introduced on February 28, 1719, in the House of Lords by the Duke of Somerset, and was believed to have Lord Sunderland for its actual author, was to limit the prerogative of the Crown in the creation of English peerages to a number not exceeding six, in addition to those already existing. According to the provisions of the bill, the Crown might still create new peers on the extinction of old titles for want of male heirs, but with this exception, the power of adding new peerages would be limited to the number of six. It was also proposed that instead of the sixteen elective peers from Scotland, twenty-five hereditary peers should be created. This part of the bill was that which at the time gave rise to most of the debate in the House of Lords at least, but the really important constitutional question was that which involved the limitation of the privilege of the sovereign. The Sovereign himself sent a special message to the House of Lords, informing them that he has so much at heart the settling the peerage of the whole kingdom upon such a foundation as may secure the freedom and constitution of Parliament in all future ages, that he is willing that his prerogative stand not in the way of so great and necessary a work. The ostensible motive for the proposed legislation was to get rid of difficulties caused by the over-increase of the numbers of the peerage since the Union of England and Scotland. The real object was to guard against such a coup d'etat 
as that accomplished in Anne's later days by the creation of the twelve peers of whom Mrs. Masham's husband was one. Nothing could be more generous and liberal, it might have been thought, than the expressed willingness of the king to surrender a part of his prerogative. This very readiness, however, expressed as it was by anticipation, and before the measure had yet made any progress, set a great many persons in and out of Parliament thinking. A vehement dispute soon sprang up, in which the pamphleteer as usual bore an important part. Addison, in one of his latest political and literary efforts, defended the proposed change. He described his pamphlet as the work of an old Whig. It was written as a reply to a pamphlet by Steele condemning the bill and signed A. Plebeian. Reply, retort, and rejoinder followed in more and more heated and personal style. The excitement created caused the measure to be dropped for the session, but it was brought in again in the session following, and it passed through all its stages in the Lords without trouble and with much rapidity. When it came down to the House of Commons, however, a very different fate awaited it. Walpole assailed it with powerful eloquence and with unanswerable argument. The true nature of the scheme now came out. It would have simply rendered the representative chamber powerless against the majority of the chamber which did not represent. This will be readily apparent to anyone who considers the subject for a moment by the light of our more modern experience. A majority of the House of Commons, representing, it may be, a vast majority of the people, agree to a certain measure. It goes up to the House of Lords and is rejected there. What means, in the end, have the commons, who represent the nation, of giving effect to the wishes of the nation? They have none but the privilege of the crown to create, under the advice of ministers, a sufficient number of new peers to outvote the opponents of the measure. No alternative but revolution and civil war would be left if this were taken away. It is true that the power might be again abused by the sovereign, as it was abused in Anne's days, on the advice of the Tories. But we know that, as a matter of fact, it is hardly ever abused, hardly ever even used. Why is it hardly ever used? For the good reason that all men know it is existing and can be used should the need arise. Even were it to be misused, the misuse would happen under responsible ministers, who could be challenged to answer for it, and who could have to make good their defense. But if the House of Lords were made supreme over the House of Commons in every instance, by abolishing the unlimited prerogative which alone keeps it in check, who could then be held responsible for abuse, and before whom? Who could call the House of Lords to account? Before what tribunal could it be summoned to answer? The peers are now independent of the people and would then also be independent of the crown. There is hardly a great political reform known to modern England which, if the peerage bill had become law, would not have been absolutely rejected or else carried by a popular revolution. Walpole attacked the bill on every side. Such legislation, he insisted, would in time bring back the commons into the state of servile dependency they were in when they wore the badges of the lords. It would, he contended, take away one of the most powerful incentives to virtue, since there would be no coming to honor but through the winding sheet of an old decrepit lord and the grave of an extinct noble family. Walpole knew well his public in his time. He dwelt most strongly on this last consideration— that the bill, if passed into law, would shut the gates of the peerage against deserving commoners. He asked indignantly how the House of Lords could expect the commons to give their concurrence to a measure by which they and their posterities are to be excluded from the peerage. The commoner, who after this way of putting the matter assented to the bill, must either have been an unambitious bachelor or have been blessed in a singularly unambitious wife. Steele, who, as we have said, had fought gallantly against the bill with his pen, now made a very effective speech against it. He showed that the measure would alter the whole constitutional position of the House of Lords, whether as a legislative chamber or a court of appeal. 
the restraint of the peers to a certain number will make the most powerful of them have all the rest under their direction and judges so made by the blind order of birth will be capable of no other way of decision the prerogative as steele put it very clearly can do no hurt when ministers do their duty but a settled number of peers may abuse their power when no man is answerable for them or can call them to account for their encroachments the bill was rejected by a majority of two hundred and sixty nine votes against one hundred and seventy seven in march of seventeen twenty was passed an act with a pompous and even portentous title it was called an act for the better securing the dependency of the kingdom of ireland upon the crown of great britain the preamble recited that attempts have been lately made to shake off the subjection of ireland on to and dependence upon the imperial crown of this realm which will be of dangerous consequence to great britain and ireland the reader would naturally assume that some fresh designs of the Stuarts had been discovered, having for their theatre the Catholic provinces of Ireland. Was James Stuart about to land at Kinsale? Had Alberoni got hold of the Irish Catholics? Was Atterbury plotting with Swift for an armed insurrection in Munster and Connaught? No, nothing of the kind was expected. The preamble of the alarming act went on to set forth that the House of Lords in Ireland had lately, against law, assumed to themselves a power and jurisdiction to examine, correct, and amend the judgments and decrees of the courts of justice in the Kingdom of Ireland. And this alleged trespass of the Irish House of Lords was the whole cause of the new measure. The Act declared that the Irish House of Lords had no jurisdiction to judge of, affirm, or reverse any judgment, sentence, or decree given or made in any court within the said kingdom. This was an enactment of the most serious moment in a constitutional sense. It made the Parliament of Ireland subordinate to the Parliament of England. It reduced the Irish House of Lords from a position in Ireland equal to that of the House of Lords in England down to the level of a mere provincial assembly. The occasion of the passing of this act was the decision given by the Irish House of Lords in the celebrated case of Sherlock against Ainsley. It is not necessary for us to go into the story of the case at any length. It was a question of disputed property. The defendant had obtained a decree in the Irish Court of Exchequer, which decree was reversed on an appeal to the Irish House of Lords. The defendant appealed to the English House of Lords, who confirmed the judgment of the Irish Court of Exchequer, and ordered him to be put in possession of the disputed property. The Irish House of Lords stood by their authority and actually ordered the Irish barons of Exchequer to be taken into custody by Black Rod for having offended against the privileges of the peers and the rights and liberties of Ireland. The Act was passed to settle the question and reduce the Irish House of Lords to submission and subordinate rank. It was settled merely, of course, by the strength of a majority in the English Parliament. The Duke of Leeds recorded a sensible and manly protest against the vote of the majority of his brother peers. One or two of the reasons he gives for his protest are worth reading even now. The eleventh reason is, because it is the glory of the English laws and the blessing attending Englishmen, that they have justice administered at their doors, and not to be drawn as formerly to Rome for appeals and by this order the people of Ireland must be drawn from Ireland hither whensoever they receive any injustice from the chancery there, by which means poor man must be trampled upon as not being able to come over to seek justice. The thirteenth reason is still more concise, because this taking away the jurisdiction of the Lord's house in Ireland may be a means to disquiet the Lords there and disappoint the King's affairs. The protest, it need hardly be said, received little or no attention. More than sixty years after, when England was perplexed in foreign and colonial troubles, the spirit of the protest walked abroad and animated Grattan and the Irish volunteers. But in 1720, the Parliament at Westminster was free to do as it pleased with the Parliament in Dublin. To the vast majority of the Irish people, it might have been a matter of absolute indifference 
which Parliament reigns supreme. They had as little to expect from Dublin as from Westminster. The Irish Parliament was quite as ready to promote legislation for the further persecution of Catholics as any English Parliament could be. The Parliament in Dublin was merely an assembly of English and Protestant colonists. Yet it is worthy of remark that then and after, the sympathies of the people, when they had any means of showing them, went with the Irish Parliament simply because of the name it bore. It was, at all events, the so-called Parliament of Ireland. It represented, at least in name, the authority of the Irish people. So long as it existed, there was some recognition of the fact that Ireland was something more than a merely conquered country held by the title of the sword and governed by arbitrary proclamation, secret warrant, and drumhead court-martial. Death had been busy among eminent men for some few years. The Duke of Shrewsbury, the King of Hearts, the statesman whose appointment as Lord Treasurer secured the throne of Great Britain for the Hanoverian family, died on February 18, 1717. William Penn, the founder of the great American state of Pennsylvania, closed his long, active, and fruitful life in 1718. We have here only to record his death. The history of his deeds belongs to an earlier time. Controversy has now quite ceased to busy itself about his noble character and his life of splendid, unostentatious beneficence. His name, which without his consent and against his wishes was made part of the name of the state which he founded, will be remembered in connection with its history, while the Delaware and the Skykill flow. Of his famous treaty with the Indians, nothing perhaps was ever better said than the comment of Voltaire that it was the only league between savages and white men which was never sworn to and never broken. Addison died, still comparatively young, on June seventeenth, 1719. He had reached the highest point of his political career but a short time before, when, on one of the changes of office between Stanhope and Sunderland, he became one of the principal secretaries of state. His health, however, was breaking down, and he never had, indeed, the slightest gift or taste for political life. Pity, said Mrs. Manley, the authoress of The New Atlantis, speaking of Addison, that politics and sordid interest should have carried him out of the road of Helicon and snatched him from the embraces of the muses. But it seems quite unjust to ascribe Addison's divergence into political ways to any sordid interest. He had political friends who loved him, and he went with them into politics, as he might have traveled in company with them and for the sake of their company, although caring nothing for travel himself. No man was better aware of his incapacity for the real business of public life. Addison had himself pointed out all the objections to his political advancement before that advancement was pressed upon him. He was not a statesman. He was not an administrator. He could not do any genuine service as head of a department. He was not even a good clerk. He was a wretched speaker. He was consumed by a morbid shyness, almost as oppressive as that of the poet Cowper in a later day, or of Nathaniel Hawthorne, the American novelist, later still. His whole public career was, at best, but a harmless mistake. It has done no harm to his literary fame. The world has almost forgotten it. Even lovers of Addison might have to be reminded now that the creator of Sir Roger de Coverley was once a diplomatic agent and a secretary of state and a member of the House of Commons. Some of the essays which Addison contributed to the spectator are like enough to outlive the system of government by party and perhaps even the whole system of representative government. Sir Roger de Coverley will not be forgotten until men forget Parson Adams and Robinson Crusoe and Gil Blas and, for that matter, Sir John Falstaff and Don Quixote. For some time things were looking well at home and abroad. The policy of the government appeared to have been completely successful on the continent. The confederations that had been threatening England were dissolved or broken up. The Jacobite conspiracies seemed to have been made hopeless and powerless. The friendship established between England and the Regent of France 
had, to all seeming, robbed the Stuarts of their last chance. James the Chevalier had no longer a house on French soil. Paris could not any more be the headquarters of his organization and the scene of his mock court. The regent had kept his promises to the English government. It was well known that so far from encouraging or permitting the designs of the exiled family against England, he would do all in his power to frustrate them, as indeed he had an opportunity of doing not long after. Never before, perhaps never since, was there so cordial an understanding between England and France. Never could there have been a time when such an understanding was of greater importance to England. At home, the prospect seemed equally bright. Walpole had contrived to ingratiate himself more and more with the Prince of Wales and had become his confidential adviser. Acting on his counsel, the Prince made his submission to the King, and acting on Stanhope's counsel, the King accepted it. The Sovereign and his heir had a meeting and were reconciled for the time at least. Walpole consented to join the administration, content for the present to fill the humbler place of paymaster to the forces, without a seat in the cabinet. He returned, in fact, to the ministerial position which he had first occupied, and from which he had been promoted, and must have seemed to himself somewhat in the position of a boy who, after having got high in his class, had got down very low again, and is well content to mount up a step or two from the humblest position. Walpole knew what he was doing, and must have been quite satisfied in his own mind that he was not likely to remain very long paymaster to the forces, although he could not by any possibility have anticipated the strange succession of events by which he was destined soon to be left without a rival. For the present, he was in the administration, but he took little part in its actual work. He did not even appear to have any real concern in it. He spent as much of his time as he could at Houghton, his pleasant country seat in Norfolk. Townsend, too, had been induced to join the administration. To him was assigned the position of president of the council. Thus there appeared to be a truce to quarrels and to enmities abroad and at home. There was no dispute with any of the great continental powers, there was no dread of the Stuarts. Ministerial rivalries had been reduced to concordance and quiet. The traditional quarrel between the sovereign and the heir apparent had been composed. It might have been thought that a time of peace and national prosperity had been assured. In the history of nations, however, we commonly find that nothing more certainly bodes unsettlement than a general conviction that everything is settled forever. End of chapter 10. Recording by Pamela Nagami.